Good evening and welcome to Space Down Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott, and thank you so much for joining us on this Friday night, early Saturday morning, wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. It's crypto guru time. Yes, the guru is waiting in the background for spooky Halloween stories. But we before we before we bring in Ronald L. Murphy Jr., where you can find all of his books on Amazon. Let's give the roll call. Race fan in the gold medal position. The gorgeous Jenny Metz takes home the silver with Grandpa Holland with the bronze medal down in Australia. Stunning Steph Dickey, how are you? Thanks for coming on in. As we scroll on down, there's Chris Lumen. How are you, man? The gorgeous Cosmic Fleur, welcome back. And who else do we have on this lovely list of Fans of this show, Todd Purden is here, everyone. Give him a wave. He always waves back. Let's scroll on down to Spooky Morales. Uh, Delizion de la Cruz, it's been a while. Nice to see you back. Steam Train Mark is here from Australia. He'll be signing autographs after the show. Line up to the left of the studio, to the left. And thank you, Mark, for letting me know I am alive tomorrow. I appreciate your reading from the future. Moving on down, and there's, oh, hey, Clam, what's happening? And who else do we have here? Let's see here. Nicola, thank you so much for coming on in. Spacey Tree, good to see you. The Ronald Penton, everyone. The Ronald Penton. Scrolling on down here, Go 66. Boo to you. And Gregory Smith, Philip Baca, good to see you guys. Nicola, thank you so much for kicking off the super chat tonight, man. Really appreciate your love and support of SOR. Thank you so much, my friend. Peppa H, good to see you. Thanks for coming on in as we continue on. There's Double Tim, everybody. He'll be signing autographs after the show as well. Line up to the right of the studio, if you don't mind. On the right. The gorgeous Jessica McCreary. Lovely Lauren, how are you? Zero Cool, Jack Clark, good to have you guys back. M. Coons, good to see you. And Belenium is here once again. There's Lester Taylor, everyone. Lester Taylor. Yeah, Rooted in Gorgeous Sacredness. How are you? Thank you for coming on in. Open-minded Clarity, thanks for joining us. Uncle Dale and his power stash are here. Remember, if you see Uncle Dale in Austin, Texas, rub his power stash, you will get the full month of November of good luck. All right, continuing on. Paradox Fossils, the lovely Nikki. And 5900 buck. good to see you guys. Vin Man, how you doing, buddy? Good to see you. And there's uh, Doc from Wyoming. Who else we got? Fidgety Aura. And uh, Video Game Player, how are you, buddy? Mondak, always a pleasure. Digger Dog. Russell Gill, welcome to our chat room. Project Blue Book, good to see you. Bassmaster, how you doing, buddy? Been a week or so. And there's the lovely Carla right there. There she is. Evening, y'all. You got to love that Southern drawl right there. Brian Beck, what is happening? And uh, let's see here. Will it be the same show as always tonight? Probably not. Jeff Steve Garvey, good to see you. And uh, Wes H., good to have you back. Hold on. I got to start the radio side of things. And there we go. And who else we got? The lovely Jenny is here. And uh, we're caught up. Just like that, we're caught up. We got lots of time here, too, Guru. Yeah, where's the Guru? I better take him off mute there. There he is. See, there's the Guru. Gotta love that. I'm here. I'm here. I know you're here. I'm pretty excited. Jose, how you doing, buddy? And uh, yeah. (sighs) I tell you, Guru. I'm. I'm not under the weather, but you know, I'm 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 at that point where I may go under the weather. You know what I'm saying? You're not 100, percent and you kind of feel this ominous cloud about you. I do know exactly. What yeah, I better take a little sniff of my Vicks here. There you go. <laughs> and uh, Ross Smith, how you doing, buddy? All right, we got 20 seconds. A great way to support what we do on this show is through the Super Chat. Be like Nicola. It really helps us out. And, of course, thank you to everyone who's new here. Hit subscribe, and don't forget to ring that bell. We are here seven days a week for your lovely entertainment. entertainment. Mama Susan, Sensational Sherry, how are you? And uh, here we go, everyone. Horns up. Thank you. 
From the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Go to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old baby the favor. Hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Check out our swag as well. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. We are in for a good night tonight as the crypto guru Ronald Murphy is back. Ron's been investigating the stuff of nightmares for over 30 years. He has investigated things that go bump in the night and meticulously researched the historical and psychological context of myths and legends from around the world. The guru seeks to uncover the archetypical precedent for monsters and hauntings and collecting his thoughts of what is truly going on out there. You can find all of his books on Amazon, and we always love it when the guru is here. Mr. Guru, how you doing, buddy? I I, I would rather be no other place than right here in Space Out Radio Land with you, my friend, and all these great listeners here. Absolutely. We really do appreciate you coming on in, bud. And I, I'm going to apologize right off the bat, feeling a little bit under the weather. Yeah. You know, I got I got a case of the sniffles going on, and I can feel it building up. So we're going to battle on through here, Guru. And uh, thank you so much for joining us, buddy. You know, for somebody who is listening to us for the first time, let's learn a little bit about you, how you fell in love with the legends of monsters and folklore. Absolutely, man. Okay, so, you know, this is the story that I tell. And I doubt, Dave, that you have any first-time listeners. I think that these guys have been with you since the very beginning. But I'll, I'll, I'll indulge you nonetheless. So, um, you know, as a kid, I was growing up here in western Pennsylvania where not a lot of stuff happened. I grew up in a very small town uh, called Blairsville that had, uh, I think it had two streetlights at the time. Not a lot of stuff going on there uh, until uh, the mid-1970s. And uh, what happened then in the 1970s is that um, there started to be sightings of Bigfoot in our area. It was so uh, much of a, a news story uh, that the local news from Pittsburgh actually would pick it up and they would report upon this man-like creature uh, that was seen in and around my little town. And as a kid, this was a big deal, you know, because, you know, Big things happen in Pittsburgh, and now they were talking about my little one-horse town on on TV. So, my mother had a very keen interest in uh, the paranormal, the cryptozoological, uh, and uh, she would listen to these reports, and then she would take my brother and I out, and we would go on the back roads of Western Pennsylvania, uh, seeking out the spots where this creature was sighted. So it was a great time to be uh, to be alive, um, and not only that, uh, but not only, you know, going first person looking for these things, uh, but this was also a time whenever In Search Of was on television and, you know, That's Incredible and uh, Unsolved Mysteries. So it was a great time to be a kid. Uh, it was a great time to be interested in the paranormal. Uh, and the other cool thing about it, too, is I went to a parochial school. Uh, St. Simon and Jude uh, was the name of the school. It's no longer in existence anymore, unfortunately. Uh, but I had a very small library in the school. But I am convinced that one of the nuns there had to be a closet cryptozoologist or a paranormal investigator because this little library that was chock full of, uh, you know, uh, religious textbooks and such had a great section on the paranormal. Uh, Bigfoot, the abominable snowman. Um, uh, uh, we had UFOs uh, and all this other kind of stuff. It was a great time, uh, you know, to actually go to the library, pick up books in your hand and read them. So that's how I spent the majority of my youth. You know, I was uh, looking for Bigfoot in the woods that surrounded our little town. Uh, I was reading about Bigfoot. I was reading what Von Donneken had to say about ancient aliens. And, uh, you know, I was uh, enamored by tales of the Loch Ness Monster. 
And it really stuck with me uh, until I went to high school. Uh, and you might find this hard to believe, Dave, and I think that a lot of your listeners will find this hard to believe as well, too. But back in 1984, whenever I went to high school, um, chicks did not find guys that were interested in the paranormal um, uh, attractive. I, I don't understand what was going on there. Uh, so I kind of went in a little bit, you know, put my the paranormal stuff in the back seat and focused on other things. Um, and it was in whenever I went uh, to uh, the University of Pittsburgh and I was taking an anthropology course. And in one of my books that I bought at the bookstore that probably cost $120, written by two highly esteemed professors, uh, there was a section in there about um, uh, folklore and legends and how they could spread. And, uh, and, and one of the writers of the book suggested uh, that uh, the legend of the Yeti may have uh, come about uh, from uh, the existence of the uh, Gigantopithecus up into historical times. And that was the first time in academia that I had ever been confronted with the idea of a Bigfoot or a man-like beast as something that was acceptable to argue and to talk about. And it was as if Bigfoot himself came to the door of the classroom, opened it up, walked in and took the seat beside me and kind of like looked at me and said, now what do you do with me? So all this interest that I had as a kid now comes back to the surface, you know, and now I'm starting to look at this great literature from around the world. Some of the first literature ever, uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, for instance, which was written uh, even before the time of the construction of the Great Pyramids. We have within that tell the remnant of an oral tradition about uh, man-covered beasts. Uh, there's a, a two of them that are actually mentioned, uh, and they dwell in the, in the, in the far-off places in the deep woods, and they usually don't have any kind of confrontation with human beings unless we um, infringe upon their territory, which was extremely interesting. And, and I use that kind of stuff even now uh, as, a, as a researcher and investigator uh, to point out that this world uh, truly is one that is full of wonder and surprise. There's more things out there uh, than meet the eye. And um, I like it like that. I like that there's still mysteries out there. And I like the idea that there's possibilities of monsters still lurking in the shadows because that really puts us as humans in our place. That makes that gives us a wake up call that we don't know everything there is to know. Wow, I mean that's quite the experience. Now you are somebody who loves the educational and historic and scientific side of whatever these creatures are. Yet, how do you blend that so beautifully with the the legends and folklore that goes along with it well i think it's like connecting the dots uh you know but we're connecting dots that in some cases go back fourteen thousand years you know i like to go back as far as i can go and we can go back into the prehistoric record uh we might not have any any human beings actually giving us any kind of play-by-play -play commentary but we can denote things that are happening from the archaeological records concerning burials uh, concerning um, cave art. Um, and that is really when all this kind of stuff begins. I like to look at archetypes and to think that the idea of lake monsters have been with us since the, our infancy and the idea of the wild man and the idea of werewolves and vampires. It is a matter of connecting the dots and finding out that these creatures are so a part of our humanity that we would be very different if we did not have them in our collective closet, as it were. Um, and that is the, really the reason why I want to approach it um, from an academic point of view. Um, I go on a lot of expeditions. I go out a lot with people that are dressed in paramilitary gear and they have the knives and they have the flashlights on their head and they look like they're going out on a big game hunt. That's all fine and dandy. That's great. But at the end of the day, whenever we are bringing out evidence and we have to present it to the public at large that already is not believing, is already skeptical, I think I like my approach better than these guys that go out and say, well, I found a partial track here and I found, you know, I heard a wood knock there. Uh, and not to say that that's not important, but I think that we have to bring in at least a modicum 
of, of mainstream academic field work, or none of this is going to make any sense in the long run. As I said before, look, I like to be out in the woods. I like to do my investigations, but I find the gray matter of the mind just as fascinating. And I think whenever we go around and wonder in that, in that section of our minds where these things dwell, it is as dangerous and as wild and unpredictable as the woods themselves. Guru, you are somebody who loves to tell a good story. And, you know, whether it's from legends that you have written about or have heard about over the years, you know, do you have a favorite? Do you have a favorite creature that you love to talk about or would love to know more about? Yeah. Well, you know, the thing is, um, so cryptozoologist is one of those things that is bandied about. You know, anybody can call themselves a cryptozoologist. Um, I got started, of course, because of Bigfoot. Uh, that is always going to be my my go-to. Um, he's also almost like my alter ego. And I think Bigfoot, in a way, kind of capital, yeah, encapsulates that. Um, it looks like us, except it doesn't live by our rules. Uh, it lives outside of the mainstream. It, 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 is, it is wild. It acts on instinct, except it still has intelligence. So it's kind of like everything that we wish that we could be. You know, sometimes I wish that I was uncivilized. Sometimes I wish I didn't have to make a mortgage payment or pay the electric bill. And, you know, that's what Bigfoot is. It's that it's that man-like creature that says, I'm not going to live by your rules. Um, so it's Bigfoot's always going to be my, my archetype that is going to be keep me going well into my into my uh elderly years. Um, yeah. but you know, the Loch Ness monster. Look, that's something else that has always captured my imagination. And uh, back in uh, 1999, I actually got a chance uh, to go on a, uh, an expedition to Loch Ness. Um, and it was like, you know, um, kind of like coming home, uh, kind of like uh, being confronted with all the stuff you really imagined as a kid. Um, so I think field work is very, very necessary. But all these creatures now, so we talk about big, we talk a lot about lake monsters. But I'm also as enamored by things like werewolves and vampires because those things creep me out. And I really want to get to the bottom of why we still have to have the nightlight on because these kind of images keep on coming about from deep inside of us. And I really am interested in why that happens in the 21st century. What makes a good story spooky? Uh, well, what makes a good story spooky is that it crosses cultures. To me, that is the fundamental element of a good story. That's the fun fundamental element of a nightmare. Uh, so whenever we talk about, you know, whether it's an African culture or an Asian culture or, or you know, the Western tradition, uh, the things that I like to stir up and the things that I like to investigate is something that's going to be frightening on multiple levels. Um, you know, ghosts are one thing. Ghosts are predominant. They're, 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 um, you know, they're, they're uh, ubiquitous in, in human cultures. Uh, but so is ape men, you know, these wild man characters. So is lake monsters. So I really am looking at things that all cultures around the world can immediately identify with. And it has that same fear to them as well, too. Guru, as we go through the night, you're going to be telling us some weird, strange stories, um, spooky stories leading up to Halloween. What does Halloween mean to you? Well, you know, that's that's the show in and of itself, and I would love to talk about that uh, given, given a few weeks. Halloween is kind of like the culmination of everything that we do. We are now able to lead, you know, kind of like let our freak out during this time of the year and nobody's going to bat an eye. You know, we can talk about ghosts. We can talk about aliens and we can talk about, you know, Bigfoot and things that go bump in the night and nobody will look at us on. You know, the, October is that one month where we get free reign to kind of express who we are uh, and let our hair down and nobody's going to question us. So that's really the way I look at this Halloween season. Um, but again, Halloween, uh, you know, from from the, the Celtic origin, uh, which we have is Samhain, um, which means summer's end. It really is about um, the unexplained and, um, you know, really about what may happen next. Uh, that's that's why we celebrate Halloween. 
it's it's that fear. We're bringing the fear to the surface, and this is the one time of the year that we can confront it. Now, in the 21st century, we have personified it with uh, Jason Voorhees, and we've personified it with Mike Myers, and we've personified it with Freddy Krueger. And those characters don't make sense in Asian cultures or African cultures. Again, getting back to the idea that I'm looking for a cross-cultural thing. But what does make sense across the world is the idea of death, the unexpected, the unknown. And, uh, and that's what makes for a good horror story. And that's what Halloween is all about. So when we talk about Halloween, it's not really an ancient holiday. It only goes back about 2,000 years. Now, it might seem like you know, you know a long time. But in the grand scheme of things, it's really not that long. Um, this was a Celtic world uh, trying to comprehend what was going to happen after a very unpredictable winter. Um, and uh, they would... Um, you know, light bonfires, trying to use sympathetic magic to uh, coax the sun to stay a while. Um, this was also a time whenever the animals were brought down uh, to slaughter because now it would be cold enough uh, for the meat to keep over the winter time. And this was the last time when people would gather together for feasting uh, until the spring. And the thing about Halloween is you can imagine, you know, we're all gathered together and this is probably going to be the last time we see a lot of our elderly neighbors or family members, you know, and this was a time whenever you see a woman that was pregnant or a woman that had a newborn baby, you know, this was a time of fear and what may happen to them. So Halloween really is a reflection on all of our fears wrapped up into one. Do you really believe in the whole process of thinning of the veil? This is one of those things like Mercury retrograde that I think, you know, really, in, it's my opinion, and I know a lot of friends and people who say there is happenstance to this, but to me, it really seems like story time a little bit too much. Right. No, I do understand what you're talking about, especially whenever you're saying, oh my, you know, I'm feeling depressed, Mercury must be in retrograde. I understand that completely. But what is so cool about Halloween that it's really based upon um, an agricultural system, right? It's based upon um, the time between solstices and equinoxes. This is one of those cross-quarter times. So it's interesting whenever you look at whenever Halloween is set, and then you look at holidays around the world as well. So this particular time is important the world over. Um and because it's important the world over, that leads me to believe that there's something more to it than just its um, agricultural importance, its agrarian importance. The idea that a veil was thinning between this life and next, that's a hard thing to explain. And it's also a hard thing to kind of justify as well, too. But if you would have went back 2,000 years ago, that would have been completely acceptable. And not only in Europe, but in other parts of the world as well, too. I am a romantic. You know this. I would love to say, Dave, you know what's going on. The reason why we celebrate Halloween when we do is because the ancients knew that that is whenever the veil between two worlds were the thinnest. I would love to be able to tell you that, uh, but I can't. You know, from, from an academic point of view, I can't. From a scholarly point of view, I can't. I'm just telling you that around the world... In this part of October, very strange things are said to happen, um, regardless of what culture you're looking at. We got about three and a half minutes before we have to go to break here at the bottom of the hour. Crypto guru Ronald Murphy is with us tonight. Guru, uh, where are we going to start on the stories when we come back after the break? Give well, us a little hint. A lot of times, you know, people don't realize that I actually do uh, go out and uh, investigate things. So I kind of would like to change my uh, persona a little bit and talk about some of the investigations that I've actually been on. Oh, it sounds creepy. It sounds is. absolutely creepy. Now for you, I mean, as we get a little bit further into this show, do you get scared anymore, Ron? Absolutely. I, you know what? I, I probably get scared more than most people. Um, I hate to be alone. Uh, whenever my kids are away, I still sleep with a nightlight on. Um, these are fears that are deep-seated within me. 
And I write as a form of exorcism, I suppose, in a way. Um, but the, the whenever fears are exercised, uh, something else comes in to take their place. Uh, so it's not like you're ever going to get away from it all. Um, so I still have a fear of the dark. I still have a fear of, of the knocks and the bumps that you hear that are unexplained. And I think that's something that's going to stick with me forever. Well, you got to love it. You got to love it with two minutes to go here. Do you recommend people get into this field? Well, if you want to be uh, ridiculed and scrutinized, yes, absolutely. If you like to have people backstab you all the time, absolutely. <laughs> people stealing your information and stuff. Yeah. Um, look, I say that um, if you have a passion for this, and it has to be a thorough passion, it has to be something that really keeps you going, I say absolutely, jump into it. Um, but this is far different. What you do and what I do is far different than the people that come out during Halloween or the people that watch ghost shows or the people that buy an EMF meter and think that they're ghost hunters. Um, this takes years to build um, some sort of repertoire in order to approach this subject from so many different facets. Um, you know, it's not just about looking for monsters or looking for ghosts. It's so much more than that. And if you have um, the patience uh, to educate yourself, uh, if you have the patience to endure all that kind of self-discipline that you need to do, then I would say go for it, absolutely. But I will tell you, it's a very um, thankless uh, uh, vocation and occupation. Very true. But, you know, the one thing that you have to try and do is you have to try and stay above and well behind at the same time the the group that you're in whether it's the paranormal whether it's cryptid world or ufos mm. because i i totally agree with you if, if you're not ready for it it is a real real eye opener that's mm -hmm. for sure you know it's funny i was telling our listeners the story just the other night of the gentleman you and I were trying to help out of Manitoba yes. with, with the fairy photos that were very, very impressive. Mm -hmm. And we forewarned him about going into the field and, and just opening up to everybody, trying to get on everybody's podcast and showing off all the pictures. Mm -hmm. And within four months, he was gone. Gone. He was we don't even know what happened to him. Look, I was a friend of his on a personal basis. And I've not heard anything from him whatsoever. I don't know. If, I don't even know what happened to his well-being. I have no idea. But absolutely, Dave, he came on to your show. First time ever he did a podcast. And, yeah. yeah. And uh, it was, he just vanished. Maybe the fairies got him. Yeah, the crypto guru, Ronald Murphy, is going to share some spooky stories with us when we come back on the break right here on Spaced Out Radio. All right, we're clear. All right, it's flying by, my friend, flying by. <clears throat> I hope my voice makes it tonight. Yeah, it's. I, I, I feel bad for you, too, because I've been there, my friend. I've been there, but I don't have to do talk shows uh, like you do either. But I think that you'll be able to get through it. I got Vic's VapoRub on. I've got – I'll probably next break go upstairs and run and grab some Advil cold and sinus. Yeah, there you go. You know, <clears throat> so, oh, man, I can just feel it. Yep. <clears throat> there we go. <laughs> yeah, there's going to be a lot of throat clearing tonight. I That's know. good. That's okay. That's all right. I, I stocked up on lozenges tonight. <laughs> it's all good, man. We'll get her through. Oh, yeah. We're going to be good. On this show, feeling worse. Bonjour, Jean Paul. How are you? And, uh, Let's see here. What show are you looking for, Fidgety Aura? Oh, uh, oh, with the fairies. Did we actually have him on the air, Ron? I don't. We did. Know. Yeah, we did. Remember, you had to physically call him up because he couldn't log on to his computer or something like that. This probably was two two thousand sixteen. Is that right? Seventeen. Mm. Yeah. Sixteen. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. 
Yeah, that was a long time ago. Yeah. Ghoul Mashi, how are you? Welcome back. Davey, nice to see you. And uh, these photos, Mark, of the fairies were the best I've ever seen. Absolutely. Yeah, that's they, what I was going to say. They, they were, were either doctored, mm -hmm. and, and this guy was a computer genius, or he uh, had the real thing. Right. So what he did, Dave, if you can remember, like, like you had said, he started to just go out there and show them to absolutely everybody. I mean, that's what the problem was. He would tell people where he was located, and he was giving these things out. And Yeah. No, keep talking. I'm just showing oh, one of my guitars. Lester wanted to know about one of my guitars. Oh, right, 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 right. No, but that that's truly what had happened was uh, I don't think he was trying to pull the wool over anybody's eyes. I think he really, truly had something, whatever it was. We don't know yeah. exactly what it was. Well, but he whatever. had the body, too. Yeah, he did. He did. He had the dead body of a fairy, too. Yep. And, uh, yeah, literally, he all of a sudden just started opening his mouth everywhere, mm -hmm. going in every cryptid chat room that he could on Facebook, mm -hmm. any group, and showing his pictures, and he just got eaten alive. And mm -hmm. I remember him talking to you and to me about it, and I, I'm not sure if it was you or me that actually said to him, hey, bud, we told you so. We told you this was going to happen. Yeah. And yeah. let us come up there and verify your story first. And then we'll all go out together. Mm. And he just mm. couldn't do it. Yeah, that was the truth. Now that I'm thinking about that, that was the game plan that you and I were going to physically meet him and find out exactly what he had. And then I think that by that, by that time, he had opened up far too many doors and he was just like you said, he was being trounced as a as a charlatan on one side, and the other people were kind of using him as a pawn to get whatever they wanted at the end of the day as well, too. That's very but, right. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, gorgeous Deanna, how are you? Welcome. I want to say a big thank you to Brian, Carla, Reverend Keith, who I haven't seen in a while. Good to have you here. Swampy and Nicola for the amazing super chats tonight. The Super Chats are a great way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. So thank you guys so much for your uh, your love of this show. Uh, Lester, uh, are you t this one right here, that is a, an Italian model. It's called a, an ARC. Uh, it's a Les Paul knockoff. I can't afford a real Les Paul right now. Soon, though. Alex Kuhn, good to see you back. Uh, Oob to Joe's Maine. You've got gnomes at your place. Vintage Beard, where have you been hiding, man? Holy cow. Haven't seen you in a couple months. So glad to see you, buddy. Hope you're doing well. And uh, let's see. Who else do we got here? Uh, who else has come on in? And um, oh, we're good right now. We're good right now. And we got about 45 seconds. Uh, boss monsters cracking me up, man. <laughs> oh, he's hilarious. <laughs> I believe he works for an airline. Oh, right. Apparently a bunch of them listen to the show, according to him. Very cool. Ah, uh, vintage beard. I'm glad. Glad to have you back. Horror Realm, where have you been? All the, all the names I haven't seen in a while are coming out tonight. Wow, this is awesome. Horror Realms here. There, there's my brother David oh. Murphy in the house. Well, look at it. Look at that. It's little Davy Murphy right little, there. Little Davy Murphy, who's two years younger than I am. Little Davy Murphy in the house. Actually, one of the stories I'm going to have, I'm going to share is going to be about him. Second half hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. 
The crypto guru, Ronald Murphy, is back as we are talking spooky stories leading up to Halloween in just a couple of weeks. I know you like them. We like them, too. We love the guru around here. You can follow him on Twitter, at CryptoGuruRon. And, of course, all of his books can be found on Amazon. Guru, welcome back. Hey, thanks a lot. Again, time flying. It's as if it does not exist in the actual real realm here at uh, Space Out Radio. It's on its different continuum. Oh, I know. I know, buddy. It's been like that ever since we've had you on. Geez, going on six, seven years, man. Seven years. Seven Almost years. seven years. Yep. It's been incredible. What a run. And uh, to watch you grow, buddy, as an author in this field has been incredible. Mm-hmm. You know, we even got your brother in the chat room tonight little, on YouTube, little Davey Murphy. Little Davey Murphy. That, and I'm glad because he's making a trip to uh i believe he's going to tampa bay tomorrow so he's actually uh staying on here i think that his lovely wife sarah is probably on with him as well too Very but nice. one of the stories i have to tell you tonight involves little davy murphy well i want to tell you a story first here sure, go ahead because you're a man of wisdom and of aged beauty and not unlike myself here exactly like you both. know but th- this past week has been very difficult for me very difficult. You know what's been happening? My audience has been absolutely tearing me apart because of my dislike for eating breakfast for dinner. Oh my goodness. Um, Help me out here, man. Look, I, I, I don't know how to tell you this, Dave. Uh, this is painful for me to tell you. Um, so I had some things to do today um, and I was not home in time. Uh, to uh, to get my children supper, uh, so my oldest daughter no ordered breakfast for dinner for the children. No, yeah, I hope you grounded yeah. her. I did. Oh, absolutely. Well, she doesn't live with me. She's the one that has the baby. Uh, but no, she came over and she thought that she was doing a good job. Uh, and um, and uh, it, look, it kind of chokes me up a little bit. But um, my kids liked it. No. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm going to have to take some time to work through this. Uh, it, it just really hurts me, you know, as, as a dad, you know, you try to instill in them everything that you hold dear. And um, and the little bastards liked it. That's terrible. I, yeah. uh, Ron, I'm, I'm, I'm actually uh, tearing that's up. That's why I am. I, me too. Me too. Tearing because, up a little bit. Think about how I felt as a dad coming through that door and seeing my eight-year-old son with a pancake in his hand. That's terrible. I'm telling you. Absolutely terrible. Yeah, so that's yeah. what I'm dealing with tonight, Dave. I Honestly, Ron, you're probably going to have to ground your children for about a year, year and a half here. No television, um, and uh, th- that's the only way I-, I can do it right now. There's no television, and now there's no eggs or bread allowed in the house. Good, yeah. good. Yeah. <sighs> I, I, I'm sorry for you, buddy. I, 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 this is one of those things whenever, like I said, whenever a dad tries his best, uh, then all of a sudden, you know, it goes downhill like that. I know. Hmm. We might as well just end the show. Yeah, I, you know, I think that might be a good time. There's, uh, just, there's just no point now. No, no, no point. yeah. Yeah. Uh, and um, it was like they had pancakes well, the, around here, there's a restaurant called a Denny's restaurant, uh, and they have something there called the Grand Slam, which is eggs, bacon or sausage, a hash brown, and um, pancakes, and they had each a Grand Slam. I know. Tim to Dim, welcome to our chat room, says, my wife loves breakfast for dinner. I dislike it and think it's lazy. Mm-hmm. I Beautiful. think it's. I we you can come join uh, the anti breakfast for dinner crowd, dim to dim. Yeah, you can you can totally do that. We would appreciate that. Hey, Guru, let's get into some story time because I'm getting depressed here. Yeah, me too, man. Me too. You know uh, what do you got for us right off the bat with one of your investigations? I will tell you my earliest investigation that I've ever done as an adult. How does that sound? And okay. this involves my brother, little Davy Murphy, and this involves before. I became involved in the paranormal. This is whenever the paranormal actually came looking for me. I think that's a good a good tagline. So 
I was in graduate school up at uh, Indiana University of Pennsylvania, uh, which is a little bit north of north uh, east of Pittsburgh, about 70 miles away from Pittsburgh. And it's a very rural area, lots of woods, uh, not a lot of stuff to do there. If the university wasn't there, there would probably be no town. So we, uh, my brother and I, uh, were living uh, there on the corner of where I guess civilization meets the woods. You know, behind us was um, these woods that was owned by the university and there was no hunting there or anything. It was a very protected land. So we were kind of out in the middle of nowhere. We were like the last house until, you know, it was, it was all, it was all woods. So we moved into this place and um, almost immediately the first summer, we would hear this whistling sound. Um, it always happened between the hours of 12 and 3 a.m. Uh, same as uh, Spaced Out Radio, as a matter of fact, uh, here on the East Coast. Um, but um, and it only happened whenever the weather was uh, right condition. There was no, there would be no rain or anything like that. But between 12 and 3, we would hear this loud whoop sound. Um, the first year, we really didn't think much about it. We thought it might be birds or something like that. The second year, it starts coming a little bit more bolder, if you will. Um, it the, the, the whistling is a lot louder. The whooping is a lot louder. And it seems as if, for some reason, it is targeting our property, um, if that makes any sense. Uh, so my brother and I, I mean... At this point, I'm in my mid-20s, uh, so my brother will be in his early 20s right about that time. So we were, I mean, we were athletic. We were playing sports and stuff like that at the time. Uh, and we thought, you know, hey, look, we're going to go out and investigate this. Uh, and sure enough, it, it was probably about 2 o'clock in the morning. We hear this whoop, whoop sound. And um, my brother grabbed a baseball bat. And I grabbed a sword because, of course, you have to have a sword involved in one of these stories. Um, and we opened out the door. And this was the first time that we had ever stepped outside whenever this sound was going on. Um, and it was shocking because when we went outside, it was not only permeate, permeating the air around us, you could actually feel it within your body as if it was... You know, now looking back on it, we can say it was called infrasound or whatever, but there was something out there that was whistling that was able to produce a vibration within our body. So we soldiered on, however, you know, again, 20 year old kids with weapons. What more can you ask for? So behind our house was a grove of trees that led to the bigger woods. So we got to this little grove of trees and we kind of came to a standstill at the same time. And I'm not sure exactly why, but the whistling was intense. We knew whatever this thing was, was right in front of us. We couldn't see it because it was pitch black outside. But whatever this was, was within yards from us. The whistling was still continuing. The, the whoop, whoop, like that. But now the thing starts growling at us. Um, there were two sounds being produced by this creature at one time. So the whistling and the whooping continued as well as growling. And not only was it just a regular growl, we were so close that we could actually hear it taking air into itself to produce the growl. And it was a very wet sound. So this was a large creature that was in front of us. So what anybody in the right mind would do is we immediately ran back to, to our house. Um, I wasn't going to go any further. I have no idea to that day what was in front of us. But from that moment on, that is whenever I decided that I would start investigating the paranormal. Uh, that is whenever I went to the internet and I put Bigfoot in Pennsylvania and one website came up and that was the Pennsylvania Bigfoot Society uh, ran by Eric Altman. And that's how I became friends with Eric Altman. And that story right there is what led me to become an investigator. That was actually Eric Altman's first investigation as a uh, as a Bigfoot investigator. Very cool. Yeah. So, so did you ever get close to this creature? That, that and it never came back. After this, it never returned. Um, I would say 
and I, again, like I said, my, my, my brother's on, so he could text or he could tap in or if, uh, I would say we were probably maybe 30 yards away from it. Something like that, you know, from probably from like home plate to first base uh, in baseball, I probably something, I would say about 90 to 100 feet away because it was so close that we could actually not only feel this, you know, vibration, but we could actually hear um, it taking an error. So we were that close. Now, what was interesting is that we had very, it was very sparse neighbors. There wasn't a lot of neighbors around. Um, but I did ask one lady who lived down from us. I said, hey, have you ever heard anything strange? at night? She goes, you hear a lot of strange things around here. Now, she had lived there her whole life, and we were just interlopers that have been there for, you know, a little over a year, a uh, year and a half. And um, she said, you hear a lot of strange things. Uh, as she was uh, she was uh, tilling her her garden with a a little hand uh, a hand uh, shovel, um, and then whenever I started to walk away, she looked up and she said, "I will tell you one story, however, that there was a man going through our garbage one night, and when we opened up the door, it ran back into the woods." So those kind of stories, you know, the the idea when people are skeptical and they see something or they hear something. And they try to work it within their own uh, schematic of what is possible, what's not possible. But that story right there was the impetus that got me started because I could not figure out, even though I had a love for the paranormal all my life, um, that was something that I could not explain away. Now, what I find hard to believe, and the same thing with you as well, too, we're into this. But we also have experienced this as well, too. Now, one of my things regarding paranormal activity is, do we go after it because we experience it? Or does it want us to experience it, if that makes any sense? Like, are we chosen to be the ones that these things come out to? You know, almost as if there has to be a circuit, some sort of... Um, uh, agreement an unspoken agreement between you and whatever else is out there that we have to submit to the encounter uh for this kind of stuff to happen i don't know how to explain it you know it's just interesting that somebody that had grown up interested in this stuff now has a visitation by something that cannot be explained the crypto guru ronald murphy is here tonight ron when you're out on an investigation you know whether it's this first one you went on. I mean, carrying a sword, man that that yeah. is just, that is just bad. That yeah. is just big time badass for you, man. It really is. It really I, I is. hope you went out, you know, with no shirt on. You know, your hairy chest. You know, going to chase down this creature. Your pants rolled up to halfway up the shin. Yeah. Well, you know, let me, hope- well, uh, back then I had a mullet. You know, I had like a great hockey mullet. Beautiful. But, and That's you so can imagine, idea. yep, you can imagine whenever I went out into that July breeze that it was blowing. You know, I probably looked like Aslan from uh, The Lion and the Witch in the Wardrobe. It was like a, a mane of hair around me. Beautiful. And I think if I can, if I'm not mistaken, I think that I did not have a shirt on. And, you know, the the the, the, the moon was just glistening off of my chest. Uh, so, yeah, it's, a, it's as badass as you can imagine. That is just wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know what bud i i can honestly say i i know you're not a bs or either so, <laughs> so i i'm actually imagining this to be true right yes now. yes that's right that's right at one time i was in good shape if you can like if, if we would go back to uh the, the 1990s i was in... <laughs> well we didn't have to talk about the perm there but uh no no it was a great moment though it really really was and, uh, yeah, it was just – that was probably the most kick-ass moment I've ever had in my life. I got to tell you, I mean, the fact that Bigfoot saw your your permed mullet, That's right. you know, I think you need to bring it back. Yeah, and he never came back either. Could you Can you imagine that? Like, he saw what he would have to face, and he said, I'm not going to deal with that any longer. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. My goodness. The guru, Ronald Murphy, tell us a little bit more. Do you have any more – Sasquatch stories you want to share with us? So seven well, and a half minutes. Okay. How, how many minutes? Seven and a half. Seven and a half minutes. Okay. So uh, 
we'll talk more about this kind of the experiencer getting these experiences. So um, this was not very long ago. This was probably only about five years ago. And um, I, I, I get up in the morning. It's winter time. I'm watching TV. And all of a sudden it says school has been canceled. Now, whenever school was canceled in the Murphy household, that means nonstop horror for Ron Murphy throughout the day. You know, I'm a single dad by this time. I've got five kids living at home. I am up to, you know, I'm need, I've got to call off work. This is going to be my day. So one of the things that the crypto guru does, which is a bad habit, and I shouldn't do it all the time, but whenever I get very, very nervous, sometimes I will smoke a cigarette. Because that's one thing the kids do not want that I am doing. You know, it's something they can't enjoy. So I so I don't smoke all the time. So I keep the cigarettes in my car. So I go out. I open up the door to the breast of the new fallen snow. And as I make my way to my car, I notice that there are tracks in my yard. In my yard, not only are they tracks, but they're barefoot tracks as well, too. That means that they have no shoes or socks on. I actually sent these pictures to you, if I'm not mistaken, Dave. I think that I did. Um, so it was interesting, to say the least. I was shocked. Uh, so I thought, i got to find out where these things started. They started in the middle of my yard, and they didn't originate from any place. They just appeared. But they appeared a little by little. So it was a right foot, and then a little bit farther away, it was another right foot, and then a left foot, and then a right foot, as if it stepped out of something or materialized or whatever, became tangible. I ha These are true stories. I have no way of telling you what happened. I'm just reporting what happened to me. So there was a trackway that led up to my window, to my where my, my uh, dining room was, and then went over the hill and vanished. They vanished just as if they began. They just stepped out into to nothingness. Um, the trackway maybe consisted of maybe 25 tracks total. And I've uh, documented the majority of them. Uh, I have evidence of them. But the other thing is these are not your typical Bigfoot tracks. These were very small tracks, about maybe a little bit bigger uh, than a toddler's track. So I'm saying maybe like maybe a, a five-year-old track, um, completely barefoot uh, with no uh, origin besides stepping out into our reality and no end besides leaving our reality. Again, I'm a Bigfoot investigator. How does this happen? Why is it looking in my window? No way to explain it. Um, I've never tried to make any money off this. I didn't include it in my books or anything like that. But this is a story that I simply cannot explain away. I contacted the the the, the grandfather of the paranormal here in Western Pennsylvania, um, uh, uh, Stan Gordon, and he said for about the past 30 years in this area, these Bigfoot tracks, these small tracks, have been reported which I never had heard of before. Uh, now, what was curious is about three years later, uh, the exact same spot. So we're talking about the last time I was there was about um, uh, a year and a half ago. In the, in the, in the um, springtime, we found the same size tracks in the mud that, again, just were in the mud, didn't lead any place else, just a few tracks, um, same size as, as if it was the same creature. Um, again, hard to explain. I have no idea what was going on. Um, I, I documented it all on film. But what is interesting is after we found these tracks in the uh, springtime, and these tracks were probably about 100 yards away from my house, um, that section of the woods is now posted. People used to go up there hunting. People used to go up there um, hiking and everything. And now that place is blocked off. Really? Yep. 
When you were in the area as an experiencer, investigator, author, where you know Sasquatch is, mm -hmm. and you are hearing strange noises, maybe everything from whooping to wood knocks, or maybe even like, you know, the heavy breathing coming from the forest. What goes through your mind when you're in that close proximity? Uh, what goes through my mind is um, what am I hearing? Because the, the the skeptical side of me says this cannot be happening. Okay, um, but whenever you're confronted with something like this, um, there's really nothing else. There's really no other variable in there that makes any sense. There's no other red herring in there. If this was a math equation, you just solve. You know, you solve for x. And the most logical expl explanation is there is something out there that has been uncategorized, uncatalogued, and it is in your presence. That's the only way I can explain it. Uh, again, I've never physically seen the creature. I've seen tracks. I've heard noises. Um, so my quest to find the truth is still out there. But there is enough of this anecdotal evidence um, that is leading me to believe that there is a creature out there called a Bigfoot that people have been seeing for thousands of years. And we, we, we call it a legend simply because science has not um, pinned it down onto a table yet and cut it open. A minute to go here, uh, Guru, as we continue on. So, in other words, if you're in the vicinity of Bigfoot, do you stand still? Do you keep looking for it? Or do you stay in a group so that way you don't get in any trouble? Well, from what my research is, is starting to show and from what my um, experience is starting to show, I don't think you have much of a voluntary uh, response to it. I think that whenever you're confronted with something like this, you are immediately confronted with this fight or fight response uh, that is ingrained in us since we left the savannas of Africa. I think that there is something within us that we know exactly what this is because our, you know, evolutionary development had to at least have been concurrent with these things. So we do have some sort of working knowledge about what these things are, even if it's on a subconscious level. And I also think that they utilize infrasound. I, I truly do. And I think that that idea that we are stunned and we don't know what to do next is coming from a very... Um, explainable biological function that's known as infrasound that many animals around the world use. A tiger, for instance, they say if you're confronted by a tiger, uh, a lot of people report not being able to move as if they're frozen in place because the infrasound so impacts your body that it kind of messes up the way you're, you, you're, you normally think. All right, crypto guru Ronald Murphy, one hour down, another 90 minutes to go with the guru himself. We love crypto guru Ronald L. Murphy Jr. You can find all of his books on Amazon. Follow him on Twitter at crypto guru Ron. Yes, I gave him the nickname. Don't any let anybody else take credit for that. That's right. Space Out Radio continues with more stories, fables, and legends with the guru next. All right, we're clear. No, excellent. Overbuilt Automotive. How you doing, buddy? Uh, Tangerina Arena, welcome to the SOR chat. Appreciate that for coming on in. I like the newbies. Yeah. Um, <laughs> hold on. What does John want here? <coughs> oh, that's nice, John. That is nice. Uh, I got to get him a link for later. So just bear with me here, Guru. Sure. Where the hell is? There it is. I swear to goodness, I cannot find a thing tonight. Cannot find a thing. All right. Um, you know, when you were talking about fear there, mm -hmm. when Samantha Mowat and I saw the aliens in the forest, 
I I was frozen still too. Mm-hmm. And I didn't feel like anything overcame me. I think it was like, for me, it was more, I can't, honestly, it was like, can you believe this shit going on right now? This can't be real. Right. Sure. And like, I was so confused by hello, gorgeous Larry. How are you? I was so confused, Ron, by the, um, the sight of it all. Jim, yeah. what are you doing? And that I just I couldn't move. Right, right. No, I think that's what a lot of people, especially whatever I'm doing conferences, you know, that's the main thing that people come up to tell me. Normal people come up and ask me if I believe in this stuff. I tell them, like, keep an open mind. Um, and then uh, they, they, you know, they sometimes just let loose. I mean, I've seen guys that look like they could uh, – you know, ride with a, uh, the Hell's Angels breaking down in tears uh, because something crossed their path. Nothing confrontational, mind you. They saw something that they could not explain, and it so impacted them on a psychological, emotional, spiritual aspect uh, that they needed to have it get it off their chest. Um, and that is really what happens, I think. You know, we are confronted with something that should not be out there, uh, and uh, then once we see it or once we hear it or once we experience it, it's up to us now to try to plug it in to our lives and how it works in the grand scheme of things. And oh, sometimes yeah. that's a very difficult thing to do. Oh, absolutely it is, bud. Absolutely it is. And, uh, you know, we've got three minutes here. But um, it, it's very, very scary. It is. It is very scary. Uh, Majdi is like, uh, or is it Mighty? Mighty or Majdi? Is, is the J pronounced? Anyways, asking. It was great to hear your experience with UCR channel. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. I got, there was a lot of negative comments towards me on that. No, no fault of Lou and the team. They were fantastic. Uh, but there was a lot of negative comments on that one. Ed Clater, what's happening, man? And Clater. <laughs> there we go. Got it out. Spooky Morales, thank you for that super chat, by the way. And thank you to Smithy, Brian, Carla, Reverend Keith, Swampy, and Nicola for the amazing super chats. Remember, folks, this is a great way to support what we do on this channel on a nightly basis. And if you're if you want, I encourage you to go shopping on our website, spacedoutradio.com forward slash shop, where you can pick out some really cool swag. It's not just t-shirts. If you find a logo that you like, click on it. We have, a, and you scroll down, you'll see a bunch of different uh, logos for hoodies and, and ball caps and stickers and everything in there. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, just go check it on out, you know, appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I was totally supported by the guys from UCR Spooky, totally supported by them, uh, you know, but, um, you know, afterwards you read the chats and, um, and I, I reported one the other day, reported one real negative comment on my, on a good friend's, uh, chat. This person was just completely rude. So goes with the territory. It does. Well, that's a good point. Whenever we talk about how people wanting to get involved in this, um, every show that I do, and I'm sure you do the same way, uh, you have people that follow you just because they hate you. You know, they don't like what you have to say. So they'll spend two hours of their lives to troll you and write down negative things. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think that's uh, in, in very look, almost every time that we do this show together, you have the same people commenting negative things and giving the thumbs down or whatever. That's fine. Then that's, that's their prerogative, but they're still listening to the whole freaking show. Yeah. I had one, uh, I had one on YouTube today that I saw guys, yeah. you know, uh, ripping me. I just went, Hey, thanks for listening. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hit that subscribe button. The <laughs> font is here. She's a, I believe she's in Pennsylvania too. All right, we got uh, 30 seconds. A big thank you to everybody tuning us in. Super Chat is open, as well as a thank you to all the veterans who are tuning in. Remember, you always have a safe home here on Spaced Out Radio in our chat room. 
and of course all the regulars who are here nightly and pop it on in and out i love seeing you guys here you make it so much fun if you're new here don't forget to hit that subscribe button ring that bell and let us know hey mennonite abe how are you buddy and we're gonna get going in three seconds get your horns up here comes bumblefoot You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook, Spaced Out Radio Show. Hour number two of Spaced Out Radio is underway tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Big thank you to everyone tuning us in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. All you got to do is go to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Renita Phobia. Renita Phobia is your password. Nobody knows what it means, but the Clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot, reading up on Shirky Poo's Newswire, and check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on tonight with the crypto guru, Ronald Murphy. You can follow him on Twitter at Crypto Guru Ron. And of course, check out all of his books on Amazon. You got to type in Ronald L. Murphy Jr. And it's spooky tales and stories for the build up to Halloween. Guru, welcome back. Thanks a lot, my friend. Thanks a lot. And, you know, what we have another, what, hour and a half left or something like that. I'll just close again on like an hour now. See, things go, you're going to have to make this a show, a six-hour show. Oh, goodness. <laughs> goodness. You know, that would kill my voice. Yes, I know. It, yeah. it would kill my voice, you know. But, hey, we're going to move on here. And, you know, Ron, there's always a lot of legends and lore that come out around this time and year where people all of a sudden – you know, realize the paranormal is is uh, very popular for at least one month out of the year, and that right. is the month of October. And the closer we get to Halloween, the closer we get to people telling all sorts of spooky stories. What kind of spooky ghost stories do you have for us? Um, well, I will tell you about one that was very personal to uh, to to me, as a matter of fact. So um, we got this house. Oh, thank you very much. That's very nice. I see. I that that that, that makes me feel better because I, I I don't get any love around here. But um, uh, not when your kids are eating breakfast for dinner, you know. Exactly. That's that's, that's right. Uh, so um, this is before I I I, I um I, I got my divorce. I was still married, but this is one of those incidences that actually I think kind of spurred the inevitable on a little bit quicker. So we got this house. It was an older house. Um, we, we moved in um, and we, we, we found it strange that um, the attic was sealed off. I have no idea why it was sealed off, uh, but the previous owners had um, put up drywall and repainted it. So you couldn't even find the door to the attic. But it, what was interesting is there was still a window outside and um we put the put uh, a ladder up and we looked in and the room had a table in it and a chair and a light and that was it but for whatever reason uh the previous owners had sealed it off uh which was was kind of freaky so shortly after we moved in um my daughter devon started to say that she was experiencing um some sort of figure uh in her room now, with the time, I think that she might have been about 11 or 12. So she was just a little one. And she got to the point where she refused to sleep in her room. Um, she described as some sort of shadow man looking at her. Um, now, um, my my wife at the time, uh, she was down on the couch. And she said that she thought it was me coming downstairs. Uh, but she said that she could see something, a shape moving down the stairs, stopped about midway on the stairs, and then just glanced into the living room. 
Uh, she thought it was me. Uh, whenever she find out, found out that it wasn't me, uh, you know, she, she had no idea what to do with this kind of stuff. Uh, but one time I was down on the couch and I too saw a shadow move down. I didn't see it clearly. All I could see in my peripheral, peripheral vision was a shadow coming down. Okay, so then other strange things start happening. Um, we had had to have the fire department in our house several times because an overwhelming smell of gas permeated the house. Uh, all the times they had come, no sign of any kind of gas leak or anything like that. Um, then it started to get to the point where things were breaking. Um, we had parked our, my, my car out in the yard um, one night. We, we didn't even hear a noise, go out the next day, and the car's window is shattered. Uh, but what made it so strange is that it was shattered from the inside out, which really, really kind of weird. So we, um, you know, I, I had kids, you know, five kids, uh, and they were playing with the, with the little neighbor kids. And um, I was outside on the swing while they were playing, and the little neighbor boy, they were playing, they were running around our house. Then the little neighbor boy had seen me up there on the porch and he slows down a little bit and he climbs up the steps and he sits down beside me and he says to me, again, this is a true story. You can't make this kind of stuff up. He says to me, I know your house is haunted. Again, this is a true story. Um, I look at him and I said, what? And he said, I know your house is haunted. I said, how do you know that? He said, because whenever I look out my window at night, I can see them in your yard. Okay. So yeah, exactly. So that's what I said as well too. So things are breaking. There are these shadowy kind of figures being seen. Um, things are moving in the house. So I decide it's time to call in a medium. You know, I don't know really what else to do. Um, a good friend of mine uh, was uh, Dolores Kincannon. Um, I had worked with her for a number of years, um, and I really trusted her. Uh, she came to the house, and she said, um, I, I sense two spirits in this house. Uh, the one that is breaking things, the one that is driving you out of the house, is actually the good ghost because it does not want the evil spirit to come after your family. Now that's, think about that for a second, okay? So what she was saying is the thing that was causing us the most damage in that house was actually a benevolent force trying to get us out so nothing worse would come about. That was a terrifying thing for us. And and again, I can't say that that was one of the things that 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 led to my, my uh, divorce, but that was definitely one of the things that was going in that direction because it put up an, uh, an incredible stress on the family. Uh, it was turning things up and down, upside down. Uh, my daughter that was experiencing these things did not want to live there any longer. Um, and um, I think it all goes back uh, to that room that was sealed off for whatever reason. Uh, I still do not have um, uh, any kind of... Uh, uh, idea about why it might have happened that way uh but yeah that's that's what happened wow that sounds eerily similar to mine we lived my ex-wife and i lived in a duplex and our best friends lived next door to us and it was convenient because we shared babysitting and you know we shared dinners together and it was just a great time our side completely haunted nothing happening on their side nothing knocking on walls we uh all of our teaspoons and drinking glasses disappeared over time and i remember one time i got back from the radio station it was about i got back from work probably around midnight one o'clock in the morning and i was sitting uh or laying on my couch watching television because after i got done reading the sports on on the radio i would when i got home the first thing i would do is i'd go home and i'd watch the sports highlights to see if i missed anything mm -hmm. and so 
about 10, 15 minutes later, my, my daughter comes walking down the stairs, sleepwalking. And she comes in and she li- she's only about three years old at the time. She lies down on my chest and, you know, we fall asleep under the blanket that I was under. And so at about four o'clock in the morning, my, my buddy next door had this big dog. And at about four o'clock every morning, this dog would start to bark mm-hmm. and it would stop. So I wake up, I'm immediately angry because it's woken me up out of my sleep and I got to be up in a couple of hours to get my kid ready for, you know, uh, for the next day and everything like that. And I'm facing the back of the couch and my daughter is using my arm as a pillow Mm -hmm. in between me and the back of the couch. So I figured, okay, I'm going to roll over, slowly pull my hand underneath so that way she doesn't wake up. And then I'm going to go to the window. I'm going to yell at the dog to sh- tell him to shut up. And as I turn over, I rolled over this way. And as my eyes kind of adjusted, about a foot and a half, two feet away from me, there was a little girl standing there. And she was wearing a white nighty. She had long ringlet hair, the pudgy kid's cheeks. And she was just standing there staring at me. So I did what any man would do. I screeched and I rolled myself o- over, flipped the blanket over my head, ca- mm-hmm. caught my breath because I could see right through her mm-hmm. on my, this is how old the story is. My VCR mm-hmm. <laughs> said was saying 4.02 a.m., 4.02 a.m. And so I caught my breath. I actually pinched myself to see if I was awake because I'd never seen a ghost before. Mm-hmm. And I rolled back over. Okay, what do I do if she's still there? I got to get my daughter and me out of here. And I rolled over and she's gone. So quickly grab my daughter, run us upstairs, right into bed and fall asleep. Tell my ex-wife about what happened. And then a few days later, once a year, my my buddy Steve and I, we'd have a, a game of college football on, on the old Nintendo. And I was over at his house playing college football. And it was usually one of those nights where we never had a time limit. And, and so all of a sudden I get home about one 30 in the morning and my ex-wife says to me, I saw your ghost. I said, what do you mean? You saw the ghost. She goes, I was woken up to the piano playing. And she goes, I thought it was the cats playing around because we had two cats. And I, she goes, I thought they were, playing around on the, on the piano and we had a two tiered stairwell uh, from going upstairs to downstairs. And she went on the, went down to the first tier and kind of looked down at the piano to yell at the cats. And here was the same little girl in the same mm-hmm. nighty playing on the piano, like just banging on the keys. And then the little girl stopped and turned and looked up at my ex-wife. So my ex-wife did what she would do. And she ran to the bedroom and, quickly close the door. (laughs) Right. And, but this place, man, we had everything like inside our master bedroom closet, there would be scratching on the walls. Uh, One time, if you have a coin, uh, you know, and I I went outside and I took our dog for a pee and the the power had gone out and it wasn't late. And it was about, uh, I'm going to say about 10 o'clock at night. So, my ex-wife and my my our neighbor next door, they're still in the duplex. Uh, they decided they were going to drive to Starbucks and go get a coffee and you know and get me a hot chocolate and everything. And and so I'm outside with my dog uh, at the time, and he's out doing uh, his business. And you know the sound a coin makes on a win- on glass, kind of mm-hmm. kind of like that, mm-hmm. and. I look, I turn to our kitchen window and I look and I'm thinking, oh crap, the daughters are awake, have awoken and I got to check this out because they're probably freaked out. There's no lights and where's mom and dad. Mm-hmm. So I quickly run inside and I've got my flashlight and, you know, run upstairs. Kids are still snoring away, sleeping away, cutting logs. I'm like, what the heck was that? And then our final night there, we were we were moving, 
and I was cleaning out the place and the ex-wife and I were standing cleaning out and wiping down our linen, linen towel closet. And as we were cleaning it out, the bathroom was right beside us. And then there was a covered porch. It used to be a porch, but it was now covered into a storage room. And from that, the storage room door was open and the bathroom door was open. And from the either the bathroom or the storage room, I, I mean, both are only a couple of feet away. I don't know what room it was, but we hear this little girl's voice say, Mommy. Mm. My ex-wife and I look at each other. She goes, I'm out of here. I'm done. Mm. And we never went back. But the funny part about it is my daughter, when she went through high school, one of her friends from high school literally lived about five houses down, but we had to pass our old place. And she says, every time she walked past that place, she would see the little girl that's, that's standing in her bedroom window. That, see, yeah, that is very, very eerie. Um, wow. That, <laughs> see, it, one, of, one, of, one of the people on her said too, whenever it's the ghost of a child, that somehow makes it even more terrifying. Yes, hugely, hugely. You know, I mean, there's just something real creepy about that. Yes, that's right. Now, I've, I've uh, talked to paranormal investigators, and, and it's odd because it always is a little child. Whenever you talk about the little ringlets and things like that, that's something that's very common. And I've talked to researchers before that have experienced these little girls in homes. And whenever they get close, uh, sometimes the child doesn't have any eyes or doesn't have a mouth. And some people think that that might be a, a demonic spirit trying to imitate a child. And, you know, there's there's an idea in the paranormal realm that um, demons are not able to counterfeit uh, reality 100%. There's always going to be a flaw in their copy. Um, and one of the things is they cannot reproduce the face completely. So you'll have things that are missing eyes or noses and other freakish type of grotesque um uh, figures. Uh, but whenever you experience something like that, like whenever it comes to ghosts, it's not a question of whether I believe in them or not. I accept it face value. I think that that is something that's so ingrained in who we are as human beings that almost everybody believes in a ghost and has no, no problem with saying that ghosts exists. Now it's what other things might be there as well. Are we talking about a ghost is a disembodied spirit? Is it a created entity? Is it something that is demonic? All these kind of things come into, into the realm as well and kind of muddy the waters. But what you had dealt with to the point that it was frightening you enough to want you to get out of there, I can never think the same way in my case that that could be something that is good in any way. No, no, I, I don't like child ghosts. That's right. Just don't like them. It, it just, it, there's just something morbidly eerie about a child spirit or ghost that I just, I don't want anything to do that. No, right, right. That's right. No, I agree. Now, what was also interesting about this? Well, one of the good things about this is I really never had ghostly encounters before. And it was these things that gave me the uh, impulse to write my book entitled On Ghosts. So if anybody wants to go to Amazon and read On Ghosts, um, a lot of my um, experiences uh, are documented in there because I was writing the book as these experiences were happening. Incredible. Yeah. I incredible. We got four minutes left guru in regards to ghosts and, and ghouls goblins i mean it sounded like you had a poltergeist almost at your place yeah i mean well yeah i think that and that's 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 a good point so when we talk about poltergeist i'm not sure if we can ca classify those things all by themselves i think that a full-bodied apparition or a classic haunting as we would call them also has the capabilities of being a poltergeist to be something that just acts on emotion and on force upon the world. I truly think that can happen. Now I have investigated poltergeist uh, happenings before where the only thing that is um, uh, presented in that particular haunting is movements and, and things. And you never experience anything. 
but I think that you can be living in a house that's inhabited by a ghost and it can manifest itself in very, very many different aspects. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Whenever you're dealing with anything that is breaking the rules of physics, turning things over, breaking things, um, you are now seeing the other world acting physically upon your world. And that's really what turns things upside down. Because even though, like you said about, the, about that little ghost, you could see through it, it was also able to have a mass in order to play the piano. You know what I mean? So these kind of strange things doesn't sit well with us because we can't explain them away. It doesn't make any sense to us scientifically, but it's still happening. So what do we do with that? How do we make it acceptable in our own minds? And I think for the most part, we just say it's ghostly activity and there's really no other way to explain it away. Yeah, I don't know how to explain it, man. I've never experienced that. You know, that's the one paranormal experience I, I honestly would like to see. I would love to see something move. I have been pinched. I have been touched by ghosts. I have, I've never been shoved. I've been attacked. And that was kind of strange. But I've never seen that poltergeist activity with things flying off the counters or chairs moving or anything. And yeah, I honestly, I feel kind of ripped off about that. Right. Man. Yeah, I, I've been to um, the room of a child uh, that was in a hospital, and I saw a rubber ball uh, move from one side of the room to the other side and then back across again. I have seen that with my own eyes before. Um, and I was not scared. You know, I think in a different circumstance, it would have been. Uh, but I, I was not afraid. I, I think that this spirit was trying to say, hey, I'm here. Almost that kind of a thing. Like, you know, or at least I existed. I was someone. Um, but the whenever things break. Um, and I've investigated things, things of that nature as well, too. That is something entirely off-putting. So the movement of a, of a, of a ball across the room was very uh, uh, influential on, on, on me because it made it seem as if it was trying to interact to say that it, it, it knew that we were there and we knew that it was there. Uh, but whenever there's violence, that's something that I can't deal with. Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. You know, uh, we got about 30 seconds left. And when we come back from the break, we'll get into more monster talk because I know the guru has a bunch of monster stories that he would love to share with you guys in regards to ghouls, goblins, and Bigfoot, Dogman. We'll find out what's happening in Chestnut Ridge and other places that he loves to investigate. The crypto guru, Ronald Murphy, is here once again, our pre-Halloween show with the guru. You can follow him on Twitter at CryptoGuruRon. Find all his books on Amazon by going to Ronald L. Murphy Jr. The stories continue as we keep on rocking guru time here on Spaced Out Radio. Stay tuned. Wow. I hope these, I ho hope your listeners are having a good time. They're very talkative, which I absolutely love, but I hope that they are having a good time because look, you know, nobody wants to go out there. If we suck, you know, let us know that we suck, but I hope that they're having a good time. I think they are a uh, quick question for you here from where is it here? From Sasquatch, what can you tell us about the woman in white? Uh, for well, so there's a lot of different women in white. Um, there's you know, a famous one in Chicago, uh, there's one outside of Bangor, Maine. Um, that's a common, um, I'm not going to say urban legend, but that's a common trope whenever it comes to hauntings. 
um, the, 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 the inevitable woman in white. So it could be a bride that died on her wedding day. It could be somebody that died during homecoming. Uh, but, but that is a typical type of thing uh, whenever, whenever uh, we hear these kind of things. So unless he's more specific. But I'm glad yeah, they're having Van, a Vancouver also has a woman in white, the, too. See? There you go. And, there you go. Uh, she is a hitchhiker. Yeah. And so people will pull. It usually happens on rainy or really dark nights, and people will pull over and pick her up, and they'll say, "Where are you going?" And she'll have they'll have a conversation. They'll get a couple of miles down the road, and she'll be gone. Yep, yep. That that's a common thing. Like I said, um, so that's almost archetypical of, of these kind of women in white stories. Uh, Jeremy's from Maine. Tell him more about the one in Bangor. Yeah. Well, it was almost verbatim of what you just talked about, Dave. So, yeah, there's a uh, there's a, a very well, most all the roads in Maine are very rural, uh, but there's the the uh, the very famous uh, woman in white, and I don't know what that road is, Jeremy, unfortunately, uh, but it's between Bangor and um, oh, I wish I could think of the other town, which, which is escaping me right now. Uh, but, you know, it's very wooded, very isolated, and someplace that needs a ghost. So even if it's not a real ghost and it's a fabricated one, it's there because for a good reason. Well, thank you, Jenny White Bear. I'm just Googling it. Um, let's see, is this it? Route 182? That, that's, that might be it. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I'm just looking here. Uh, just mute this site because there's a lot of pop-ups on this site. Um, we got lots of time. Yeah, I think Route 182. Okay. If that makes any sense. Hopefully that makes the sense to somebody up there. Why don't we hear about men in white or any other colors? Yeah, I, I, I don't understand. Well, a lot of times the reason she's in white is because something tragic happened on a very important day, like a wedding day or, you know, she was one of those kind of things. So it's a traumatic experience. Gotcha. We got about uh, 90, just over 90 seconds. 90 seconds. Mm -hmm. That looks good, Dave. What are you smoking there, buddy? This is pineapple ice. Nice. Yeah. It's a good flavor. Have there been any uh, recent... Cryptid creature sightings around Lawrence County, Pennsylvania. They no, would. but I'll tell you what. Um, if you are there, I will be up at Hillview Manor in Lawrence County. Uh, not this Friday, coming up at next Friday on um, October 22nd. So I hope you come out and see me because I'm going to be giving a talk on the haunted history of Halloween. Uh, Chris Mo from Austria. Good to see you, buddy. Whit Helton, nice to have you here. All right. Guru, I want a creepy dog man or, or Bigfoot story next. All right, we'll do a dog man story. All right. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. A big thank you to Mennonite, Abe, Spooky, Smithy, Brian, Carla, Reverend Keith, Swampy, and Nicola with the crazy and awesome super chats. Really do appreciate the love and support you guys give. It's a great way to support what we do here on a nightly basis. Big thank you to all the veterans who are tuned on in. And uh, you always have a safe home here with us on Spaced Out Radio in our chat room. Thank you to all the regulars who are here and to the new people listening in for the first time. Do us a favor, hit that subscribe button, ring that bell. We're here for you seven days a week, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time. And uh, you can also do a little shopping for some swag on our website, spacedoutradio.com forward slash shop here we go
We pass the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Want to remind you that if you've missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. Crypto Guru time continues here in the build up to Halloween with some spooky tales of ghosts, ghouls, and goblins. Ronald L. Murphy Jr. is who you look up on Amazon for any one of his great books that are out there. And Guru, it is always a pleasure to have you here, my friend. Oh, absolutely. I would rather be no other place. Uh, you know what? I would. I would like to be sitting beside you in the studio right now talking with you person to person. That's what needs to happen one day. You know what? I would love that to happen because you know what we'll do after the show? What's that? We'll drive out into the forest and listen to see if we can find anything. There we go. That's perfect. We will eat breakfast and then head out into the forest. No, we will not. <laughs> what is wrong with you? I'm sorry. I had a moment of... <laughs> yeah, I hope not. I, I really hope not. All right. One of the creatures that scares the living daylights out of a lot of people, man, is the legendary dog man. This is a creature that relatively was unknown until Linda Godfrey's article of the Beast of Bray Road back in 1989 in Wisconsin. And now this dog man seems to be everywhere in North America from the forests of British Columbia around where I am right down into Southern New York and way below into the areas of, you know, everywhere from Florida, Georgia, and in between. Ron, I don't know what it is about this creature, man, but we've heard about people shooting it and it doesn't go down. We've heard about people running away from it, and it always seems to be creeping behind. And, well, you know, like a horror movie where you're running at top speed, and this thing's keeping up by walking. That's I mean, funny. what is with this creature? I don't know, but if you wanted to pick out the perfect creature to haunt you, this would be the thing. Um, it has um, all the the beastly aspects of something that, you know, that scares the dickens out of you. It, it has the fangs. It has the powerful paws and the claws. It has the speed, but it also has the intelligence. See, that's what is really scary. If this was just a big overgrown wolf, that's something to be frightened about. But what really gets into our consciousness is that it acts like a man. You know, it's able to stand up. It's able to reason. That's whatever becomes the stuff of nightmares right there. Because if you lock your door, you're not going, a wolf is not going to get inside. But if you lock your door, it's still capable that a dog man will try to get inside. And we're going to talk about Maine again here real quick. Because, um, again, uh, of all the states uh, east of the Mississippi, uh, Maine is really the, the most um, sparsely populated. So this is a great place for these monster stories to develop. And this is one of the reasons why Stephen King has so many things set in Maine. It is a spooky place. It's a very wild place. and You don't see a lot of people. Uh, but I've spent a lot of time, uh, uh, thankfully, because it's one of my favorite places, uh, doing research in Maine. But there was a story up there about a family uh, that moved into a uh, into a little, I guess, a little cottage uh, out in the middle of the woods. And very quickly after they moved in, they were tormented by, for lack of a better term, these dogman creatures that inhabited the area. Now, as I said before, it's one thing whenever they live in the woods, you know, I mean, that's one thing. But these creatures now are coming up and knocking at the door or trying to turn the doorknob or calling out names. See, these are the things that gets really, really spooky. And that is one of the um, hallmarks with, it, with, with these dogmen creatures. 
is that they don't act completely animalistic. There is also that intelligent side to it as well. So I will tell you my story because somebody also put on there about the idea of a skinwalker. I'll tell you my story and then you folks can kind of tell me uh, what was going on. How much time do we have here, Dave? Oh, we got 18 minutes. 18 minutes. Okay. So the reason why I investigated this one particular area is because a gentleman would come into the shop. I had mentioned uh, Dolores Kincannon earlier on, the psychic that I used at my house. Well, she used to have a little uh, new age shop uh, very close to where I lived. And a lot of people would go in there just to talk. Um, so this one lady, this one, well, she was, she was a younger lady in her twenties. She and her daughter would come into the shop and sometimes she would buy some crystals or sometimes she would buy some incense, but she would come in there basically to chat. And she was telling uh, Dolores that she met a guy, you know, she met, uh, you know, a guy off of a dating site. Uh, he was coming in from California. He was taking the Greyhound in. Uh, they were smitten with each other, you know, over the internet. Now they had to meet each other. So several days later, uh, the, the young lady comes into the, into the uh, shop and she brings this guy with her. Okay. And um, he would come into the shop and he really wouldn't say much. He would stick to himself, um, you know, maybe in a low, maybe a goodbye, but, but no kind of conversations. Then it got to the point where he started to come into the shop all by himself. Um, then after a few days time, he started to build up, you know, conversations, uh, build up enough uh, kind of, uh, um, I, I guess, swagger to start, you know, talking to people uh, because he was from out of town and everything. But one of the first things he said to Dolores was, I have to tell you a secret. I am a werewolf. Now, immediately she thought that he had some sort of mental illness. Um, but he would keep on coming in and occasionally want to talk about this kind of lycanthropy that he was suffering from. So she did ask the questions, you know, what exactly what's going on? Why are you bringing this up? And he went into this story that he knew he was going to change. It was a chemical thing. It had nothing to do with the moon, but he felt as if he was going to change very, very soon. And not only that, but his father was also a werewolf. And whenever his father would go through the transformation, they would feel it coming on several days before it happened. And then his mother would take the father down to the basement, would shackle him up down there, and then they would leave for a day, you know, or for several days. Uh, then come back after the transformation was over and everything would be fine. So he was telling Dolores that he felt that this transformation was going to happen soon. And the reason why he was so worried about it and the reason why I was talking to people about it is he was afraid that he was going to hurt his girlfriend's young child. Now, from a psychological point of view, you have to ask, does this show that this person has some sort of proclivity to hurting children? Is this a projection of his self, of himself onto this daughter? And he simply does not want to admit that he's that kind of a person. Possibly. But he was telling uh, Dolores as the story went on that he had to find some place where he could go to transform. Now, there is an area around where I live right now. Um, called um, Livermore. It used to be a, 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 um, a railroad town. Uh, since that time, the Army Corps of Engineers had come in. Uh, they made it into flood control area. Now nobody lives within miles of, around, around the place. There's only one way in and one way out, and that's the same way. Very isolated area. Um, so he ends up there. Um, he disappears for a while. Um, the girlfriend comes into the shop and says, I think my boyfriend left. He's not around or anything like that. Anyways, about five days later, he comes in and he says that he did indeed transform. He went to this area called Livermore, which is outside of town, out in the middle of nowhere. And he transformed into this wolf creature. Now, not only did he transform into this wolf creature, but whenever he was down there, he actually ran into a female 
werewolf down there and they ran together, you know. So he's saying that there's other creatures down there as well, too. Um, as the story goes, he eventually did leave his girlfriend. He went back to California. So let that be kind of like a warning to people that are looking for boyfriends online. But anyways, this was a prime area for at least the knowledge or at least the urban legend that werewolves exist down there. So I went down there on an evening expedition uh, with one of my buddies, Ryan, and uh, we were down there probably about 10 o'clock at night. Um, and we were and searching for a werewolf, you know, we had our super eight camera, uh, nothing very technologically advanced whatsoever. Um, but we were walking down the path, which was in the middle of the woods. And then it eventually would open up and lead to an abandoned train trestle. So we went out probably halfway onto the train trestle. Um, and then all of a sudden these electrical sparks start forming around us. Um, they were above our head. Uh, they were around us. It looked as if you took a comforter off of your bed at night and you get that static electricity. That's what was going on. Um, we also noticed that our um, camera equipment was dying very quickly. It was as if there was some sort of power surge and everything was starting to drain. So in conjunction with this static electricity that was going on, and the power being drained from our our equipment, we thought it's a good time to get out of here. So we turned to go on the trail back to where we had parked. And in the middle of the trail, a light flares on. It looked almost as if it was a, a flare. Um, it uh, If you would take... Um, a sparkler on the 4th of July. And whenever you light it, you would get those kind of sparks. This is what was going on. And it, it, it um, ignited. Um, it, it stayed on for a bit. It flashed on for a bit. And then it faded off. So this entire time may have been two to three seconds. Very, very limited duration. Um, but Ryan and I, we had no other choice but to go back to where that light came from. Because as I said, there's no way, in, there's only one way in and one way out. So we start going back. And the point where that light had come on, something now was in the woods beside us off to our right. Um, we could hear it moving. We could hear it following us, keeping, keeping uh, a pace with us. Um, and every now and then, Again, kind of like the story that I told you about the Bigfoot uh, that, or whatever the creature was my brother and I um, had witnessed, um, you could hear it taking an air. You could hear it was that close to us that we could hear that this was some sort of physical animal. So we we start walking, trying to get out of there, and pretty soon we discover um, that we had left the trail. Uh, this sounds like a story from American Werewolf in London, uh, but we were now in the underbrush and it was imperative that we find the trail because we were in danger of not only getting lost, but getting tripped up. Um, so whenever we came to a stop to try to get our bearings off to our left, one time, and this is the only time this has ever happened to me on an investigation, something calls out my name. It says Ron. Simple as that. It sounded like a, a female voice, um, but just one time. Um, what was interesting about that, however, is the sound where the voice came from was the direction that led us back onto the path that we needed to be on. So we get back onto the path. We hear whatever that creature is off on our, our right, still following us. And then as we make the turn to go up the hill, it kind of sits back there um, I guess, watching us as we leave. But the interesting part about this was if my voice wasn't, if my name wasn't called by that voice, we would have continued straight into its path, into its, its intersection. So whatever happened, we were able to find the trail and get back home. Now, we, um, we had other investigators with us up at the cars. We go back and we go to separate rooms and we decided that we were going to uh, write our story 
uh, without telling each other anything that we had we had heard, anything that we had witnessed or whatever. Um, and our stories were remarkably alike. Now we did not see this creature, but we all both described it the way we saw it within our mind. Whether this was a projection, whether this was a self fulfilling prophecy or a fantasy, but whatever the case was, we saw it the same way. We knew that it had a snout. We could see the teeth. We could see these kind of yellow, orangish eyes. And we also knew that it was on four legs, but it was capable of going on two legs. So we both have these kind of things in our minds. Now, I will tell you, it is possible that we were looking for werewolves. So, of course, that image was already planted in there. Absolutely, that's possible. But, again, whatever it was, there was something physical following us, and something did call out my name. Now, this is the thing that I wanted to ask you, and I wanted to ask um, the listeners as well, too. Um, that probably happened, I would say, about, oh, maybe six years ago, five, six years ago, something like that. All of this time, I assumed that whatever had called my name was leading me to the path out of there. I assumed that it was some sort of protective spirit, some sort of guardian angel, but the more that I get into this kind of stuff, I'm finding out that especially in the Plains areas, uh, the Pacific Northwest, there's these creatures called the Skinwalker that will actually call your name. So I, I, I don't know what happened. Um, the cool thing about this is we did capture this on, on, on video. So we do have proof of this. We have proof of the light. We have the sound of the thing following us. Oddly, though, the voice did not appear on the tape. Uh, and because this was nighttime, you just see two grown men kind of like shaking, uh, saying expletives, and you could hear some crashing in the woods every now and then. But you could see the light that emanated. We did capture that, that kind of sparking on that, that I had talked about. So... What I'm trying to 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 figure out was that light that we saw evidence of what people call portals. You know, was that something that was allowing something to creep into our area? I have no idea. But all I know is after the strange light anomaly happened, something then began to follow us in the woods. Wow. And and after it followed us in the woods. We heard my voice being, my, my name being called by a voice that sounded like a female voice. See, and yet my buddy Mike was out hunting. Mm -hmm. And this is going back to late 2018 in hunting season. He was hunting for grouse and rabbits and he went into this gravel pit and he actually heard my voice calling for him, help me, wow. help me. Mike, I'm over here. But he said the voice wasn't coming from one direction it was it was unidirectional coming from all around him like it was emanating all around him and he got scared and, and this is a guy who rarely gets scared of anything and it it bothered him it yeah. bothered him for for quite a while and and you know i've also heard too because i went and asked a lot of our first nations people around here about if we have skinwalkers or windigos around here and they said, no, they'd never seen them. But the little people that are so much part of the first nation lore are the ones who will actually do that right. or the yeah. fairy folk in the forest who take sure. care of the forest. So that's where it got a little haywire, but uh, mm -hmm. I've been in that area numerous times. I've never heard anything, never felt anything or experienced anything at that spot but it's weird i mean yeah, it's, hearing it, your name from a from a, a non entity right you know i mean that's creepy man right that shows there's some sort of pre knowledge of who you are you know somehow it's able to know that what your name is and what is going to get you to kind of pay attention you know what i mean and, and that shows some sort of cognitive ability that I really don't want to admit is out there, but whatever it was, it either heard somebody calling my name and repeated it, or it was able to, to grasp that just from, you know, uh, my mind or whatever. I, I have no idea.
But whenever we talk about the Wendigo, absolutely, the Great Lakes area, you know, the Great Lakes nations and everything. But I will tell you, um, in um, Ohio, in um, uh, Kentucky, in Tennessee, um, the Adena culture, which is a uh, uh, a Native American uh, culture that came out of the, the uh, woodlands culture, um, and it was a very early culture. So you have the Adena people, the Hopewell people, and the Mississippian people. So we see this progression through these cultures. But the Adena culture, which was one of the very early uh, cultures, you know, definitely pre-Columbian, you know, going back maybe 2,000 years, um, they had uh, grave sites uh, in Ohio and in Kentucky and in Tennessee that um, there was obviously some sort of wolf cult uh, associated with it. Um, human bodies uh, were buried in skins of the animal. Um, and not only that, and this is what makes it so utterly interesting, is that after death, the human body actually had to be, sometimes the jaw had to be dislocated, sometimes it was cut off, and they would put a wolf jaw or wolf snout onto the human body. But they would they would make it to the point that they would actually have to deform the human body to get that snout to fit on there perfectly. So what they were doing is they were burying people, human beings, in the guise of half man and half wolf. Um, and if we look at this culture, not very far from where a lot of these kind of uh, burials took place, but there's the land between the lakes, which is in the Kentucky, Tennessee uh, border. And in that area is a long tradition of dogman stories. So whatever has been going on there has been going on there for at least a couple of thousand years. Yeah, that's just absolutely eerie. Right? <laughs> yes. You know, I got to ask you, as we got about 90 seconds to go here, do you really believe that there are werewolves? I know you heard you mentioned the story earlier, but werewolves are one of those things, man, where I have a tough time believing. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I do too. Um, again, I would love to think that a human being is capable of transforming into an animal. Um, and if you look at the medieval tradition, uh, whenever they talk about werewolves, uh, the transformation almost always came psychologically. Um, the representation, uh, overwhelming majority of, uh, of uh, representation of werewolves in medieval art is always of a person shown in disheveled clothing and messed up hair, and that shows there's some sort of um, uh, mental capacity problem. Uh, so usually it's something like that. Now, that's not to say that there's a creature out there that does indeed look like a dog man. Um, I think, that, again, we talk about connecting the dots. One of your listeners talk about Anubis. We see the idea of these dog men throughout the world. Um, we have uh, Anubis in, um, in Egyptian culture. You have uh, Lycaon, uh, the King Lycaon, where we get the word lichen from, in Greek culture. <coughs> and you see the idea of of the Cenocephalus, of the dog-headed people in places like India and Africa. And you know, like the, like the uh, illustration I just said about the, uh, the dogmen uh, in the Ohio River Valley here uh, in, um, in the United States. So across the world, there's these ideas that there are these kind of uh, wolf-man type of creatures. But I think that we shouldn't be looking at something that's trans transforming. I think we should look Guru, at... I gotta I got to cut you off yeah. right there, buddy. We're going to continue. We got the guru for another half an hour. Then the fedora wearing John Hudson joins us for the unbiased UFO report, Shirky Poo's news, and the thought of the day, all coming up in hour three. All right, buddy, we're clear. All right, all right. Fun stuff, Dave. Fun stuff. This is good times. Very good times, Guru. That's right. Jenny Metz has got to call it a night. She can't put another 29 minutes and 30 seconds in with us. Uh, well, you know, it's gorgeous Jenny Metz, man. You never know what's happening. You never know. Uh huh. The stunning L. Pepper has arrived. And... Uh, 
Let's see here. Big J, 21. Good to see you, buddy. We're doing good tonight. 184 on YouTube, Ben. Wow, yeah. that's pretty good. Yeah. That's fun times. Guru, you, you know how to bring the people with you. <laughs> Jenny Wiper, absolutely. You know, one of the first stories um, I ever investigated about werewolves uh, involved, uh, it's the one up above that there, Dave. It's uh, Jenny Wiper. She said, yeah, uh, what happened in a mental hospital where one of the patients uh, believed that he transformed into a werewolf and the people that were taking care of him said that he actually believed that he was a werewolf. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, let's see here. She says, sorry, guru. My internet keeps going down. Oh, Jenny, Jenny. All uh, right. We'll let you slide this time. Uh, sweet morbidly bear or sweetly morbid bear wants to know how you got the nickname, the guru. Mr. Dave Scott gave it to me. Yes, I did. Uh -oh. Yeah, we. I think it was about the immediately when Ron and I hooked up for our first show, we became insta friends. That's right. And and I, I almost immediately brought you on uh, as a regular. It, it was. It was. And I had and, one book out, Dave. I had one yeah. book out. Yeah. Yeah, and and so. Um, the popularity of Ron really took off with our listeners. And I just, I mean, and I just made a comment that he's, he's like a guru, just the way he speaks and the eloquency and everything like that. And, and uh, it was cool. And, and so by the end of the show, I was calling him the crypto guru. We kind of laughed about it on the air and I said, that's it. I mean, that's what I'm calling you. Yeah. You know? I, I love it. You know, and this is a true story. Whenever I did um, the uh, Travel Channel show, uh, True Terror, um, they wanted to put under my my name, Crypto Guru, but the Travel Channel wouldn't allow them to do it. Mm. Yeah, that would have been awesome. Overbuilt has a question. If lost in a winter storm in the woods and a nice Sasquatch girl saved your life, Guru, she then took you to her cave and needed sweet Sasquatch cuddle loving, would you submit to her feminine wilds? You know what? It, how cold is it out? If it's cold out, I'm going to say, yeah. You know, I'll tell you what, Dave. We only live once. We might as well live, you know, gas, no brakes. You know what I'm talking about. You, and, uh, yeah, if, if, you go. Yeah. If, if it comes to it, it comes to it. I'm man enough to man up. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, guru. <laughs> I would too. Yeah, you ought to. You got, you know, because no one. <laughs> it's bragging rights at it's that point. Exactly. Exactly. It's bragging yeah. rights at that point. That's right. And there have been cases where people believe that they were abducted solely for the purpose of pre procreation with these creatures. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's uh, said to happen a lot up here in British Columbia. Yeah. Especially with uh, First Nations people. That's right. Yeah. Oh, man. Abe, that's a good point. Did you know at one time Sasquatch porn was actually like a huge seller? It was uh, Sasquatch romantic uh, novels. You know, they're about 100 pages long. That is a true story. Mm-hmm. Jeremy, the way Dave says guru reminds him of the way <laughs> Elaine called the guy maestro on Seinfeld. <laughs> All right, guru, hold on a couple of seconds here. Big Whoa. thank you to Mennonite Abe, Spooky, Smithy, Brian, Carla, Reverend Keith, amen to you, uh, Swampy, and Nicola for the amazing super chats. And, uh, and really appreciate you. Um, helping us out. It's a great way to support this show on a nightly basis. So thank you so much. We got about a minute to go here and on Twitch watching is pac woman. Nice to see you tonight. Hope you're having a great night on Twitch. And, uh, I don't understand Twitch. I know we broadcast live there. I don't understand it at all. I know there's a big audience there. We got to, 
one of our goals here in the next month or so is to try and figure out how to work that a little bit better for us, but uh, we'll see how it goes. But uh, oh, Twitch is, is cool. Very cool. I just don't know how to use it. All right, Guru, we got 30 seconds. Awesome. Big thank you to all the veterans out there who are tuning us in. We love you. You always have a safe home in our chat room. A big thank you to all the regulars who are here tonight who are hanging on out and being with us. We really do appreciate the fun. And if you're new, don't forget to hit that subscribe button, ring the bell. We are here seven days a week. I'm here Monday through Friday, Lynn Wallington Saturday and Sunday. Get your horns up. It's time to rock with Bumblefoot. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Here we go with the third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Big thank you to everyone tuning us in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Just go to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Renita Phobia. Renitophobia is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as a clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Check out our swag, rock out to Bumblefoot, and read up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. On Twitter, you can follow us at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. For the final time tonight, we say hello to the crypto guru, Ronald L. Murphy Jr. You can find all of his amazing books by going to Amazon, his Twitter handle, at CryptoGuruRon, and we're going to continue on with spooky stories tonight. Guru, welcome back. Hey, again, as I said, after the first half hour, which seemed about 20 minutes ago, uh, we're now down to our final, like, 14 minutes. I cannot believe how quickly this goes. I know, man. It's way too fast, and our audience loves you, <laughs> and we're going to continue on. There's always a big connection, Halloween, with the Fae and witches mm -hmm. and ghouls and goblins, where are there really goblins and, and trolls living under bridges? Are, are there really fairies taking people that uh, maybe into the fairy realm and we never see them again? Do you have any stories on that? I, I do, you know, and, and it's odd because for somebody that tries to be as skeptical as humanly possible, one of the things that I really cannot quantify, yet I do believe, is the idea of uh, fairies. Um, it's something that I've been fascinated with for a number of years. And again, we connect the dots. All cultures around the world have an idea of, of what a fairy is. And um, it impacts us to this day. You know, they're, they're definitely archetypical characters. Um, I, you know, you, you start reading uh, some of the accounts. And there was a very well-documented account. Um, it, it was in the Renaissance of uh of robert kirk uh who lived in stirlingshire scotland um and he was a reverend and he believed that he had encountered one evening um fairies uh he was walking down a trail and in the woods he saw a mound and that mound not then had a light that emanated from it so, so it appeared to be like a door. And he goes up to the, to the mound. He peers inside and he sees two different races in there. One is a very tall and human looking person. Um, and the other ones are rather short. If this was nowadays, we would say he encountered a UFO. We would say he encountered what you know we would call um, uh, the Nordics and the Greys. That's what would happen. But whenever he was writing this, he saw these as elemental spirits, as, as intelligences within the earth themselves. 
as the story goes and as he relates, um, he claims that he's had he had interactions with the fairy world for a number of years. Um, that he he said that only atheists cannot see fairies, so everybody has the capabilities of seeing fairies. And he so longed to be part of that world that one night he went out for a walk and never returned. Now, if you would read some of the uh, the uh, information uh, from that time, yes, indeed, some people say that he disappeared off the face of the earth. Um, there were some reports that they found him dead the next morning, laying on top of the fairy mound as if he had a heart attack or something. But whatever the case may be, he's so associated with this fairy mound that people believe that he was taken to the other realm. That is really one of the earliest documented cases by somebody that was writing an autobiography about their dealings with the fairy world. Um, we can go back even farther um, to the, uh, oh, I, I don't even know what uh, year it was, um, but hold on one second, because this story does have something good. I, and, and I hate to have to uh, ever Google anything here, but let's see here. Um, hey, give me one second, children. It's uh, the children of Woolpit, the green children of Woolpit. I just got to get a, uh, a date on this for you. Um, it was in the 12th century, so I'm glad I got a date for you because that's going pretty far back. So the green children of Woolpit, um, at the edge of the of the edge of the uh, of the village, um, out of the woods comes two children who are green, and they cannot speak the language. They speak some other dialect. They don't understand. They were taken in um, for uh, uh, over a period of time. They would eat only um, uh, green vegetables, uh, like beans and things like that. Um, the, uh, the 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 two children, one was a boy, one was a girl. Uh, the uh, they both grew up. Uh, they started to learn some English words. Um, the uh, they they were baptized. The little boy died shortly after his baptism. Uh, the, the, the girl lived into a, to be an adult. Uh, they said she was rather wanton sexually, which is a great trope whenever it comes to the fairy world. Um, but whenever she got old enough to talk about her story, uh, she said that they came up from a place called St. Martin's Land, which was under the earth. And um, the sun never shone there, although there was some sort of light there, but she wasn't quite clear about that what, what it was. And her and her brother were simply walking around uh, in that in that place, and she heard the bells of the church ringing, and they decided that they would go investigate it. I think that's a great story. Um, there's really no kind of religious elements attached to it besides the baptism to make it seem as if it's some sort of parable. But that's really as far back as we can go to have these really cool documented stories of interactions with what people assume to be fairies. Really? Yeah. We got 15 minutes left. Okay. And I'm going to cut it on the fairy talk here for a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll, I, I would love a quick story because Wit came in late into our chat room and he's asking if you have any other Bigfoot stories. He really wants a Bigfoot story. Another Bigfoot story. Okay. Let me think if I can get... Um, not quite as scary. Um, this this happened to me. Uh, this was whenever um, I was taking my children for a walk uh, up on the Chestnut Ridge. Um, so my daughter, who is 15 now, uh, was in a stroller. So we're probably going back about, you know, 14 years probably. Um, and uh, we were going to go for a uh, an afternoon walk. And as we were driving up into the hills, uh, we got one of those afternoon um, thunderstorms. Uh, so when we got out of the car, uh, remember this is probably in July, um, we got out of the car, there was so much humidity built up that it was foggy. So we still decided to take a walk. The weather had broken, the sun was out, um, and we were walking that, or we were pushing the stroller down the trail, uh, and there was fog all around us. So you could barely even see the trees. Um, but, um, something told me, um, to get out now, I, something instinctually, I should say, um, I said to my wife at the time, I said, 
I don't think that we should be here. And she said, I got the same feeling. Now, this is an area that we always go to. I mean, this is a familiar area to us. So we decide that we were going to turn around. And this is about a mile. We probably already went about a mile by this time. So we decided that we were going to turn around. Um, my oldest son, Donovan, who's now 20, um, he was um, picking up rocks and just absentmindedly throwing them into the woods. He expected to go on a hike. He was now bored because we had to go back home. So he was just throwing rocks, making noise. Um, both my wife and I were whispering to each other that we felt as if something was following us, something didn't want us there. And I think it's only an emotion or only a feeling that you can get as if you were a parent. It was that kind of protective mode that you would go into. So as we were going, my son kept on throwing the rocks, and I just turned to him and I said, look, Donovan, it's like this. Um, no more rocks being thrown, buddy. And if you throw any more rocks, you're not going to get to watch any TV tomorrow. So we keep on going, and gosh darn it, another rock. And I turned around, and I said, Donovan, <coughs> I told you to stop throwing rocks. And he bent down and picked up a rock, and he said, something threw this at me. Oh, see, wow. so these are some strange stories. Again, I didn't see anything, but uh, now I did investigate <coughs> another case about a gentleman um, that um, had a heart condition. Um, he lived in a trailer uh, in the woods uh, that was very close to the Chestnut Ridge. And one evening he had to get up and go to the bathroom. So he went into the, into the, uh, the bathroom and he didn't turn on the light or anything like that. Apparently he had good aim. Some people don't, by the way, turn on the light whenever they go to the bathroom. I do turn on the light, but some people don't. But this is one of those guys that didn't turn on a light. So as he was uh, taking, uh, uh, as he was urinating, um, he looked out the window above the uh, the toilet, and there was a face looking in at him. Uh, uh, he described the red glowing eyes. Uh, it had like fangs that protruded below the uh, the lower uh, lip. And uh, he promptly had a heart attack. And that was one of the only cases that I ever um, I ever uh, investigated with a person that ended up in the hospital over an encounter with Bigfoot. Could you imagine what that would be like? I couldn't. I couldn't. Um, you have to understand, too, whenever I thought about this story many times, he's already groggy. You know what I mean? Like, you are very susceptible whenever you climb out of bed. And you're even more susceptible whenever you're going to the bathroom. So he's just sitting there doing his own business, and he looks out the window, and something is watching him. Oh, oh. Yeah. are you there? Can I you am, Guru. We still oh. got you. Yeah, I wonder what happened there a second. Let me see here. We lost your camera, but that's okay. All there right, you. there we go. There you are. All right. And, you know, let's get to some audience questions here, because I, I don't even want to go to bed thinking about – Bigfoot staring in my bathroom window while I'm absolutely trying to not. Have, Nobody wants to think about you know, that. Exactly. Mr. Lurks a lot is asking, has the guru heard of the blue children of Kentucky? Great show as usual, guru. I have not. I need to be filled in on this. Who what was the blue children of Kentucky all about? I don't know. I don't know either. I, I, I want to Google this. Yeah. Blue, blue children. Oh, you know what? No, no, no. I think we well, can keep on Googling this. If I'm not mistaken, I do think that there is um, not a legend, but there are people down in certain parts of the Appalachia that have this blue tint to them. And I think it's something genetic. I do know that for a fact. It's uh, methemoglobinemia. Yeah. There you go. Yes. Now that you had uh, brought up about the yes, I have heard about that. And it is something that has to do with, like you said, genetics. Possible. So that's a good thing. Whenever we talk about the green children of Woolpit. But the curious thing about that is those children spoke another language. You know, that's the strange part about that. So these children, for whatever they were, were so isolated. They did not speak uh, the, the, the king's English, as it were. Yes, I can see that. That's just, wow. And if you go to Woolpit to this very day, on their street sign is the two green children. No kidding. Yep. No kidding. One of the comments in the chat room is 
about the gnome that I have right behind me in the video. You got any gnome stories? I wish that I did. I do not have any gnome stories. Uh, here in Western Pennsylvania, we do, uh, it's, it's pretty big. It used to be a huge mining uh, area. So we do have the idea of the things called the knockers or the Tommy knockers. And these are supposedly gnomes that would uh, work, you know, beside miners. And sometimes they would knock and they would let the miners know that there was a cave-in that was imminent. Um, so they usually work, you know, as um, beneficial uh, figures uh, to the miners. Really? Yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. You know, how many of these creatures actually look out for people? Okay. So, <laughs> I would say it was probably about 15 years ago in um, uh, outside of Pittsburgh. These um, This little child uh, went missing. Um, and he had um, Down syndrome. And he was gone for several days. Uh, he was finally found, and um, he told the rescuers that the red man took care of him. So, you know, whether that's the color of the skin or the color of the fur, what have you. Now, uh, there was also the tell about three or four years ago about the little girl that went missing, and I forget what state it was in. Uh, but she was gone for several days, and she said that a bear took care of her. That was that was a little yeah. boy in North Carolina. It was a little boy in North Carolina. Yeah, so you do hear these stories of miracles happening, and I do believe in miracles. Um, it is very possible that an animal can come and be somebody's angel, absolutely. But from a child's point of view, are they calling, you know, a Bigfoot a bear because it looks similar? You know, they might not have that as part of their vernacular in order to call it what, what they see it as. But I think that there's a lot of hints out there that these creatures or something is looking out after people whenever they're in the woods. Um, however, on the flip side of that, there's also a lot of evidence that there's something preying upon people that get lost in the woods as well. I just cannot imagine that. Cannot imagine what yeah. that would be like to become Bigfoot food or, or, right. some, or something along those lines. That's just eerie, eerie yeah. at times to even think of, you know, and you think of all these missing people that have gone and just vanished, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, we were talking about it with Steve Stockton the other night where we were talking about whether or not it is these creatures taking people or, or people walking through portals and ending up right. in different right. areas. So have you ever had Pilates on your show? Long time ago. Yeah. I've, I've only worked with him in a conference, I think one time as well too. So I don't really, you know, know him very well, but he does raise a few interesting things. Um, a lot of the reports are that like a person went missing in one area and then their belongings was found like 50 to 100 miles away, you know, as if there was a, a um, some sort of wormhole or something, you know, that they were able to go over vast different distances in a very short period of time. Or they would find somebody's coffee that was still hot. And the peop the person was been missing for a week, you know that kind of stuff. As if the time pad the time frame was not fitting up, as if it did not match what was going on in our world. And um, I like the idea of people stepping into another realm, uh, uh, you know, if you would. Uh, so the ideas of portals or what are opening up and taking people away. Um, actually, I hope that that's what's happening, rather than they're being feasted upon by wild animals or some sort of creature. Yeah, no kidding. No, no kidding. The, the interesting part about the whole portal theory to me is where do they go? I often yeah. wonder, I often wonder if these people who maybe do enter portals mm -hmm. even know if they are gone. Mm -hmm. You know, like did they just walk into another timeline and everything else is exactly the way it is? That's that's a very that's a very good point. I mean, do they walk into another timeline where? But, but then, then, see, so if 
we're talking about like a parallel universe. Like, well, let, is, let, let me tell you this story, if you don't mind. Sure, oh, yeah. David Politis, as we got about four minutes left, David Politis tells his story from Missing 411 Canada, his book that came out a couple of years ago. And I believe it was in Ontario. These three young girls, two sisters and one friend were horseback riding on the family farm. And there was a trail. They came to a fork in, in the trails and the longer trail went this way. The shortcut went this way. The one sister says to the other, let's go take the shortcut. The sister says, no, we're going to take this way. Uh, that's the way we came. That way we get a little bit more horseback riding. Well, the one girl says, well, me and my horse are going to take the shortcut. We'll see who gets there faster. Well, the two girls took the old route. This one girl takes the shortcut and her and her horse have never been seen again. Exactly. So, so that's what makes me wonder if they walked into a portal because look, kidnapping you know, and, and look, there's a lot of freaks out there. Let's let's not let's not uh, you know dumb down the subject. But kidnapping is you're going to take the kid. You're not going to take the horse. No. And the horse vanished. No footprints. No nothing. Just gone. Right. And it just really makes me believe that there's these these portals. And I and I and I believe you know. And that other timeline, this girl and the horse are back at the barn and meet up with the sister and friend. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, people talk about the Mandela effect as well, too. It does seem as if there are different realities that do collide and mesh and, you know, pull apart from one another. Um, and, and it does seem as if something else is going on, as if there is a bleed through. So whenever I think, so we're going to go right back to the very beginning. We talk about that veil between this world and the next is at its thinnest. For lack of better terminology, in the ancient world, that may describe what you and I have just been talking about. Whenever the veil between two worlds is at the thinnest, when things can cross between each ones. And maybe that does happen certain times of the year. And maybe Halloween is one of those times whenever it happens uh, the most predominantly. Never know. Guru, we got 90 seconds left, my friend. Yes. A show that is flown on by, I'm telling you, I'm telling as you. they always do. Our, your next date will be in December. Yes. With and us. We'll, and I yeah. believe that's the 10th. And we'll be talking about uh, the ghost traditions of Halloween. How does that sound? Or of oh, Christmas. Ghost traditions of Christmas. That is beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, that is December 10th, the next time you'll appear on the show. Guru, one minute. Tell everybody where they can find your books. All right. Go to Amazon.com, uh, or you can reach me, you know, Ronald L. Murphy Jr. Uh, at uh, Yahoo.com is my personal email address in case you want me to sign something and send it out to you. But definitely Amazon. And anybody that's in Western Pennsylvania, uh, not this Friday, but next Friday, so that will be the 22nd, come out to see me at Hillview Manor. I will be doing a talk on um, on um, uh, the history of Halloween. And then I'm going to be uh, filming for the Spirit Realm Network there as well, too. So you can come on out and get two for the price of one. Spend an evening with Ron Murphy. So, yeah, get my books on Amazon and see me at Hillview Manor December or uh, October 22nd. Guru, it's always a great time when we have Guru time on Spaced Out Radio, buddy. We I really appreciate you, my friend. Dave, I love you and I love your uh, audience. Thanks a lot for having me. Always a pleasure. The crypto guru, Ronald Murphy, everyone. Remember, you can also follow him on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, at Spaced Out Radio, at Crypto Guru Ron. Coming up next, the fedora wearing John Hudson is going to join us for the unbiased UFO report, Shirky Poo's news, and the thought of the day. Stay tuned. Spaced Out Radio continues right after this. Oh, look at that puppy. Oh, say hi, puppy. Say hi, Maui. Say hi, Maui. Say hi, buddy. Maui. Maui. You good boy. Okay. You can go back inside now. You can hang out. What are you going to do? You got to make a choice. Make a decision. All right. There you go. How you doing, buddy? Good. How you doing? Oh, doing great. <laughs> hey, Obi, Obi Flett. Thank you. 
First time live for me. I meandered over from Spotify. Obi, thank you so much, man. Really appreciate that. Welcome to the chat room. Glad you're here. How's your mic, John? Oh, good. Just making sure it doesn't fall over on me. That's all. Yeah, no kidding. But you know, you know, you know, you know, it's actually run up by uh, GoPro clips. Uh, really? uh, basically, a whole a whole string of those adjustable like things you use right. for adjusting a GoPro. That's how my camera's connected. I mean, my my mic's actually standing up. Very cool. Very cool. <sighs> oh, bugger! Hey, you know, hold on, I'll be right back. Yeah, we got. Re- okay. What do we got here? Oh, uh, there we go. I love, uh, what a great show going straight from the guru to John Hudson. That's a great transition. Yeah, that guy's fun. He's got a real nice polish to him. Oh, the guru is amazing. The guru is absolutely amazing. Well, I need to get a chair with wheels. <laughs> Hello, Curtis Jeanette. What's happening? Is that where the Ch- is that where Chad Smith has disappeared to? Because he hasn't been here for a few days. Good for him. Yeah, camping's fun if you have a trailer. How long is this part of the show? 15 minutes? Maybe 17? And then John rejoins me for the after show? It's one of the, the, the things a lot of people don't realize about growing up in the Bay Area is that, you know, we have the beautiful Redwood Forest just... 45 minutes away up in the Santa Cruz mountains. We got Tahoe three and a half hours away. You got Napa four hours away. You got Carmel two hours away. I mean, it's amazing what you can hit up if you're willing to drive a little bit on the weekend, man. I would love to see the redwood forest. Oh man. You, like I've, I've been through that tree. I mean, it's a sad thing that they did, but they did to it, but there's this tree where they basically cut out the whole center of the redwood tree and you drive right through it. With your car. It's crazy. That is insane. Absolutely insane. On Vancouver Island, they have a they have a an area that they call Cathedral Grove. Yeah, I've been, yeah. Yeah, and um, I used to drive that all the time when I coached hockey in Port Alberni. Oh, and, nice. And I'll tell you, when it was windy going through there, it was scary because they have signs, do not stop if, if it's if it's windy oh oh right 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 one of those trees comes down and you stop and it lands on it you're dead but i mean the trees there i mean the one tree was like 35 38 feet around wow massive well and the thing that's so sad is it is it you know you, you go back 100 years and the trees that they were cutting down in california Same they here. were they were so, I mean, they were just, they're like, they're almost like wives' tails. They were so big. I mean, just incredible, oh, yeah. incredible size yeah, it trees. it was like right out of fairy tales. Yeah. I mean, just, it, it was like, like, oh yeah, like a bunch of giants grew them. I mean, just, it's crazy. Oh, yeah. yeah. The problem with the trees though, and I, I've got a, my neighbor who works in forestry, the problem with old trees like that is they are very susceptible to forest fire. And, well, and that, that is a, a big problem. I got to get you to hold yep, on one second. Yep, no problem. Uh, thank you everyone for the super chats, Abe, Spooky, Smithy, Brian, Carla, Reverend Keith, Swampy, and Nicola. It's a great way to support this show on a nightly basis. Thank you to all the veterans who are tuning us in and all of our first timers who are in our chat room really appreciate you coming on in if you're new don't forget to hit that subscribe button and ring that bell we'd really appreciate it and of course 
uh, all the regulars out there. We really do appreciate you being here. Don't forget, after the show, we will have the uh, the after show with uh, John and I. Here we go, everyone. We rounded third. We're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Want to remind you that if you miss most of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. It is that time once again where we bring in the fedora wearing John Hudson for the UFO report. Yes, John has all the latest news on everything that is happening in the literal wild, wild west of the UFO world. And John, we really do appreciate you coming back in. Thank you, buddy. Happy to be here. Thank you, everyone, for sticking around. We do appreciate it. Absolutely. Your fedora is looking fantastic, as per usual. Thank you, sir. All right. We're going to kick things off. Robert Salas apparently got some money. Tell us who he Robert it. Salas is. Yeah, so Robert Salas is a is a retired um retired Air Force, and uh, and he's the person who um was uh you know I, I don't remember exactly um you know uh if, if he should be credited as the as the key person that was involved or if one of the key people, but he's basically he's he's very much responsible for bringing all of us all these wonderful stories or scary stories depending on how you look at it of nuclear operators. Um, being in silos that were shut down uh, throughout the you know last um, you know 10 20 30 40 years in the US military so um, so he's he's basically kind of a um, a pied piper to the to the whistleblowers in a way yeah and, uh, didn't he work on one of those missile silos in North Dakota when this happened and, absolutely and, and I believe it happened right around the same time when Grant Cameron had his Charlie Red Star sighting um I, that was close to the the north dakota border in manitoba could be i i, th I thought robert salas's experience was in 67 i didn't think Maybe. grants was that Maybe. early but but no, uh in the 70s yeah okay but yeah no but I mean, it's definitely around the same time frame and and the the thing is is it to be honest with you i I haven't studied this topic enough. This is, you know, this is another one of those rabbit holes that that you eventually have to jump into. That you know is is a pretty deep dive, and um, and so I don't know. My, my assumption has always been that there are pockets of activity that have happened over time. That it's not, it hasn't been this consistent thing the whole time. But to be honest with you, I I, I don't know. I I just know that that to me. This is one of the most baffling aspects of this entire phenomenon because, you know, everything else you can argue about it. This is a national security issue, right? Of all things, this is something that, that people actually justifiably should be just a wee bit concerned about. And everyone's like, it's crazy. I don't get it. I agree. So what's he got some cash for? So basically, um, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, um, he was crowdfunding for a another um, another press event um, like the one that was done a while ago, where he basically uh, brings in he he invites as many um, uh, former and sitting congressmen, uh, Congress people, and and senators as he can, and he gets uh, as many um, you know um, very honorable uh, service people as he can. Um, you know, usually retired, but but occasionally not to come in and tell their stories. And it's usually incredibly powerful testimony. Um, some of it's actually a little hard to listen to at times because it's very confusing. 
And, um, but, uh, essentially, you know, instead of, you know, basically bringing that old tape, um, you know, of, of those proceedings, you know, into the future and expecting people to, to be impacted by it, he wants to hold an entirely new event, uh, that will hopefully really make an impression and really stick out in people's minds. Because in many ways, this should be one of the more important stories that everyone's talking about and nobody's talking about it. Very interesting. Do we know when the event is going to happen? It'll be October 19th. So that quick? Yeah, it, it, it'll be October 19th. It's, 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 it's only in, uh, in four days. So it's, it's, it's very shortly. All right. Well, we will have to uh, mind uh, or pay attention to what's going on there because that is going to be very, very important and good for him. Now, who is David Falch and why is he important to what's going on right now? Okay, so so this this is a really important this this is a, I wish more people were talking about this. This is a really important lesson for all of us. So first off, uh, Dave Falch. So he, very very nice gentleman. He is a uh, a military fil a flir, uh camera technician repair person. Okay, so basically when those pods you know need to be fixed. He is the guy that takes them apart or I, I don't know if he still does it. I believe he still does, but he's the one that essentially repairs FLIR equipment. So he's incredibly knowledgeable about, about this FLIR gear. And so essentially he's been one of the key people for the last several months that has been debating back and forth with people like Mick West, trying to show how these videos that have been coming out um, don't necessarily mean what someone like Mick says they mean. And um, just uh, just like a week ago, which I, I sadly I believe is the video that that, that triggered the issue. Um, I, I talked about a video that he'd put out that I linked and and I hope you all watched it because it's gone now and you're never going to see it again. Um, this beautiful video he put out where he basically not only explained why the, the duck video was something important, but he showed what. A mylar balloon looks like under IR. What a normal balloon looks like under IR. What this he showed a bunch of examples of what different things look like in IR, and it was an incredibly valuable for me anyway. It was a very valuable lesson, and I really enjoyed it. It was a fantastic video. I'm really sorry I didn't save it because um, evidently, and needless to say, he he has he he must maintain some I, I don't know what level, but he has to maintain some sort of a clearance for the job he has. And um, somebody reached out to him and notified him that um, he needed to reformat his social media presence. And so without any warning whatsoever, he deleted every video he's ever made um, on the equipment. He um, completely just wiped out everything. And he's still on Twitter. He still has a has a YouTube page. He's still going to be putting out videos about the other things he used to put videos about. But basically every single thing that he's done to help us is gone. And there was a huge debate scheduled between him and um, uh, Mick West and, and some other people that was scheduled for just a couple of days from now. And he won't be attending that. It sounds like somebody at his job got to him. Well, basically, this last video that he did, the reason why I loved it so much is because it gave a lot of information. It was a great video, right? I mean, it, it, it was beautiful. It, it showed you, it, you know, he said, okay, this is what this is. Boom. This is what this is. Boom. I mean, I learned more about the way those cameras work in that video than I had in any of his other videos. It was, it was like, it was like something you'd get out of, out of product training from the company. And um, my guess is, is that, you know, he was already, he'd already been kind of playing on a line this whole time, you know, um, and, uh, and uh, my guess, and I, I, this is just my guess is that this last video, even though it was very tame, it was very polite and it was very mellow and it wasn't about, it wasn't about weapons. I think it was just so informative that, you know, he was basically told, okay, you know, now you've, you've gotten to a point where, you know, um, foreign powers can be using this to defeat our technology. And so, um, uh, and, and, you know, and in some cases what happens is they get evidence that someone is actually slurping down that information that happened to another person in the community that I, I won't name is that they found out that people were actually watching his content for the purpose of intelligence gathering. And so the instant they find out that's going on, they're, they're going to, they're going to tap you on the shoulder and say, okay, you know, it's time to step back a bit. But the reason why well, the reason that's important is because it means that, you know, all these, there's a lot of people in this community that currently have 
jobs that require some level of clearance and they're always walking a line to help us out and we must appreciate them and if you like their content save a local copy <laughs> because yeah, you no never kidding. know when they might disappear a lot of these people are here for a good time not a long time but you know that's not the first time i have heard of something like this happening on both fronts number one i was told by somebody very high up and close to uh, luis elizondo who stated that ufo twitter literally everybody in the ufo game in washington dc and all the alphabet agencies have Twitter accounts just so they could follow UFO Twitter oh, just sure. to what everybody oh, sure. is talking about. I mean, it is filled with spooks now. And, and the thing is, that a lot of those people, it isn't for nefarious reasons in all cases. It's If they're actually working on this topic, it's a good place to gather information that, that they're going to learn from. But at the same time, if they see someone they know has a clearance, talk about something they shouldn't, they're going to flag it. Absolutely. Michael Schratt the aviation historian, who's a good friend of this show, great guy, probably the best aviation researcher in North America, or at least one of the best. Uh, he was actually shut down for a while from doing interviews by his company as well, because he works for an aviation company and they felt he was, uh, they didn't want one of their employees being yep. popular for being in this UFO subject. And he had to pull the plug for a while. And, you know, it, it's tough, it's hard, you know, but when you work for a company whose main client is the United States military, they pay attention. They really Ooh, do. Oh, yes. All right. Yes, they do. Let's move on to. Oh, and so one, just thank you, Dave Fouch, for all you did. We appreciate it. We understand what you did. It's all good. You're still welcome in this community. We appreciate what you did. No harm, no foul. All right. First, we had Tom DeLong. Then we had. Robbie Williams, but he didn't really make a UFO sting. Now we have Demi Lovato, but guess what, people? There's another pop star coming to the UFO world in 2022 on Discovery+. Plus. So if you're a fan of Kesha, she is someone who is going to be having a brand new UFO show on television on discovery plus john i mean this just came down yesterday i saw the post today i guess here we go with the celebrities getting into the ufo game yes but th this one this one has the op this one has a small possibility of being a little bit different because see um uh a, a lot of you might know uh uh, 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 uh steve green street and uh, or stephen green street and uh, you know the guy who does the basement office and and uh, and so forth and and you know he he's a good member of the community well it turns out that um he was on a, a show with ufo jane the other day who 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 you've had on your show dave and uh and it turns out that the, that they started talking about about keisha and um and it turns out that um uh he, he Stephen's very good friends with her brother. And when she first started getting popular, they just decided that they were going to document her rise to power, her rise to fame. And so for two years, Stephen Greenstreet and his buddy followed her around the world with a camera crew and documented her. And so Stephen Greenstreet was like, like the cinematography guy, right? Well, they were traveling through Ohio and they got to talking about UFOs. And it turns out that Keisha was a big UFO fan. And it dawned on her that they were right by Wright Patterson. So she stops the bus and says, I don't care if we're going to be late. We're going. So they immediately call up a local MUFON rep to get them to meet them out there. They call the rep for the Air Force to arrange a, a tour. So the whole tour bus gets there. You know, they all get out. You know, Stephen Greenstreet's following. And he told this whole story on UFO Jane's channel. And he's following around the camera. And finally, at some point during the day, she got frustrated. And she's like, you know, you guys aren't showing me anything. I want to, you know, where are, the, where are the aliens? I want to see the bodies, right? And there was these hangers over to the right that were in restricted area. She took off running. She just exit stage right and started booking it toward, like, took off away from everyone. Like, you know, runs across into this restricted area, right? runs up to the hangar doors of this of this air and starts banging on the doors show me those aliens i know you have those aliens right and so steven's like chasing her with a camera like you know thinking oh great you know we're all gonna get shot you know 
and uh, and uh, and he tells the story better than I did. Please watch watch UFO Jane show. And uh, and some short time later, some uh, nice people in in black vehicles with black outfits showed up with firearms. And um, and Keisha very wisely noticed and said, "Well, you know, it's probably a good time for us to exit." You know, and they they left peacefully. But um, that girl's got some fire in her. And um, I think this might be a different kind of UFO show. We'll have to see. But I, I have to say, based on the story I just heard, I'm a little bit curious. I, I'm a little curious, too. I mean, you know what? Let, let's try it out. Let's try it out. It'll you be know, interesting. I, I mean, look, as this gets more popular, we may not agree with a lot of the famous people who are delving into this interest. And all of a sudden, because of their pull, uh, television makes them insta UFO researchers right. with credibility. And I don't think that's good for our field, but I will say this when people like Demi Lovato and now Kesha are out there really promoting the UFO game to their millions of followers on social media, that is good for the UFO field. We not, may not agree with the message. We may not agree with the person. We may not agree that when Demi comes out and says aliens shouldn't be called aliens because that makes them feel bad. Okay. It doesn't matter the reaction. Yes. Some of it is cringeworthy, but we still have to remember out of those Social media followers, these famous influencers, and that's exactly what they are, have a lot of pull with their people. I look at my son. My son is eight years old, John. And when he goes on YouTube, he asks me point blank when we were driving to his guitar lesson the other night. He's like, Dad, is Metallica the biggest, heavy, best heavy metal band in the world? I said, well, they're one of the best, you know, and... He goes, how many YouTube followers do they have? And I said, well, son, I really don't know. And he said, well, what about Guns N' Roses? How many YouTube followers do they have? Because my son's all about That's YouTube. the only measure, right? So That's the only measure, right? <laughs> but this is the way the younger yeah. generation is thinking. Absolutely. They're not thinking about, you know, it's another, you know, B-rated, C-rated. I mean, Kesha hasn't done anything in the music scene in a long time. So it doesn't surprise me looking at the bigger picture that this is a good way to get her name back out there. But you know, the younger crowd, they don't care. It's all about and, the influence of social. And actually, media. I think she just came out with a new album. I, I haven't checked this myself, but that's what UFO Jane said. So I, I think she did just come out with some new material, but you're right. You know, depending on where you are in your career, this might be a good deviation for people. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Final topic tonight, because we are running a little bit late before we got to get to Shirky Poo's news. Uh, we got about a minute here, bud. 11 databases combined to form what? One database to rule them all. So this is coming out of that new book, Skinwalkers at the Pentagon. Um, I can't go into a lot of detail right now. I'll include it in my notes. Uh, but basically from this book and uh, and our friend uh, of the show, um, uh, Thomas Fessler, basically covered this in his show today. Um, so I, I include a screenshot of his show to show the database list. But what, what, we, what you get from the book is the list of all the databases, the 10 databases that went in. There's one more database missing, which is the um, the uh, account at Skinwalker Ranch of of personal impact and personal injury and personal medical impact that was not listed, but we know that's one of the 11 databases. And basically one of the outputs of OSAP was this massive database that had 11 shoved into it. And this database is still active, still online and being used by the U S military. Wow. John stick around for the after show that we'll do on our YouTube channel and let's get to Shirky Poo's news. Yeah, Shirky Poo has us all lined up tonight. We're going to start in the eastern part of Canada, Newfoundland, where a couple faced with the problem of moving their dream home from its former location to their property ended up taking the direct route through more than half a mile of water. Danielle Penny said she and her boyfriend, Kirk, discovered the house that Penny had long admired on the shore of the Bay of Islands Inlet was going to be torn down, so they received permission from the property owners to move the structure to their own coastal property in McIvers. 
The couple determined moving the house by land would be too difficult as there's way too many obstacles in the way, so they hatched a plan to float the house down the ocean through the bay of islands to its new location. How cool is that? All right, I don't know where Shirky Poo finds these. A German inventor's unique ultrasound testicle bath birth control device for men took the top prize of the country's James Dyson Awards. Rebecca Weiss, an industrial design graduate from the University of Munich and inventor of the COSO male birth control device, was named Germany's winner of the James Dyson Award, which celebrates, encourages, and inspires the designers of new problem-solving ideas. The COSO uses an ultrasound testicle bath to temporarily stop sperm mobility. The device only needs to be used every few months to keep sperm inert and prevent eggs from being fertilized during sex. Isn't that nice? Thank you, Shirky Poo. Actually, it's about time that happened because it, it just is. Here's your thought of the day for today. What Halloween song are you sick of hearing year after year? I got to admit, it's Michael Jackson's Thriller. Can't stand it anymore. Greg, have a holly jolly Christmas. No, that's the wrong channel. Merle, spooky scary skeletons. Krista, none actually. Gail, I didn't know there were any Halloween songs. Cassie, none. I love them all. John, there isn't any that I know of besides the Nightmare Before Christmas. Tim, the purple people eater one. Jessica, my grandma used to sing, Here Comes Pumpkin Man. Bob, what friggin' Halloween song? Catherine, Baby Shark. Do, 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 do. Oh, uh, that's not really one. But uh, Aaron, nah, I love Halloween. It's different. Christmas songs can get the hell out of here, though. Let's see. Who else do we have? Monster Mash for Kimberly Jackshaw. Yeah, that one's getting old, too. And, you know, who do we have on Twitter here? Thriller for Jules. None of them for Varla. Thank you to everybody in the thought of the day. Thank you, Shirky Poo, for the news. John Hudson for the UFO report. And the crypto guru, Ronald Murphy, for leading us into Halloween. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, at work, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone in our chat rooms tonight. YouTube, LGAB, Twitch, Revolution Radio, Spreaker, Facebook, and on Twitter. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us because together, my friends, we own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them, too. Good night. Another rock star show tonight. You never go wrong with a little guru time. Never go wrong. Agreed. You, Johnny boy. Man, I tell you, man, I want to access that database. I bet you do. A database you know, the, is all horny. The, the only thing that bugs me is that, you know, this database is done in valet's scheme. Right. And um, and I've never studied Valet's database design. I, I have every faith it's it's well designed. It's, it's one of the things he specializes in. But I have no idea 
how it's keyed, what its schema is. I have no idea how the Blade thing works. And so I have no idea how hard it's going to be to get data out of it. Same problem with Cheryl, with Cheryl Costa's database. It's all done in her own, in her own methodology. And so like, how, how do you, uh, it just, it really can, the lack of open systems being used in some of these data collection methods are, are, are starting to really worry me because getting data out of these systems, even if we're allowed to, is going to be technically like seriously challenging. It's that I, I don't, I'm not happy about it. Yeah, I can I can understand that, buddy. I mean, I, Val Valet's really Valet's pretty supportive of open standards, and so I, I would like to believe that he put some effort into making it, you know, so it, you can export, you know, fairly easily. But you know, I don't know it for sure. Give me one sec here, brother. I mean, that's just something we ever get access. <laughs> oh, I doubt we will. I doubt we will. That's okay. That's okay. Super Quest, how you doing, buddy? According to my scale, seven pounds now. I'm down seven pounds. I'm happy with that. Feeling better. Yeah, it's it's uh it's nice when you finally start losing weight. Although the one thing I didn't like about it is that you know a lot of us only lose, you know, the, the one of the last places we lose weight is in our face. And so, like you know, I I once went through this like this long journey where I lost like um I lost like seventy uh probably like 70 75 pounds or something oh, like that oh i can't even imagine you with another 75 pounds on uh, i got up to 268 oh wow that's heavier than i've ever been yeah and um uh and like you know first 55 pounds nobody noticed last like 25 20 pounds everybody freaking janitor everyone will come up hey man you look great this is i'm you know, I'm trying to be polite, but I'm thinking to myself, where were you fools when I actually needed motivation? You know, like now I'm doing good. I'm with the program. I get it now. I don't need your motivation now. But it was back when I first started, I needed your motivation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, that's motivating right there, buddy. Yeah. Oh, that's you know, it's really bad. weird. I don't know if anyone else is hearing it, but you're like, your voice is really choppy for me. Why? And I think it's. I think it's probably my earpiece. And uh, it was just vanished. The awesome. Crypto Guru Whoa. brought it up too quick. Undo. That's crazy. Am I better now? No, nah, but here, let me let me let me just disconnect and reconnect and see what happens. So right. Not 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 the channel, just my earpiece. Oh, okay. I'll just continue editing. That's what I that's what I do. That's what I do. All right. Oh, there man. we go. Now it's fine. Yeah, it's, it's sometimes sometimes Bluetooth just gets a little wonky. Yeah. I hear you. Do oh, we start yeah. taking bets on what other what the next celebrity will be in the UFO world? Like we're literally well, gonna have to go through about two or three of these before we shake down again. Well, I mean, my guess is, is that, you know, I mean, it's, it's the rates going to start increasing. Um, and then what you're going to have is you're going to have breakouts within each genre, you know, like, I mean, you're, you know, basically, you know, you're going to get to a point where a bunch of people from one genre have come out and like, and then, but like no one from, you know, take your pick, I don't know, country or whatever, like have, and then, you know, two or three country people come out and then a bunch of other country people come out and, and, you know, I mean, let's face it. I mean, I don't know what the statistics are as to, you know, people who are witnesses versus experiencers versus people who haven't seen anything, but yeah. that statistic has to exist at, at, if not at the same ratios, at an increased ratio within the music industry. And so, there should be, you know, I don't know, 10% maybe of, of musicians. 
Well, all I'm saying is this. A number of years ago, we saw it in the paranormal world where all of a sudden every celebrity and their dog who hadn't been featured on a television show in a long time all of a sudden became paranormal enthusiasts. Okay? We saw that then. And, you know, history repeats itself. Now we're getting into the UFO uh, side of things where we're seeing this happen. So um, I'm not surprised by it. Uh, I my concern is this when you when you put and I got no problem with celebrities being experiencers or or being a part of the field or whatever but Hollywood has this funny way of of doing things it kind of says we're better than you we know more because we have the cameras and the television power to do it and my concern with it all is well, that, and the fact that everyone's constantly telling them that they are better than everyone else. Absolutely. You know, we probably should add that to the, yeah. to the mix. <laughs> my, my concern with it all is that we are going to see a real... UFOs is different than ghosts, okay? I mean, you're literally dealing with something here that everyone in humanity, is, it's going to affect every person on this planet if disclosure ever comes out. And I don't think we need a, and nothing against them. I don't think though we need a Kesha or a Demi Lovato telling us about, even even Tom DeLonge for that matter, telling us about UFOs. Now, Tom was a little bit different because Tom was a part of the TTSA team. All right, but the, you know, it reminds me of when Rob Lowe all of a sudden decided he was going to be a paranormal investigator, you know? Yeah. But the, but the thing is, Dave, forward. I mean, I understand what you're saying. And I agree that basically someone like you or me, you know, don't necessarily need to hear it from, from someone like Demi Lovato. Right. But my daughter, my daughter will want to hear it from Jojo more than she's going to want to hear it from, from, Nick Pope or from Richard Dolan that. or from any of those people. You're missing the point, what I'm trying to say, though. Hmm. Okay. I'm not questioning how their fame is going to help with the answers or anything like that. What I'm questioning is usually things like this fall apart quite quickly. Okay. And what happens is it causes damage to, ah. it causes damage to the field. Okay where we are on such a beautiful run up trying to figure out what is going on. All right. Where we have a lot of people going on, like, I'm sorry, but UFOs is not a game. You know, you ghost hunting to me is a game. Okay. Because a, we're all going to die and you either believe that there is a life afterwards or there isn't anything afterwards with UFOs. This is something where we have to get out of the stigma of UFOs or UAP. Because if they're not from here, they're from somewhere else, as we know. And we are playing with the lives of 7.8 billion people who are going to be affected if it ever comes down to disclosure happening. This isn't an American thing. This isn't a, a Discovery Plus thing or a Travel Channel thing. This is reality of how are we going to react when we find out that we are not alone. That is not a... And to me, okay, I think that if the, the way that these shows normally go for these people, it, it doesn't bode well for people learning the proper understanding of ufology and the reality and the potential of the after effects of what's going to happen. That is my concern. No, I, and I agree with you, but then, but, but then I guess I, 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 I have a, an example question and that would be that how much harm did Rob Lowe do to the Bigfoot field? No, he didn't do any harm, but what I'm saying is when you get, okay, okay, so let's take these people, for instance, Rob Lowe, okay, he was coming off a, a television show where his phone wasn't ringing anymore, needed to get it back in front of the camera. You know, there's someone 
uh, his agent or somebody said, Hey, you, you talk about that Bigfoot every now and again, or ghost. Why don't you go, uh, why don't we line up a, a show for you and your boys to go chase that yeah. stuff? Why not? Okay. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, John. Right. Right. Okay. What I'm saying though, is when you have certain people who are not professionals in the field, running around and sure you may have some people doing cameos what a, a bigfoot's easy because the first person you go to is dr jeff meldrum every show does it because he's the only one looking into it okay you don't have these people like demi lovato going to the scu you don't have them going to to high quality researchers for the most part Okay. Now Demi's a little different because they did put her with good people like Lori McDonald, who's coming on this show, Kevin Day, uh, Geraldine Orozco, and a few others. Yeah. Well, no, I was just, uh, I guess my point was I'm, I'm agreeing with you that I think that when you have, when you have celebrities uh, jump into a field and they're a big flash in the pan and then they burn out that that's that doesn't help the it doesn't help the 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 story it doesn't help the community and it could do harm and so but what i was wondering was was that you know i i'm i'm agreeing with you that i think that's very that's very likely and then i then i remembered that you know the rob Lowe thing happened a while ago and it kind of was a big thing and then it kind of fizzled out and so did it you know did it hurt the bigfoot community because i was just kind of trying to contrast the two, you know, no, like trying it, to it, see it, like, you know, foot community. But I think the thing is the communities that we are in, we're sick and tired of celebrity telling us how we should do our jobs. Okay. And, and, and coming, going on TV and being an accept uh, an accepted expert on the subject. Okay. Look, dude, I'm not even, I've been doing this for almost seven years. I'm not even close to being an expert. I can't break down what you can. We all bring little pieces to the, to this field. Okay. I bring nothing to the field except my experiences. And I know how to talk in front of one of these things and ask questions properly. And you're way. pretty. Yes, that too. Thank you. You know, but for the most part, all right. When you have somebody like Demi Lovato, okay, and I'm not, and I hate to bring her up again, okay, coming out and saying aliens don't like to be called aliens. We shouldn't call them that. Okay. Well, first off, who the fuck are you to, to say that? Okay. You didn't talk to any aliens to tell you that we don't mind. I understand your point, And I brought up that point the other day. Okay, but I'm just using that as an example of where all of a sudden, if you went on social media and saw how she was absolutely raked over the coals for making such a, a an inane comment, that did you see? Sorry, go ahead. That is where we, as an entire field, are affected yes. negatively. Yes by someone opening their mouth before they should. And yep. usually it's celebrities with high numbers on social media who put their foot in their mouth and yep. draw bad and negative attention to the subject. Yep. No, I, I, I totally agree. I, I, I will say though that, that there was a, there was one that in my opinion, very positive outcome of, of Demi's, uh, Demi's little, um, uh, you know, claim about the aliens. And that was, did you hear what Neil, uh, Neil DeGrease Tyson said about it? Boy, she, 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 she said, a, she didn't even know it. She set a trap for him and he walked right into it. He basically, he came out after her for saying this. And you know what his argument was? <laughs> Aliens don't have feelings. That was his argument, which is, is so interesting on so many levels, right? Because from one point of view, it's like, Aliens don't have feelings? I, weren't, weren't you just telling us that aliens don't come? How, how does that work, sir? And then, well, and then the second question but, is, how, how did you hear that aliens don't have feelings, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was amazing that he even engaged with her. I, it blew my mind. It made Lord him look Lord really Lord bad. Good point here. Joe Rogan did it to Bigfoot. He threw all of his Bigfoot researchers under the bus, including somebody who is very respected in Les Stroud. 
threw them all. How did, he, how did he do that? I, I'm not familiar with what happened. He just went on this uh, uh, non-believing about Bigfoot rant. Oh, and, but didn't he have a show where he was like trying to like 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 he was like looking at different like like myths and so forth? Is that what you're talking about? Um, he did go out in the field, I believe, once or twice, but he's come to the conclusion that it doesn't exist, right? Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, I, look, I, I mean, I, the name high game vet. I mean, any any time a celebrity, I mean, look, look, the exact opposites happened where, you know, we've had, you know, we've had, um, you know, sports celebrities come out in favor of flat earth and it, it's caused all sorts of problems. Right. I mean, it's like, you know, absolutely. But I mean, what's next? Are we all of a sudden going to see the next Dr. Phil come out and do an A&E special on experiencers? Tell me what it was like to get anal probed. Did you really? Well, like eventually, it? yeah. Eventually, you're going to see that show. It has to be a hypnotherapy show. Uh, Absolutely. With some some uh, Eric Estrada or or David Hasselhoff, somebody that's worn out and washed out. That's Absolutely. all of a sudden going to start doing an experiencer show, and the first time they get a click a clip of a wimpy guy who nobody has ever seen before talk about how he got anal probed by aliens, it's over. The entire field is over and that's, that's our, coming. Don't you kid yourself. It that's is coming. coming. It's absolutely coming, but that's our culture. We do that to everything. I mean, it's like, it's, that's just how it works. I mean, I don't like it. I hope someday we stop doing it, but I mean, that's, that's what we do. Oh, you I know, I mean, that. that that's the normalization process. Now, it's unfortunate that, that at some point people start looking for weak links and start looking for ways to exploit them. And so that, that ends up being the backlash that you're referring like, to, unfortunately. Here's a but, question for you. Where's Dan Aykroyd in all of this? Selling, be, selling vodka. But he would be the – well, you have people who sell the vodka. It's all being made and productive. He doesn't do anything. He's just the face of the franchise. Yeah, yeah. But, but he, he would yeah, be a perfect guy to come out with it. Yeah, yeah, and he uh, he has very little interest. Well, very little interest. You know, probably for the same reasons that you and I have talked about, right? He doesn't want to be made a spectacle of. Who knows? You know? Who knows? But you know, I mean, I mean, yeah, I think I think it's I think it's really, um, my, you know, I I guess my, I guess my my hope is is that. I mean, uh, Game Vet brings up a good. Sorry for cutting you off. Yeah, no, no. Game Vet brings up a uh, a good one here. They already started with celebrity ghost stories. You know, do we need to see more? Has been Carney Wilson uh, uh, telling us ab about ghost stories, or Eric Estrada, or other stars that we haven't seen on camera in 15, 18 years, right, or twenty years, or thirty years? And that's what happens. I saw a UFO. We we were filming chips on the on the on uh, the I five, and I looked up. Would it be Would it be better if it if it was current celebrities? I think it has to be a commanding celebrity. Okay, if you go the celebrity route, I think it has to be a commanding celebrity who is is. Uh, you know what? That's wrong. That is wrong. I'm going to rephrase this. I'm just I'm just playing it through my head right now. Yeah, totally. No, no, no. I'm going to state it this way. I don't care who the celebrity is. Okay, but if but if you are going to come out and and want to be a, a leader in this field, Open yourself up to the community, okay? One of the things that I heard about the downfall of the To The Stars Academy, and this is from uh, some private conversations that I've had with people close to it. Part of the downfall was Tom DeLong did not want any type of affiliation with the UFO community. Others, like Luis Elizondo, stated that was a bad move. We are shooting ourselves in the foot. And that's why Tom didn't allow anybody 
uh, through their media person, Carrie DeLong, Tom's sister, didn't allow any sort of, of talk to alternative media unless they were on a certain list. And that list, uh, before TTSA exploded, included Alejandro Rojas, Linda Moulton Howe, Jimmy Church, and that was it. That was it. Okay? And then, once the TTSA launched, and especially after the New York Times article came out, they shut off to everybody that wasn't mainstream. And yet, they had the audacity to basically ask people like you, people like me, and others to to buy shares in their company because they were going to be open and transparent to the UFO community to find them aliens and to find them UFOs. Okay? And they lied. And that's what happens, man. And we don't need a celebrity coming into us at brand new off the street. And that's like me, dude. Okay. I'm 48 years old. I'm a has been walking into an NHL rink and tell saying to their coaches, you don't know what you're doing. Move on over. I'm going to coach this team and show you how to do it. Same thing, right? Maybe a bad example, but pretty much the same meaning. And that's what we have with these celebrities. Like Demi Lovato, I know 100% has been told by her management team not to do any sort of UFO-type podcast. In fact, when I inquired about it by someone who was working on that show, I was told point blank, are you nuts? And I was—I well, think that's why her, her producer is, is the one doing it, right? Right. And I was told there's no effing way she's going to come on Spaced Out Radio. And this person wasn't saying that to be insultive. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. He, uh, he, he said there's no effing way that she is ever going to go on Spaced Out Radio or any other UFO podcast because she's too big of a name to put her name in shows like that. That's what I was told. And I have to admit, like, the thing I find funny about it is, is if, if I was on her team, like, I would be advising her the exact same thing, not because I think she's too big for it, but because I don't think she'd be treated fairly. But here's here's the thing, though. If if you give her to the bigger shows, okay, I'm not saying everybody and their dog who has a podcast, okay, especially those – I'm, I'm – I don't. If I say anything like that, I'm going to sound like an asshole. Okay, I don't. Yeah, no, want... but I, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. There, okay. there, there's 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 safer shows. Yeah, but if if she, it doesn't matter whether she came on our show or not. At least talk. And this was my whole point with the two of the stars academy. I didn't care, and and I took a ripping from UFO Twitter because they never understood when I said, I don't care if Luis Elizondo, Tom DeLong, Chris Mellon, or whomever ever come on our show. At least speak to the UFO public outside of Rojas and Jimmy Church and George Knapp. And they didn't. They didn't for a long, long time. Okay? Go on anybody's show. Go on the Black Vault. Okay, go to somebody with credibility. And if these people, these publicists do their homework and do their job, they would understand that a show like SOR is not like your your beatnik podcast out there where the ladies like uh you know where where the lady or the man or whomever the host is, it has, you know, 147 subscribers on YouTube. You know what I'm saying? You go to the bigger shows. You, you you call people, and they know who the people are. Call some people and say, hey, if you were to recommend five shows for Demi Lovato to go on, which ones would you recommend? And you talk to five, six people about that within the community. They'll tell you. It might not be this one. It might not be anything else. But she's not even going on coast to coast, man. That's nine million listeners. Nine million. It's. I mean, I hate to say this, but it's. It's not her market. 
you know, I mean, it, it's um, the minute she stepped into this topic, it became her market. Well, I mean, except for the from the point of view of the UFO topic, as you stated before, is is everyone's topic, right? It's going to affect all seven point eight billion of us, right? And so, if you're if you're a person living on Earth somewhere, and you don't, you know, you don't have any access to this community, right? Or either because of because of of real boundaries or just because of your your social status right you're you're the son of a king you're the the daughter of, of a queen you're the whatever it is right and you know you basically you know you can't for whatever reason reach out to this community that doesn't mean you don't have a right to explore the topic it doesn't mean you don't have a right to to talk about what you've researched or talk about how you feel i mean i mean i i i agree with you we have to be very cautious as to how much harm we let any of these systems do to us but but ultimately it's not it's not really our place necessarily to to judge how everyone goes about it you know what i mean i mean it's well, it's it, it is our place though because we're the people who put in the time and money OK, John, my people, my listeners here would sooner listen to John Hudson talk about UFOs than pick a celebrity, um, Christina Aguilera or a Kardashian. I hope so. <laughs> That's the point I'm getting at. The story will affect seven, eight, seven point eight billion people on the planet who delivers the story is a different market whatsoever. And if you are ignoring your biggest supporters, okay, in this case, her biggest supporters are on social media, but if you're going to be stepping into the UFO community or the paranormal community or the cryptid community and you're forgetting about them, you're writing your own death warrant on your check because eventually it, it kills two things. It kills your support from the community who is more than willing to stand behind anybody who has a big voice. But number two, it kills the topic with your own followers if you get bounced after one season or half a season or two seasons. It kills your followers from that topic. And then it becomes a laughing point. Yeah, you remember when Demi did that UFO show where all of a sudden she thought she got mm -hmm. aliens and then she made that stupid alien comment? That's oh, what yeah. no. people remember. If, 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 Demi, if Demi turns around, you know, some amount of time from now and says, oh, my God, um, you know, I, I was sucked in by a cult leader who used to be a surgeon and and he brainwashed me and I never saw anything and I'm confused and, and, and it was all it, none of it was real. Oof. That, that would, that, I mean, at least her 115 million followers would all turn a vengeful eye to this community. You hope. You hope. But remember, a lot of those fall, you'll get some. Look, there will be some who will be like, you know, hey, we get it on this show too, where people will say, hey, I never heard of your show before, but I heard it. I love it. I'm going to subscribe to it. But that does that's not for everybody. Right. OK, it's not for everybody <clears throat> with coast to coast having nine million listeners a night. Oh, we're That's lucky crazy. if we get one of those, two of those regular listeners. Is that really is that really nine million a night. Is that, yeah. is that like ballpark, right? Wow. That, that's the statistics, the statistics I read last year. That's a boatload of humans. Absolutely. It is. And good on them for doing it. Yeah. Agreed. Okay, good on him for doing it. I'm not complaining at, at all about it, right? Boy, man, but doesn't that put it in perspective? Here you got Coast to Coast. That's you know the top paranormal show. Forget paranormal, top ten radio show, I believe. Right? Yes, I mean, independent of topic, right? And they're looking at you know nine million, which to us is like, whoa, that's a lot of people. And Demi Lovato can 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 send a kitten gift to 115 million during breakfast absolutely but that's what i'm wow. saying demi lovato not going on coast to coast am is ridiculous you've stepped into the community all right 
when Robbie Williams stepped into the universe, into the community as an experiencer, he went on coast with George Knapp. Tom DeLonge went on coast. Yeah, but, but Rob, Robbie Williams didn't do anything other than coast. He just did coast. He just did coast, but at least he opened up and talked to the community. It's part of the responsibility. So let me ask you, so if you were if you were trying to convince Demi Lovato to go on the coast, what what would what would you what would you tell her that that like like what would she gain by going on coast? I would say this. I would say you would gain a lot of respectability from the audience that's that li lives for these topics and this knowledge on a daily basis. This is a smart PR move for you. It's one of the top 10 radio shows in the world. Never mind just North America, in the world. Well, actually, in North America for sure. But let's say top 30 radio shows in the world. Still big, yeah. Okay. It would benefit, plus the archives would benefit. You know someone's going to illegally download it on YouTube. Okay. It would benefit. Talk to the right. community that you are being or that you have decided to put yourself with. Dude, even though we never got her as a guest, even what's her name? The... the Stormy Daniels went and did a bunch of of uh, podcasts talking about her love of the paranormal. Great, That's right? And and actually, I heard I heard a, a Naps interview of her, and I was actually I was taken back. I was like, "Wow, man she she's actually really into this, man. She's she's pretty yeah. hardcore." Great move. It it gave her a lot of respect for this community yeah. because yeah. they were able to ask questions about, well, how long have you been interested in this? How long have you been quietly studying this? How long, why did you take so long to enter the community publicly? Okay, that those are the type of questions that need to be asked. Okay, I would love to interview her. Demi, Demi Lovato, that is. <clears throat> okay, I would love to interview her. There's a lot of questions I have. And it's not a... It's not going to be a a, a a a hit parade, okay, of trying to make her look bad. It's not going to be that at all. I would come in with a full journalistic integrity saying, hey, let's talk about you here for a second. What happened to you? What made you decide to attend Stephen Greer's event? What made you start to fall for this community what made you decide that you needed to get yourself more involved with this community okay why did you choose it if you're an experiencer what happened to you what do you think happened all right hmm that's what we need Yeah, I don't know. It's I guess I guess what I'm what I'm kind of struggling with is it is it you know if if I don't know. I just I, it's it's it it almost seems to me like you know if if one of these celebrities that comes out decides to to really engage with all of us, it there's a lot more upside for us than there is for them. You know, I mean, I understand everything you're saying, but like I'm just. I'm just trying to, you know, play devil's advocate. Just thinking to myself, like, if I was advising someone, like, you know, if I was advising Demi Lovato, I would go onto Twitter. And I would look at what people said about her on Twitter, and then I'd go, uh, well, uh, hmm, maybe we should think about this. You know, um, you know, I mean, I don't know. It would just, it would be um, the only reason why you don't put her out there is exactly what Co-Create Happy says. Maybe Demi's handlers know she's going to say even more really dumb stuff if she's interviewed. But you look at the interview that she did where she made the alien, where the guy, the people made the aliens comment. Okay. I will almost guarantee you that that would not happen on a UFO show. 
Like if she came on this on our channel here, okay, guaranteed she would never make the aliens comment. Okay, but because she's on in Australia making on, and I don't know that podcast, but I could pretty much guarantee that the people who interviewed her know about ufology, about as much about ufology that could fit on their pinky uh, nail, their pinky fingernail. All right, ask her the question about aliens. You know how you know that? Because the majority of the UFO field does not ask about aliens. Right. They asked they asked the questions, Demi, why did you get into this? Demi, why did you why did you feel this was important to you? Demi, why why is this something that is is a value for you to move on and and to introduce to your 115 million social media followers. That's the way it's done. That's the way it should be done. Not this, well, let's go on a podcast in Australia and Demi, if you know, you could talk about your show and everything like that with a couple of, of uh, Gen Zers who are you know, don't know a goddamn thing about the topic. Yeah. And well, then- I, and I, I just realized one thing, though, is I remember Ro- Robbie Williams specifically talked about the fact that the only reason why he went on Coast to Coast was because he he got to know Nap when they yeah, were at he Skinwalker and he, and he trusted him. Mm-hmm. So I, I think it almost ends up going, it almost ends up being the responsibility of someone like, well, like in the case of Keisha, right? Stephen Greenstreet has a has some kind of relationship with her, not maybe directly, but certainly through her brother, right? Yeah. And so, you know, so he would be a good person to introduce, to try to encourage her to um to to go out onto some show and so forth. He he'd be Absolutely. he'd be a good mediator for that sort of for that sort of situation. Absolutely. Like if if I had if and I doubt Kesha or handlers will ever listen to this show, but if I had some advice for them going into this television episode, my advice would be don't forget about your UFO community. They're going to be the people watching it. They are going to be the people who you are representing, whether you choose to or not. All right. And there's a giant community of millions of people around the world who are either going to, who are either going to support you with everything they have, or when it fall, if if you, or they're going to say this isn't worth it. All right, you might as well try and get them on your side. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I agree okay. there. I, I I'm just you know I, I just wonder you know like like I said it's part part of is why I just wonder like from the point of view of someone like Demi Lovato, you know, um, you know maybe maybe her you know maybe she doesn't always think about her music career but from the point of view of you know i I would just uh, i would imagine some of her advisors would be asking questions like well you know how many people on coast are likely to buy your album you know what i mean like i don't don't know what lens they would use to judge the value of engaging with the community you know like for demi personally i agree with everything you're saying but for demi the product um i think that might be more of the issue um but yeah, but you know what? I need to I need to jet for one second. Give me like two minutes. Yeah, I'll be right ahead. back. Right? Yeah. An audience. Let me let me know. I mean, there's 136 people watching this. Let me know. Am I wrong? Am I right? How do you feel about it? Type it. Type your comments in. I'll put them up. Whether you agree with me or not, I'll put your comments up. I'm curious.
Nikki says the celebs who do know info and know the community privately won't talk, but I think we could have them to bring a better light to the greater public. And that could potentially be a good thing. Agreed, Nikki. Agreed. All right. But how they do it is a different thing. Uh, hold on. Mondak says, no, you are correct. Uh, zero cool. I think Demi doesn't need the help of really anyone to push whatever message she has to forward. Her fan base is huge and she has really solid connections. Okay. That is true too. Solar Warden, to me, having someone like Demi, if she is a product and her handlers are using her as a pawn, it is more likely to obfuscate the issue as it as is tradition with the issue. Peppa says, good stuff, I agree. Brasloff, the UFO Garage Boys would be a way better candidate to relate with the young crowd. They actually know their stuff, unlike Demi. Uh, Solar Warden, have someone be in the public eye talking about UFOs, etc., but not giving it the respect it deserves to entire to, or to enter proper scientific consideration. Um, zero cool. I think she could really fuck things up for the disclosure process, though. Race fan, Dave, everything you were saying is 100% correct. Matthew, like I said, Dave, it's over. I'm off paper. I don't know what that means. Uh, Grady. Dave, you are truthfully spot on. Celebs are too worried about furthering their careers than about the damn truth being shared through media. Thank you, Grady. Appreciate you hopping in on the chat room. Uh, Paul, I think you are correct, Dave, but John is too. Everyone who is a brand influencer is really only interested in one thing, themselves and their profitability, and so do their handlers. Bang on, Paul. Bang on. Nikki, agreed, Dave. It is all how they go about but who they also connect with in the community. Um, uh, Mondag, I think it would help Demi's credibility to go on coast. I think so too. All right. Applesauce, not you are correct, Dave. Um, I want to show you guys something here. and Let's see if I can find it. Uh, okay. I want to show you guys this in case you haven't seen it. Okay. In case you haven't seen it, I'm going to read to you some of the heinous comments that came across from Demi's, uh, comments. This comes from a TMZ article about her saying aliens is offensive when referring to extraterrestrials. Now, oh, look at that picture. That's horrible. <laughs> of course it is. Uh, uh, new drinking game. Drink whenever you offend someone. I'll have four drinks, please. Uh, Webby, what about leprechauns in the U.S.? Do we need to start calling them Irish-American little people? Or how about modern-day unicorn? Or is the corn part offensive? Start calling them unihorse. Hmm. Uh, Austin, can we still use alien and UFO emojis? Uh, coming, uh, Jericho Rain, at this point, breathing is offensive. I'm going to leave some of the more distasteful comments out. Um, TMZ knows this poor girl has extreme brain damage, so they post a news story every time she says something ridiculous. Uh, Craig, thanks for the advice, Demi. When I see one, I'll be sure to ask them what I should call them. Um... Julie, time to cancel this person. Done with her. She's offensive. Chelsea, she needs help. Seriously, what has happened to her? Katie, I am so sick of them. Um, I, like I said, I'm going to leave out some of the other comments here that are rude. All right. Stacy, they only thought Brittany was messed up. 
Tara, kind of hope they would abduct her and take her far, far away. Uh, Danielle, she also offended. She she's also offended by froyo. I don't know what froyo is. Frozen I, yogurt. I'm sorry. Frozen yogurt. Okay. I really don't know how she still has fans left. I hope she gets the help she needs. Y'all out there worried about Britney when this girl really needs help. You know, I like Demi's music, but she really needs to say less. Someone come and get them. She changed her profession to stand-up comic. Uh, Michelle, did they call her and tell her they were offended? Okay, these are these are the reason why I'm reading these to all all of you guys and showing you guys this is this is what people are thinking of the UFO community. All right. This is this hurts what we do. And uh, John, I don't know what you think, but I, I, I was just looking something up because I, I was just trying to remember. So, um, uh, uh, um, I mean, John, there was over, there's over ten thousand comments on this thread. Okay. 10,000 comments on this thread. And I, by just reading them, 90, I could go any, any portion of this, man, any portion of this. Hold on. Yeah, but I gotta be honest with you, Dave. Most of those people to me, based on how they commented are not people whose opinion I'm going to really care very much about. Most but, of them seem pretty offensive, pretty closed-minded, pretty obtuse folks. John, okay, you're, you're looking at this as a human, though. Yes, I agree with you. But you're looking at the comments that are made directly to Demi. Okay? What I'm saying is, read between the lines. All of these comments here, or pardon me, right, wrong way, right here, all right? That all affects the UFO community. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. All right. Okay. I, don't, I, I agree with you 100%. A lot of these comments are horrible. Okay. That's why I'm skipping over a bunch of them. And trust me, there are so I've read probably 300 of these comments since this story was put out. And there are some comments there that are highly, highly offensive. That I will not that I will not read because I don't think anybody should go through those. Right. Uh, so, um, what, what maybe, what maybe uh, I was trying to think of other of other cultural places where this happened, and and um, uh, Guillermo del Toro. I think I'm mispronouncing his first name. He's a uh, um, uh, uh, makes movies. He created Pan's Labyrinth and a couple other things. He did this fantastic animated series. Um, called Troll Hunter that had um, two um, uh, kind of uh, auxiliary shows that came out, and it was a really cool show because it combined uh, magic and and um, and aliens uh, into one program. And if I were, and I'm looking it up to see if I remember, but if I remember correctly, uh, in this show there was a running joke about the fact that the two aliens were offended being called alien. Um, they they actually really prickled at the at the, at the label, and so I'm I'm trying to see if I'm remembering that correctly. But I just thought it was kind of funny that you know essentially we had an actual like popular animated series where essentially that exact message was being put forth. Okay, but until we hear it from the aliens themselves, we can't make jump to assumption. That's all I'm saying. Oh, agreed, 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 agreed. Dana, Dana makes a good comment here. Let's get some of the audience in here. John may be aware of many aspects of electronic warfare. Dividing is a way to conquer, and social sensitivities are one of the weaponizations being used. It all leads to things you guys don't discuss. But I think that falls more into the person that asked her the loaded question than it comes into her specifically trying to be divisive. 
I mean, for her, I don't know how much she really benefits from being di divisive, but I can certainly see that the person that asked her the question was probably very likely trying to create. Um, but let's face it, if, if Demi came out to this community and, and tried to embrace this community, half the community would attack her and half the community would support her. Yeah, but you still have to make yourself open. That's the point I'm making. You don't open to everybody. It's just like I think Luis Elizondo's biggest flaw is he went on everybody and their dog's show. And I was talking to their media guy, uh, Skyforce media guy about that. Okay. And they're and he and Jesse was like, Dave, we can we don't control what Lou does. Lou is Lou. Lou does Lou. All right. And I and they know that. There are some things that, that Lou has said on podcasts that have 100, 200, 300, 400 subscribers on YouTube that should have been said on either bigger shows or in mainstream media. Just the other day, I mean, that, that presentation he gave on, on, on Disclosure, um, uh, I have so much trouble remembering that poor guy's name. I don't know why, but um, it, it's, a good, it's a good YouTube channel. I, I've been checking it out since he was on. Um, and, and you know, it has, a, it has a decent following in Europe, but that presentation, that presentation was huge. That should have yeah. been done on Tucker. That should have been done on CNN. That should have been done Absolutely. on, you know, whatever. Right. Yeah. It, if your goal is to get it out to the, to the largest audience. All right. So steam train Mark in Australia says just some info on the radio show that Demi Lovato spoke to here in Australia a few weeks ago. The show is on KISS 106.5 FM. Kyle and Jackie, oh, the biggest radio show in Oz. Okay, so, but the fact is, we don't know if they know anything about UFOs. Yeah. Okay, so, I mean, hey, big radio stations always get the big guests. They always do. And I remember when I worked in, in my newsroom, and we had two other radio stations in there. One was the top radio station in Vancouver at the time. And it'd be cool to see who you'd walk into every now and again, from actors and actresses to, to uh, musicians. It was fantastic. I bet. Uh, let's get to more audience comments here. Uh, Paula W., they are thinking this because they put these washed-up celebrities to host a crappy show, and people think it's even more of a joke. Uh, Solar Warden. What John doesn't realize, though, is that even is that even to the more acute people who know in the community, I can't see how they take her seriously. If the randoms don't, you can bet the serious ones don't. And so uh, that would that would that would indicate Solar Warden that she shouldn't engage with the community. There's no point. But she also shouldn't be in the, in that same context by seeing what's on the on on the TMZ part okay they shouldn't be uh associating with with uh anybody in the community anybody in the world about this because look at well, I mean, the UFO community is going to be a lot more polite for the most part than what we saw in that TMZ article yeah well and and I but I have to admit like if if um if if I if I was advising Demi, I would have I would have said, say what you want to say in your show. If you don't get it all out, we'll try to do another season. But outside of this show, I wouldn't talk to anybody about it, right? Because mm -hmm. it's it's all downside, right? I mean, for her in her world, it's it's all it. There, it's none of it's going to help her sell albums. None of it's going to help her career. But a lot of it could do a lot of harm to her, you know. So, I mean, I would have a hard time. Uh, I, I wouldn't have advised that she go on that show in Australia, right? I'm mean, not to talk about that. You want to go talk about well, her new I album? Think, I don't think the question, and uh, I don't know if I can play it. I could under fair use, I guess. I, I, I don't want the answer to the question. I want the question. You mean the question was asked of her when she when she made when she, she made the alien? Well, it's got to be in print somewhere. We could read it probably.
But I, I don't know. It almost sounds to me like she was set up. And maybe, maybe not even planned. Maybe just, you know, those two radio people are just good at asking, you know, punchy questions that put, see you know, on YouTube. Hold on. Put people on a put people on a on a on a on a on a pivot point. I better not look on here because the audio will come. No, it wouldn't come through in here. Maybe it would. Maybe it wouldn't. I don't know. Oh, no. But, you know, the thing is, is that we're, we're, you know, if you, if, if you are, Okay, let's say, for example, um, let's say let's say you are you you're a woodworker, right? You you, you create wood uh, masterpieces, right? And that, that's what you do for a living. That's what you've done for the last twenty years. And during that same time, you've had a bunch of UFO experiences, and now you suddenly see an opportunity to come out and engage with the public about UFO stuff, right? Now, the only way you're going to know how to do that is to engage with the community through what you know. Right. So if you're a painter, you might start, you know, painting, you know, about UFOs. If you're a, a, a work on wood, you might start making wood crate. If you're an actor, you go out and talk about UFOs or you make UFO movies. Stylish, you're, you know, I mean, inside. Can you hear region. that? Yeah. Looking for something, Jessica? Yeah. I mute my yeah. mic. Yeah. Tell me just you black hear diamond cheese. I can totally hear that. I love oh, diamonds. I'm I'm my black mic. diamond. I muted my mic right Let's now. some pepperoni. Sounds like garbage, but <laughs> I can hear something. <laughs> it's all blah, 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 blah. I mean, you know, if if a politician uh, decides that they want to talk about UFOs, know. I can't hear anything now. A bond. I just I just now, to now I can hear it. Now it's no audio at all. Watch Just that talk stuff. Away. I want to hear and then we'll get to the UFO thing. In the so they can still hear me, Dave, but you were muted. What's that? I said they, they, they said they could still hear me, but you were muted. Yeah, I know. That's what I wanted. I wanted to see okay. if, the, if the YouTube audio was coming through. Gotcha. So give me a minute here because I want to. Yeah. I got to wonder if she, I, I don't know, maybe someone knows, maybe someone can post. I, did, I mean, did she go on that radio show to talk about aliens or was she just on the radio show because she's Demi Lovato and they brought it up. That's the other thing I wonder too. I, I, I so just don't absorb mass media these days. I don't have nine minutes to go through it. <laughs> D Dave, do you know, was she on that show to talk about a aliens or was she on that show just because she's Demi Lovato and it came up? Do you, have an, do you have any idea? Um, I think she was talking about her new TV show. Okay, I mean that's the other problem is you know once you do a TV show, you're kind of opening yourself up to you know people to ask you questions about it. Either way, I have to admit I, I still have, I still need to watch an episode. I haven't seen any of the episodes yet. Well, it is weird. It is weird, my friend. It is, but I just the thing. I, the thing is, the thing I'm curious about is that, is that over time, what I what I would expect to have happen is that from every from every genre of 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 professional, from firefighters to police officers to teachers to to musicians to every to, in every single one of those communities, there's two, five, ten percent of them that have had some kind of an experience mm -hmm. over time. Each of those groups, probably in groups will start to come out about, about this topic. Now, if they're passionate enough about, 
about it, they're going to want to engage in investigating it in some way. And most of them are going to investigate it using the tools that they have skills in. So if you're a police officer, you might use, you know, a detective work. If you're a, um, you know, if you're a musician, right. You know, so yeah. I just, I wonder if like, we're just going to start. If I, I guess what I'm saying is, is that I don't see how this doesn't become an incredibly crowded field really fast. It's going to be, it's going to be. Hi, Tay Ray D Dows. Welcome to SOR chat. Appreciate you coming on in. Hi, Mary Bone. How you doing? Good to see you. Good morning, everybody. Oh, you know when you when you kept saying Mary Bone, I I, I didn't I didn't actually have any idea how that was spelt. I actually, I, you know, at one point I actually thought you were saying Mary Bone. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, that's how it's spelled. But it, it, John, it's going to get interesting, and, and we're going to see a bunch more of this, whether it's Kesha, whether it's Demi, whether it's whoever else is coming out with it, okay? And who knows what's going to happen? Well, uh, you know, and I think it too, it, it depends too, because I, you know, I think that like, okay, so you take me for example, right? So yeah, okay, I, I, I think I might have seen something, I think I might have witnessed something twice, possibly. I don't think I'm an experiencer, although I leave it opening that I might have forgotten. So I guess it's possible, but I don't think of myself as an experiencer. And, you know, it took me about, took me about three, about three, maybe four years of research before I felt really comfortable like, like really engaging in conversation about this topic, right? Because before that, I, you know, I just, I, you know, I just, well, I just didn't, I didn't know if I could, if I could add any value really, I guess is what it comes down to. And so I think when people come to this topic, just as a witness or as a nothing, you know, I think that they're more, I think they're more likely to tread slowly. But I think when you come into this, topic as an experiencer as someone who's really engaged i think that the tendency is to come on and, and and think that you immediately deserve a seat at the table and and maybe you do i don't i don't know i, I haven't been an experiencer so I, I can't say but you know but i mean i've even met experiencers that, that don't even don't even care about researching any of it so they're like i don't care what other like i know what i experienced Right. That's what matters is what I experienced, not like what Jacques Vallée wrote about what other people experienced 20 years ago. Right. And and so I, I think it's really I think it's really the experiencers that are the ones that are are most likely to to try to take on a quote unquote expert role. Without necessarily the 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 uh, research background that most people would consider to be required to do so. And unfortunately, it's only going to be the experiencers that in most communities have the, the drive to really come out. And so if it's only experiencers that are popping out of these little subgroups, we're going to continually have this problem of them popping out thinking that they should be a thought leader and, and I mean, honestly, I mean, I don't know. I, it's hard for me to judge because, you know, I mean, realistically, like I, I can read all the books I've read in the world. But, you know, if 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 Bob over here, you know, spent last night flying in a flying bloody UFO. Right. Like what 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 good am I? Right. Like, I mean, maybe he should be the thought leader. Right. But, you know, but the problem is, is that they come into it without any of the history, without any of the knowledge, without any of the reading, without any of the the lore without any of the, you know, culture without any, anything. And so they can stumble and tumble and, and jump in the holes and get into all sorts of trouble. But if they're an experiencer, you know, I, the, the, I mean, you, I, you do get some points for that, I guess. Right. I mean, I guess you have to, right. Because well, I mean, I, the experiencers from what I have seen, 
are the ones who are the ease, the ones who are easily shit on in this community because they have no proof. Okay. They have a story. They have, sure, you may have a picture of three red dots on your hand or on your back or, or what they consider scoop marks out of your shins or your, your legs or your arms that were never there before. But the, the experiencers are the ones that lose the most in everything. And that, and, and that doesn't matter what community you're in. Whether it's ghosts, whether it's um, whether it's cryptids like Bigfoot, or whether it's UFOs and aliens, all right, and that is where you know a lot of people get a lot quite hypersensitive about what we're seeing. You know, this is why John, you and I agree to disagree. Where on the technology aspect, I have right. zero interest in technology you love the technology and i think that's great right because for a guy with a science background like you have and a technological background that you have you want you, you these are like lego to you man you want to see what you could build with it bingo and i get that and i can 100 uh respect that and agree with that but for somebody like me who has run the gamut with a lot of experiences with UFOs and extraterrestrials, including being taken. I want to know why me, man. I want to know what they did to me. Who was it who did what to me? Okay. Why did they choose me? Yeah. You know, I have to admit, like, I hear that. I hear that from not every experiencer, but I hear that from, from a, from a, a large number of experiencers. And that, that is a that is an emotional need that I have tremendous trouble understanding. I mean, it's not. Uh, I don't want to say it the wrong way. I understand like like why someone might want to know that. I, I understand what you're asking for, but what I what I what I don't feel like grok. I really I really grasp is 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 the compelling need to understand it. Um, just cause I, I haven't experienced it. Right. But to me, um, I always find it kind of interesting cause it, it's kind of like, you know, I think a lot of us that, that haven't had that experience, um, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if jealous is the right word because so many of your experiences are so awful, but I mean, but you know, from, from one point of view, it's kind of like, well, you were picked and I wasn't. So why aren't you just happy you were picked? You know let, what I mean? <laughs> let me let me put it you to know? you this way. And I may be this may be a bad example. When your daughter was born, were you were you in the delivery room? Yes. Okay. Barely made it, but yeah. Okay. Did you see the pain your wife was going through? Yeah. Ugh. Did yeah. you feel the pain? No. It's the same thing. You what you witnessed it, you saw what was happening firsthand, okay. But you don't know the extreme pain that your wife was going through, even if she had an epidural. Right, right, right. You don't know the extreme pain that she went through. No, for nine months. Yeah, yeah, correct. Okay, so as an experiencer, I'll I'll use me as an example. Okay, I've seen craft make a ninety degree turn. It's impressive. Okay. I have seen craft vanish right in front of us. It's impressive. Like but when you wake up on a table and then you feel a saw cutting open the back of your head, okay, you want to know why you. Yeah, that alone is just, okay, 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 okay. So I, I understand why that would be one of your many questions, but the fact that that's such a predominantly uh, prioritized question, my, I guess my question, my question to you is, is it, if let, let's, I, I don't know what, I don't know what the logical, I don't know what the logical like shelf of, of likely answers are going to be. Right. 
I, I imagine some of them are going to be things like, um, well, your, your, your mind reached out to us. Um, you were genetically predisposed. Um, we held a lotto. Um, uh, uh, someone narked you out and told you, told us about you. Uh, you know, I mean, there's all these different options, right? Uh, I, I'm sure there's a gazillion I'm not thinking of. If, if you find out one of those answers, like, okay, you were genetically predispos predisposed to, 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 have the, to have the experience. How does that change things for you? Hmm. How does know what, what does knowing do for you? Dude, for a lot of, it, but you got to realize you can't think of it as an isolated incident. Okay. Every incident is different. Okay. What yeah, but when you're asking why me, it, it's, you're kind of asking for the gambit of all the incidents. Like why was like, why were you selected? And I wasn't. Okay. It, it seemed to be like what you're, what you're wanting to know. I mean, you're into analytics. So I will say, uh, let me put this on a personal level. Okay. This is what you don't see for the majority of experiencers out there. You don't see how it affects their everyday life. Nope. You don't see or talk to the friends who you thought were lifelong friends who all of a sudden want nothing to do with you. Yep. Okay. You don't, you don't understand the lack of sleep or, or what it's like knowing that you went to sleep at say 11 o'clock at night, your alarm rings at eight o'clock in the morning, your body is aching and it feels like you haven't slept one bit. Okay. Yeah, no, it, I mean, yeah. And okay. I mean, but hold I on. can't imagine what that's all like. I but mean, it sounds on. awful. Hold on there. But wait, there's more. <laughs> okay. You don't you don't understand the the fact that all of a sudden in the middle of the night you hear noises of sounds coming and colors and and shapes and objects popping into your head that you've never thought about before. And you don't know where they're coming from, but for some reason you feel the level of importance that you have to draw it out or write it out. You don't understand why all of a sudden that of kind of experience, but yeah, but no, but, but, but the rest of it, you're that on. Okay. So there's a lot of these little one-offs that happen along the way. And I'm not even a bad experiencer. You, you go, go watch Karina Sable's story. Okay. Or listen to it in our archives and listen to how ET contact by her going outside and viewing a triangle in the 90s in Aldergrove, British Columbia, about how it ruined her life to the point where she can't hold down a job because at point she was being taken four or five times a week. Right? But I mean, but finding out why she was selected doesn't change any of that yeah but it's no it, it does though because we all want answers to what's happening but it, it sounds like it sounds like the answer would only be helpful if it if it gave it meaning um if you found that it was random it wouldn't be a helpful answer But there's a lot of variables to the question, why me? Why did you cut open my head? Okay, I'm using me as an example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay. Why did you drop me from three feet above my bed into my bed? Okay. Why did you pin my head down when I was trying to get up? Why didn't you just yeah. ask? You know, I, I can understand, I can absolutely understand wanting to know why, but what I'm, what I'm, because I, I'm not in that position, I can look at it, uh, I guess, a little objectively. And, I, and, and so I find myself asking, well, what answers could someone get 
that would make it better? Right? Like, like what, what answers could you get that would be helpful? Yeah, but dude, it's, it's the same thing as going to counseling, right? I, I still want to know uh, things about my ex-wife and why, why we got divorced. There's questions on this planet that I will never know, right? It becomes, I mean, it's, a, it's an emotional affair. It's not a scientific affair or a studious affair. It's an emotional, personal, um, personal affair. Yeah, I, I guess. I guess what I'm getting at is that is it you know like, like like one one of the problems that a lot of us have is that is that we imagine we imagine what we think the results of things will be, right? And then when they when we actually get them. They don't end up giving us what we thought they would, right? So, like, you know, you really want to be married. You really want to get rich. You really want to get this. Year, and you get there. And so, I just, I find myself, I find myself wondering, like, like for for all the people that are asking why, if if I could just snap my fingers and they could all know exactly why, uh, other than just getting the need over with, like, just feeling like you have some control. Right. And, and that may be it that, I mean, that, and that's, that's completely justified. Like if, if the main reason why is just because you want to feel like you have some bloody control and you want to understand why it happened so that maybe you can predict it or you can understand just, you know, why you suffered. Like those are all completely valid reasons for wanting to know why, but, but I just wonder, like, I, I part of me just worries that essentially that most people after they found out why, wouldn't get the relief from it that they thought they would. Yeah, but that's for their journey to find out, though. Oh, totally. Oh, no, absolutely. totally. No, 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 absolutely. And it no one should stop really them from finding out journey. why. So, I mean, but but it goes another extreme. Okay, what about these contactees? What about these contactees who, after they have extraterrestrial experience, end up in some MK Ultra or MyLab program? Right, there's a la lot. la 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 la. la. <laughs> you know what you, you know what you need to do. My lab terrifies me, man. I gotta admit, it really does. You know what you need to do is you need to have a sit down with Samantha Mowat and get her to explain it to you. But you know what, Dave? Actually, uh, well, I I I don't I don't think she's a good one to do it for one very for one very interesting reason. She seems to accept all of this beautifully. I mean, she doesn't seem upset about it at all. I mean, maybe she just puts on a good show, but like the way she talks about it, she's like, oh yeah, well, there's this and then there's that. And oh, they do this. And yeah, sometimes it's like that. And like, and and I, I mean, I admire her for she it. I completely her, admire her for it. But spiritually, she knows what her role is. And she's accepted that. Okay. Talk. Okay. If it's not her, talk to Melinda Leslie. Yeah, she's the one I've, I I have listened to, and, and she and she's the one that that I've learned a little bit from, and she's the one that 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 that, that makes me want to go la 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 la. la. Well, but that, but that's but that's the thing, man. Okay, so it, it open, That's why I always talk about the Pandora's box, dude. Okay, because this is so much more uh, than than spaceships and. And, uh, you know, I am yeah. trying, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to play down what you want to know. Okay. Oh, or no, 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 no. Yeah. No, no, no. I take no offense at all, Dave. None whatsoever. Right. I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not trying to play that down whatsoever, but when you get to the meat and potatoes of the subject, which is contact, what are you going to do? How is everybody going to react? Because it throws an entire wrench into it. If Lou Elizondo hypothetically came out and said, during my time with ATIP, part of my job was to go meet extraterrestrials who had landed, who had contacted us and landed, and I had to meet them face to face. And I had to, and I was the chosen one to walk onto their ship. And I was gone for five hours. Once again, all hypothetical. How would we react? 
And that's not even necessarily a, a great analogy because that would probably be a very nice experience. I Whereas mean, yours, yours wasn't right. I mean, it's like, or how do these my lab or am, let's take my labs for instance. How do these my labs know who is being taken? If the my lab program is real, how do they know who is being taken? No, I mean, I mean, Dave. Here, here, here's the thing. Like, I mean, like I told you before, I, 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 um, you know, I started up, you know, bits and bits and bolts and stuff like that, and then, and then I, I, I focused on consciousness for a long time, and then about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, I started lo looking into the abduction side of things, and I, I, I put off the abduction things on purpose because, well, quite frankly, I was concerned that if I had studied that first, I wouldn't bother studying the rest of it, and. Um, and uh, and I was right because because the 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 contact stuff doesn't just change it; it ruins it. It takes all the fun out of it. It takes all the passion. It like I mean, I used to want to make contact with aliens. Now I I I, I don't think I do but anymore. Here's the thing: one of the other problems we have in ufology is we have a bunch of people out there who've never had an experience who have just heard the stories of what has happened, who are trying to tell us what we feel, how we should feel, okay? What they think is going on with our brains, okay? And there's a number of them out there. Jim Mars was one. Richard Dolan is one, okay? And there are others, who've never had an experience in this field, let alone seeing lights in the sky, trying to tell everybody what we go through. You have no, nobody here has any clue. And we get called liars. We it's get all so personal. Fakers. We get called imagine, uh, people who are imagining dreams as reality. Okay. Well, to me, you know, to me, that's one of the that's one of the main benefits that I'm hoping to see from all this. Okay, is it some? Is it you people start getting taken more seriously? Well, here's the thing: the government could come out and do it. Jim Semivan has been very open about his experience, where him and his wife woke up in the bedroom and there were greys standing there. We need somebody like Jim Semivan to come out and actually talk publicly and say, "I was taken." My wife and I were taken. Yeah, but you know what though? Like, and, and this is actually something I wanted to, I wanted to talk to you about. And it kind of like it, it, it falls along the same lines. Right now, there are there are a surprising number of people who are really prickling at the fact that this new book talks about Lou Elizondo remote viewing. Yeah. And and it's and it's hurting his credibility. Mm-hmm. And it's, 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 it's causing people to doubt everything else he said. That's because the majority of the new, and that's an easy answer. The majority of the new wave of UFO researchers has never had an experience outside seeing blips in the sky. Right. Right. Okay. But my, but my point is, is it, is it, is it. Hey, Red Panda, how are you? Because you of that. Ufologist, good to see you. I am listening, John. Yeah, no, 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 no worries, no worries. Um, uh, because of that, it is it is it better if Semivan doesn't do that yet, because because well, he can do more three. good with his credibility intact. Dude, that's what phase three is. There's three it's, phases to this that I've been told. Right. Phase three is experiencers. We'll see. I hope so. The gorgeous Lady Blah Blah has returned. Oh, that's a great name. There she is. That's a super cool name. Hello, David John in the chat. Red Panda, we but, own the you know, We do. But the thing is, Dave, is it okay? Look, I mean, like, okay, there, there's a group of there's a group of experiencers that like I would love to see get put on on 
on a on a media tour and and you know just really introduce people to a certain aspects of what's going on right but let's face it man it's like there's a tremendous amount of this of of the data and the information that exists in the experiencer realm that um didn't if you have if you haven't been forced to experience it you don't want to learn about it it's not it's not fun to learn about it's not and 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 it and it uh it's it's like it's like i don't read sad books right i mean like 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 a lot of the public is just is not going to want to hear it because it's it's a lot of it's kind of awful mhm and, and and we can't force them to listen to it. No, you can't. I mean, John, it's it's the same thing as um, how can I put it here? Um, If you were all of a sudden thrust into your daughter's classroom to teach her kindergarten or grade one class, whatever she's in, would awesome. you know what to do? What? Would you know what to do? Uh, to, to a small degree. To a small degree, I would. Well, we all have a small degree, but you wouldn't know what to do. Neither would I. No, I could, I'd probably I'd watch a YouTube video class. first. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Rick West. Yeah. How you doing? Zen yeah, no, it, it, it's a hard job. I would struggle. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not about just starting a podcast and oh well, I like aliens and I like talking UFOs. I'm going to start a podcast. It's not like that. Okay. It's not well, like for, for for a lot of people it, it, it is. is that? <laughs> no, dude, I I understand that. I'm not saying it should be that way, but it is. I totally understand that. It, it's uh, but it's not like that though. Okay. What it is is it's really a it's really about trying to fit. Look, I'm not saying that every story that you hear is real. I question my own stories. I do. A lot of people do. Right? Yeah, but Dave, there's enough commonality through enough stories that statistically there are certain things that are definitely going on and they are not nice. Oh, I uh, dude, I Joey Hayes, how are you? Good morning in the UK. I understand that. There is some co a lot of commonality to it. Okay, there is a lot of commonality. Okay, but when you got to realize new ufology came out after Tom DeLong, which means we separate, we change the name of UFOs to UAP. All right, and we separate or we get told point blank by Lou Elizondo, Chris Mellon, and Tom DeLong, and everybody else that. Just because we're investigating UFOs doesn't mean it's alien. Yeah, well, which actually, I personally, I, 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 that's one of the reasons why I like the distinction of UFO and UAP because to me, UAP could include something interdimensional, could include something from that you know has always been here, could include all sorts of things. Whereas UFO, like for most people, pretty much paints the picture of a of a of a little green or gray alien inside a, a, a silver saucer, you know? Okay. But the point is, John, the point is somebody had to be flying that craft, whether it was remotely yes, or whether there was actually a being inside that craft. Yep. Okay. Whether it's from oh. a different, whether it's from a different dimension or whether it's from outer space or time travel. The third possibility people should start considering, though, is that the ships are actually conscious themselves. But 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 I but your point is the same. Mm -hmm. 
So what I'm getting at, John, is they're from a different realm. No matter where, let's just use the word realm as a as a catch-all. They're yep. from a different realm, and they are here. And when TTSA separated you, that hey, we're going to talk UFOs all day long, but we don't want any of that alien crap. We don't want that. The biggest reason why they did that, and I was told this, was because the, they didn't believe that people would understand people as in not you and I or the UFO community, but the mainstream people out there wouldn't be able to handle ETs. Yeah, yeah, and I, I mean, honestly, I, I. I... I think they were. I think they were right, and I'm actually I'm glad it went that way because, like a lot of these shows, these, these news broadcasts have enough trouble talking about what they are talking about. You start throwing in the, like, the is, complexity of aliens to it, and they'll get lost in the in the in the details. Okay, so I will tip you off to something that you do not know. Okay, you I have to do that more often than you realize, Dave. But go ahead. Okay, I had a conversation with certain people. And I and, and I was asked point blank by someone on a private phone call about how do we get people to start realizing that these things are not from here. And my answer was this. You get Chris Mellon and Lou Elizondo to stop talking about Russia or China. Okay. Which they they finally and, have done. And then about a week after that conversation, Lou's on the air and Chris is on a different station. And never once did they mention Russia or China. Yep. That was a good change. And only the media brought up the reporters asking the questions were the only ones who brought up Russia or China. Yep. Okay. But I must admit they they did in a way like they I, I think it was good that they said it. I don't think they should have said it for as long as they did, but I think it was good that they said it for a short period of time because you have to acknowledge to people that yes, we did consider the fact that it could have been them a, a, in in the process. We don't we no not longer consider that to be know, possible, but not when but, you already know it wasn't them. They already knew, John. Well, sure, but the thing is that for people that are, but for people that don't even think it's possible, you you have to walk. They have to see you walk the path that they're gonna ha that they're gonna walk, right? And so they want to see that you've considered the things that that they that they themselves would consider. So part of it is a it's an indoctrination, like kind well, of. Well, that's the narrative. Right? That's the narrative in controlling the media. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's part, and it's it's like the phase. It's like the phase one, two, and three, like you said. Like so, if phase three is 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 experiencers, then that means phase one had to be no aliens. Uh, I under I understand that, and I and, and I know where you're going with that. What I'm saying though, John, is that they needed to not use Russia or China right off the bat, and like you said, for as long as they did. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, like, because they already knew. So they played the media game. Yeah. Okay, they played the media game, which wasn't cool. What? Why wasn't it cool? Why? Because you're trying to control the narrative, and when you control the media, you control the message. The media is supposed to remain a, a real media is supposed to remain unbiased at all times and ask questions. The mainstream media they knew has always uh, shit on this topic. Okay, the the, the media has to res remain uh, unbiased, but and the 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 people the people supplying the news to the media, they're always going to do flow control. They're always going to only let out things that they that at at the timing they think they should, so that the no, public no. absorbs it carefully. No, okay. The job of the media is to ask direct questions. This is exactly what happened. And there's a lot of people who will disagree with me because the 99% of the people out there have no idea how the media works. 
okay? The media has always shit on this topic. They've never wanted to cover it. Correct. They got caught with their pants down when all yeah, this Elizondo gets trotted out and the media is like, holy shit, this is real. What do we do? How do we cover this? So what TTSA did in a brilliant move to control the UFO narrative on the mainstream was they said, don't worry about anything. Don't worry about the UFO community. We're going to give you the guys. We're going to give you Elizondo. We're going to give you Mellon. We're going to give you David Fravor. And for the first number of months, those are the only three people we saw on television and in newspapers. Yep. That's it. Yep. So a proper media, John, and if the former uh, so-called PR person for the SCU or if MUFON wasn't dropping the fucking ball on things, okay, <laughs> they would have been putting out press releases to the mainstream media and say, talk to us. We have answers too. We can give you a differing opinion and statistics of what is going on. Now, at that time, the SCU was trying to remain very quiet. MUFON, and I've talked to Tom uh, Whitmore about this, who is a very good friend of mine and on the board of directors. Okay. Yeah, and a good guy, a really and good a guy. Very good guy. Okay. MUFON didn't have their crap together when they needed to be. They had waited 50 years for this moment and they dropped the ball. So, so, but, ba but based on the conversation we've been having, what, what, what that would then suggest is that either TTSA or, or people within that TTSA circle, it would have made sense for them to have reached out to people like MUFON, no. SETI, SCU, and asked them to Not zip it. Job. The TTSA. I, I, I'm not saying they. I'm not saying they should have done it. But what I'm saying is that it, it, it would have been their best interest to do so. Do you? Did they do that? No. No. So, so the SCU and Mufon stayed quiet on their own. Yes. The media. If the media understood this story, so give me an example, John. Okay. If if you have a story of some longshoreman union president who is who is threatening to shut down the ports because of contract negotiations. Mm -hmm. You just don't do the story on the union president who is threatening to, to lock down the ports of Seattle. Okay. Yeah, you okay. okay. go to the government, okay, and get the counterpoint and say, hey, the, the, the longshoreman uh, uh, union president is talking about threatening uh, to shut down your ports. What are you doing about it? You don't just right. run half a story. But the media, uneducated about this subject never wanting to cover this subject, already pre-programmed that everybody who sees UFOs works the night shift at the 7-Eleven, has no dental plan, lives in mom and dad's basement, and has never made more than minimum wage in his life because the government has screwed him or her or they, okay? That's the interpretation of the people who cover UFOs by the mainstream media or look into this stuff. So when all of a sudden it was announced that this crap is real, the media went, oh my God, what do we do? TTSA says, don't worry about it, buddy. We got you covered. We got the fighter pilot who chased the Tic Tacs. We okay, have... But... No, hear me well, out one... for a second. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, I got the conch. We got, fr we got the guy who ran the program at the Pentagon. We got the guy who worked internally with two presidents. And as a bonus factor, we have a former senator who is now coming out in a state with Area 51 coming out saying, we need to spend some money on this. So media, a.k.a. Fox, a.k.a. New York Times, which if you look at Leslie Kane, as great of a reporter as she is on this subject, is highly tied to individuals like Robert Bigelow. Yeah. Okay and others yep. to provide a biased side of this story. Oh, yes. Okay. That's where the issue was. 
TTSA provided the media with everything that they need. Oh, you need, all right. And this is why the media never chased anything down because your job as a reporter in a newsroom is to chase down the story, get a different perspective. Okay. So what people should be questioning is why didn't the New York Times write a follow-up article for the next day? There was one written. Why didn't they run it? All right. Because the so, so you're you're more upset about the way the media just laid down and just took whatever they were fed than you are that the TTSA tried to feed them a curtailed diet. Like them feeding them feeding them a curtailed diet may, may, happens all the time, but Absolutely. the media should have gone after them or, or chased the story. This and, is and TTSA that's because that's their job. It's not the TTSA's fault. It's not whatsoever. Okay, what the TT, the TTSA laid the groundwork and basically said, you don't need to worry about anything. We've already given you the, the main players in the field. Right. Okay. Yet nobody from the SCU was contacted. Nobody from MUFON was contacted. Nobody from MUFON Canada up here was contacted. Richard Dolan was nowhere to be seen. The late Stanton Friedman, who is still alive at this point, wasn't interviewed by mainstream. And there's a guy who spent numerous hours talking UFOs with Larry King. All right. They didn't come to anybody because they didn't know what to do. Now, now is, is, is some of this is some of this normal from the point of view of like when a like for example, when a when a when a war first breaks out, it's very common for, for people to support it and for people to believe what they're being told. And then after a short period of time you know, people become less uh, in awe of it and they start asking questions and then stuff starts coming out. And so it, ta it takes a little while for people to start really, is, is, is that part of what's going on? No, the media, the media's job is, is to ask the public questions. If, if you, I remember my instructor and this is going back 25 years, hard to believe it's been that long. Okay. One of the first le lessons we learned in broadcasting school was this, your job as a journalist is to be the eyes and ears and the protectors of the public. You are yes. the public's police. All right. I wholeheartedly you agree. Are, you are, you help become the judge, the jury, and potentially the executioner. Now the media has shifted a lot since then. It's become a lot more clickbait. It's become a lot more infotainment. Yep. It's become a lot more uh, social media uh, hype thanks to Twitter. Twitter changed the media game big time. You talk to my buddy Bruce Claggett, he'll tell you that Twitter absolutely killed mainstream media. All right? Twitter and Facebook killed mainstream media because people wanted everything right now. Okay, I got it. Let's move on. Next. Okay. It's just like you see trends on Facebook or TikTok or whatever. How many people after Ryan uh, Reynolds comes out with the, the Grace Kelly song with Will Ferrell, how, how all, all of a sudden social media, YouTube, TikTok is filled with people trying to do their versions. Previous to that, going way back to Facebook where everybody had to take a picture of their fucking meal and post what they were eating that day. Oh, that was annoying. That was so annoying. That was so, okay. But, okay, no, but, they, but now, but, but here's my here's my one question. My, my, I know I have a gazillion questions, but the question I'm going to ask, and and part of this is very personal because um, uh, one of the one of the places I might end up joining is 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 specifically in this business. Uh, that is that, um, and I know this may be hard for you to answer for, uh, sitting in Canada, but if you if you look at the U.S. from from where you're sitting. The type of the type of employees that an organization would have that would do this kind of work, this kind of exploratory, um, pushing buttons, looking for angles, that you know, that kind of investigate would I mean would that be called investigative journalism? Is that is that a proper name for it? Yes. Okay. So, um, who still employs investigative journalists? 
barely anybody, only newspapers. So maybe that's that's maybe that's maybe that's the problem. Well, no, it is. Uh, I shouldn't uh, quickly been so quick to say no. It's part of the problem. But I'm going to give you an example too. As media has become more corporate, mainstream news and how it affects people in their daily lives doesn't matter anymore. And I'll give you a prime example of this. Everybody who's listening to this right now, who's been listening to my show for a while, or at least since the beginning of summer, knows that my town was surrounded by forest fires this year. And they know that I could be evacuated at any time. Okay? One of our television stations here provincially did a 45-second to one-minute story on the forest fires in our area. But they followed that up. The next following story was about an impromptu fashion show that shut down a Vancouver street, a main Vancouver thoroughfare, so people could show off their weird fashions that wasn't expected to happen. And they did a four-minute piece on that. Now, what's more important? People losing their houses, their livelihoods, or a fashion show, an impromptu fashion show in downtown Vancouver that shuts down a major street? Okay? That's the problem with media. Is they the media outlets are all in these epicenters, okay? And because society is changing in order to get younger people viewing because uh, media numbers and news numbers are down significantly and advertisers are paying more money than they've ever paid before for that short amount of time. So what they need to try and do is they need to try and get as many younger viewers as possible. The younger viewers of today, the social media crowd of today does not want hard news anymore. It makes them feel bad. This is why we need safe rooms. Yeah, okay. no, I, I, I stopped. I mean, basically, I, I used to consume, I, I used to, like, no, like no joke, I used to consume about three to four hours of, of news a day, primarily political. Like, yeah. that, was, that was primarily what I did. And, uh, and, and, and I, I, every night, every night, and, uh, and finally, what I came to realize was that was that it, it was bad for me. Yeah, it was really bad for me, and, and but, so I stopped watching it. And I've I've felt a lot better since then. But the job of the news is not to make you feel good; it's to tell you about the realities. Okay, and what they do is every so often a story like that girl, they like that uh, girl uh, who got murdered by her boyfriend because they were they were living that new camp. Uh, camping lifestyle, they take up the trend. And the media forgets about all the other people, including the indigenous women who have gone missing for decades. Right? And, but the problem is, the media has also figured out that the young, the 30 and, and younger crowd, for the most part, they all want to, the media wants to be all woke. That we're with that younger crowd. Fashion shows are more important than people's livelihoods burning down. And reality. We're not supposed to play reality anymore as media. Well, what they're supposed to, what, what they now believe they're supposed to do is is, is show content that's going to sell ads. Absolutely. And so right. that, I mean, that's the main goal is, is to sell ads. It's not to deliver news. Right. The job of the, the 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 everyday reporting is over. It's over, and it's sad because there's not a single outlet out there. Okay, so for people listening, I'll tell you right now, the media is not bought by the government or told what can run and what cannot run. That is the biggest bullshit conspiracy theory out there. 
There's no government agent sitting in newsrooms across North America looking over scripts saying, oh, that one talks about uh, a government issue. Can't run that. So there, there are there are one off there are one off situations Super where, where the happening? U.S. government will reach out to someone like the New York Times and ask them to to delay an article or to to alter something in primarily in times of war, mm-hmm. and that 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 does happen, but it's not it's not like a common thing. And it's, it's not like a built in thing. And it's not like they have like CIA on staff that have lunch with them. And like, you know, but, but I just, I, I think that's, I think that's, I think that's where the source of a lot of the rumors come from is that we do know that these, these things do happen once in a while and people assume that they happen all the time. And it's, what it's, I'm saying it's is rare. there's that famous scene in Good Morning Vietnam where Robin Williams wants to read the news and the guys are the, the two uh, twin brothers are editing what he can and cannot read. That's not true in a newsroom. No, but it's so it's funny though. But yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, okay. no, no, no. But what no. I am saying, John, is when it comes to UFOs, let's get back on topic here for a second. When it comes to UFOs, the mainstream media, because I've been in the newsroom where those UFO calls happen, and we made fun of those people. And I'm now one of those people. I remember calling up my newsroom. And my buddy, this was a few years after I had quit, all right? And my buddy, John, who was still working there, answered. I said, hey, John, has there been any strange reports of UFOs over Mission, where I lived? What are you smoking, Dave? (laughs) How much have you had to drink tonight? I said, John, I'm serious. My friends and I were sitting on the wall. We saw some lights. Dave, I used to party with you in Vancouver at the Roxy. Okay. Be honest with me. John, I'm serious. No, we haven't had anything come in. But if they, if those aliens come back, you, you call us, okay? That was my friend. Hmm. My friend. But I mean, I, I think that was I think I mean this one more place I will get very I will get a little conspiracy heavy, and that is that I I really believe that that that, that was the result of of a overly successful process that essentially at some time in the past, and I don't know when this was, the U S government worked very, very hard to convince everyone that UFOs should be made fun of. And they succeeded. They succeeded beautifully and they succeeded generationally. Absolutely. In the meantime, back then though, the U S government was also mopping up any whistleblowers. Yes. Okay, but when it comes to like getting back to what we're seeing today in regards to the media, give it give me an example, John. When the DNI report came out, and the DNI report said we only look back to the Nimitz incident in two thousand and four, not a single reporter or journalist or television anchor asked, "What about Roswell? What about Phoenix?" Yep. Okay. But I, I got to say, and I, I don't want to go into details because I don't want this to get political at all. But the, the thing is, is that we're in the U.S., we are seeing the same thing with many, many, many other things. Like there's a lot of stuff going on in, in Congress right now where we hear about it and we're like, wait, 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 what? That's a big freaking deal. Like what? Why isn't anything happening? The one of the reasons why it's not happening is because there's no one putting pressure on them like they used to. Like you used to see reporters go nuts Absolutely. and like go after people for any kind of anything. And now no one's doing it. All right. Uh, Zaxonite says, nope, MSM is compromised. How? How? I, I'm curious. And if it, and Zach said, if you've ever worked in a newsroom where you've had a government official tell you what you can and cannot run, please let me know. And we the can only, talk privately about it. The only other thing I, I I have I have heard personally I have personally run into is 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 very it's not it's not it's not like operational it's more just um, habitual in that in every newsroom you will have one or two people that come from military family. 
They come from an intelligence family and they feel strongly about, about the U.S. government. And so they might be someone who, um, you know, like leaks someone to something or, or they might be someone who, you know, like, you know, has some kind of an inside track. But that doesn't mean that they have any direct influence. It doesn't mean that they have control. It doesn't mean that they're getting paid for it. It doesn't mean that they're like this, like, you know, paid informant. It just means that they're sympathetic to to the government and so if they can help them out they might you know do them a favor journalism has has forgotten how to ask a lot of tough questions yes okay yeah that's the problem we don't want to offend anybody anymore you know what journalists journalist job and you can ask ross coltart this a journalist job and this and let me preface this by saying This is why I absolutely hate, hate, hate and get really offended by people in the UFO world who make up the title as I'm a journalist and they've never been a journalist in their life. Because the job of the media, if you are reporting on something, is to ask uncomfortable questions. Yes. Okay. Nobody from the president of the United States, politely, but Canada, yes, on down, should be comfortable in front of a camera. You shouldn't. Yeah. All right. And like, for instance, hey, it's fine that if, say, Obama or Clinton or Bush, they go on Jimmy Kimmel or Jimmy Fallon or somebody like that. And they have the quite like they have to pro, in order to get them on the they have to be pre provided with the questions beforehand and there's no derivation off the script. Okay, I get that. Totally get it. But when it comes to this subject, and I want to keep it straight on UFOs. I don't want to go off on any more topics like that, um, like we have. But when it comes to UFOs. The media didn't has not portrayed the other side of the story. And shame on them for doing that. Shame yep. on them for not getting uh Grant Cameron or Melinda Leslie or or whomever. It doesn't matter who it is. Or, so, or just doing some invest just do, do, like I mean, to me, Ross Coltart is has been such um in, in many ways an awakening experience for me because it's it's He's reminded me of what I'm, what I was used to, right? He's reminded me of, of what, like, like he pushes, but he he well, finds cracks. He he actually tries. Absolutely, a ufologist says no. I disagree. They want to ask those questions, but can't they have a script to follow or not have a job? Uh, there is zero proof of this, and I and I I politely disagree with you ufologist as someone who has worked in a newsroom i've never been uh asked to follow a script or lose my job ever and and what we saw what we saw at least in the u.s was you know you take the 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 press corps uh, you know in 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 washington which once again should be a group asking ufo questions right and for like three years they stopped having them (laughs) Mm-hmm. Right, they just canceled now, them. Now I look, mean, it's like Excaliperful brings up a good question. Project Veritas proved how a lot of the manipulation happens. ABC hid the Epstein story because the royal family was going to shut them out during the Markle period, and that's quite possible. Okay, there's a lot of games being played. That's why I'm saying corporate media is not healthy because they're more worried about the bottom dollar. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, they're more worried about the bottom dollar than they are about getting the stories done. We saw this change coming uh, back in the mid-90s, early 2000s, because in Vancouver, we had a news station who was number one for years by a mile. And they were bought out by a corporation called Chorus. And one of the first things they did was they fired all of their investigative reporters. 
and they hired a bunch of kids and no names out of out of college or small towns to come on in and start doing the news. Now, what problem did they believe they were trying to solve by doing that? Do you have any idea? Like, what were they what were they uh, trying to well, achieve well, by doing that? It's all about profit. Okay. So if you have a kid coming out of uh, broadcasting school. Uh, pay him less. Yeah, you could pay. So you could have a senior reporter making $75,000 a year. Or you can you can uh, lose a little bit of the investigative reporting because it's uh, news has become more clickbait. All right. And you can hire a kid out of out of college, green out of college, train them the way you want for thirty thousand dollars a year. You've saved forty eight thousand on the budget. Now, if you do that for. Seven people, eight people. Right. right. All right. My buddy Bruce just got it uh, with with uh, five other veterans, including the veteran weatherman who had been there for 20 years. There was no reason to fire them. But what these media outlets do is when you hit a certain age and you are making a certain amount of money, they cut you. Hello, gorgeous Becky Anglin. How are you? And Light 1978, nice to see you. Okay, so then, Dave, with all this said, right, and, and and yes, I I I completely one hundred percent agree with you that I would I would absolutely love for all these quote unquote uh, news producing entities to go back to how they were and hire a bunch of investigative reporters that will crawl up the noses of of every story that they can get. I would love to see that happen, and who knows, maybe it will. I I have to admit, I'm not hopeful, but let, I, I'm let's say let's let but let's just say it's not going to happen for now. Then doesn't, then doesn't that mean that at some level, instead of looking at Twitter, just using Twitter as an example, as, as something that, that is problematic, we should be looking at how Twitter can be used to, to, uh, to basically fill a similar role. Uh, I really, John, I'm going to, I'm going to defer that question. And the reason why I'm going to defer that question is because then we're going to get into the whole social media backlash of banning profiles. Well, true. But the reason why I ask it specifically is because in, in, in the, in, in Twitter as an example, there are certain topics that Twitter is incredibly useful for. And there are other well, topics where it's not right. Twitter originally Twitter was brought into the fold to allow people to communicate in 140 or, and tell the news and like for news outlets to tell their news in 140 characters or less. But Twitter went and caught on and became a, a major social media platform. Okay. Where people every day were, were using it because maybe they didn't like Facebook. They found it quicker. The news was happening quicker. Everything was moving faster. Yep. Okay. That's where all of a sudden you saw, especially in United States journalism, where you saw a lot of reporters quickly getting the news out because being first was more important than being accurate. And yeah. that's where you saw a lot of these news reporters all of a sudden going on Twitter saying, you know, we're looking for, uh, there's, there's 14 people shot at the shopping mall. Uh, we're, they're looking for a, a black man driving a, a, a stolen vehicle. It looks like a silver sedan. And in the meantime, the police are chasing down a white guy who is driving a, a black yeah. Ford pickup. Yeah. Although you, you would sometimes see it evolve over time, right? But um, the fact uh, is for... real journalism. You don't, you don't report on, on, on rumors. You don't run, uh, rumors, okay. run confirmation. Okay. That's the, that's the, the big thing. 
So people people got too too lured in by the 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 awe of being of getting their articles out first and stopped exactly. doing the proper investigation. Because when you're first, and you can go to your advertisers, hey, we were first on this story, first on that story. Remember that story of the of the hotel that burned down, killing thirty seven people. We were first to report on that. That creates money. It creates ratings, and ratings create money. So accuracy took the fall for ratings and money. Yep. Yep. And you, you know the irony is, Dave, is it your your return for ads <laughs> online? It's it's so bad. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's so. But but my question to you is, is that but if you take the UFO topic for example, the UFO topic, I find. Twitter is very, very, very useful, very, very, very useful for getting news in real time. Like, I mean, you, 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 know like, they, they, you can off? find out things fast. Do you know what made Twitter take off when LeBron James joined Twitter? Hmm. When LeBron James and true story, when LeBron James joined Twitter, so he could communicate with the fans easier. So he said, okay, that's when, that's when all of a sudden the day of the influencer started. And that's when everybody started jumping on Twitter because if LeBron was on there, I need to be on there because I want to know what LeBron is saying. I want to know what kind of toilet paper he uses. I want to know what he had for dinner. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I want to know what he's wearing. And there's a small chance that you might get it, you might get to interact with them and that there's there's a, there's like a lottery like blackjack mindset that rolls into that like i always have a chance that elon might respond to my my message you know absolutely oh dude it, everybody gets excited when a blue check mark follows them on twitter i get excited all right cuz i don't know have any <laughs> i know in the twitterverse in the Twitterverse, the more blue check marks that are are following our show is good for our show because you can check anybody's followers. Interesting. Okay, and if the more verified accounts you have on your profile that are following you, the better. Because if if you all of a sudden say like if you look through our followers, we maybe have maybe 50, 60 blue check marks that follow us, maybe less. I don't know, maybe more. Okay, but every time I get followed by a blue check mark, oh yeah, that's a good day for me. I, I totally want to go check now. I don't, I've never paid attention to how many blue check marks I have following me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Because here's the thing, dude. And I will use, let's pick a name. Let's pick Demi Lovato, since we were talking about her earlier. Do you know what, and she follows zero on Twitter. Zero. Does she? Yes. She follows zero? She follows That's zero. That's not very nice. Okay. What I'm saying is, if Demi Lovato all of a sudden started following spaced out radio yeah what would that yeah. do for us that'd be a big deal our our social media account all demi would have to say to her followers is follow at spaced out radio yep and just like that overnight we're probably yep. going to get 10 million followers yep <clears throat> okay that's the that even happened with lou and that that book that old book about the seaside, whatever it was, like yeah. when he first told everyone to read it, it was like five bucks or something. And and within a couple of weeks, it was selling for 500. Yeah. He felt horrible. He said he felt horrible about it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Or if you see, uh, like Ryan Reynolds is really hot on Twitter right now. And so yeah, he's, and, and he's funny sudden, too. If all of a sudden he says, I'm going to Taco Bell and takes a picture of him at the Taco Bell drive through and says, Hey, what do you want? Yep. Or another one, 
going back. There was in- actually there was just a case. There was just a case, Dave, in in Europe a couple months ago where a major um, uh, football, sorry, soccer player um, was at a press event, and he always had a coke next to him. And he did this one press event, and at this one press event, he had a bottle of water instead of a coke. And a, and according to what I read, Coke lost like a billion dollars in sales because of that one event. That's what they claimed mm-hmm. because, because that, because everyone looked at him as a, I guess, I, as a reason to drink Coke. I, I don't understand how this works. All yeah. I'm saying is that to your idea, to your, to support what you're saying, that's how much influence they have. Well, Pepsi had their two highest sales ever when Michael Jackson was wrapping them. And then when Britney Spears was wrapping them back in when Britney was still normal. <sighs> Okay. But that, that, that's just that's just our celebrity. That's just the way we, we now treat celebrity celebrities like royalty. I mean, that's a cultural problem. Nina, thank you so much for your Krona. Norwegian Krona. Appreciate that. Thank you. Big fan of your show, Dave. Love your guests. And you are the best radio host out there. Oh, thank you. Really enjoy listening to your conversations with John. Really interesting. Thank you so much. Really. And and thank you for spelling my name correctly. I appreciate that. (laughs) But I mean, don't you, don't you see, like, I I guess what I'm trying to get at is it, don't you be, because, because everything you've been saying is true, because the, the mainstream media has done such a piss poor job of reporting on UFOs and they have for so long and there's a, there's many reasons for that occurring but we can agree that it's occurring that essentially twitter has essentially perhaps stepped in poorly but has stepped in to become a a good news source for ufo information like if if i want to if i want to find out something's happening in the ufo community twitter is a great place to find out absolutely Absolutely it is. It's a dangerous place to find out, right? But that's, but if you look at, okay, if you look at Twitter, okay, the old guard is nowhere on Twitter. You rarely see Grant Cameron post on UFO Twitter or Richard Dolan or Melinda Leslie or. uh, And when they do, it's not actually them. Melinda Leslie actually controls her own account on Twitter, but Mm -hmm. Grant and Richard, they're not the ones I don't know who does that for them, but someone else does that for them. Yeah, but they're not in the game. You know no. what I'm saying? No, 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 no. The young ufologist game. All right. Lou 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 engages. But, um, but Lou is okay. John, you can't you gotta remember Lou is still new UFO. He's not old. Oh, agreed. No, 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 agreed, agreed. No, I I, I agree. I agree. Right. I agree. Name I agree. Is Ellen. All right. But the flip side is all those people you're talking about, they're actually very active on Facebook. And I, I got to be honest, like I found that really annoying in the beginning. So I was like, really? I have to go like, like, like sleaze around Facebook just so I can like talk to these people. But I got to tell you, it worked. I'm friends with Ralph Blumenthal now on Facebook. <laughs> mm-hmm. Blew my mind because he's on there, right? You know, it's like, a, you know, at, but that's the thing is certain certain cultures hang out in certain areas right so yeah the the older folk they tend to gravitate toward facebook so if you yeah. if you want to engage with with that with that realm of people you go to facebook if you want to engage with another realm you go to twitter there's another group that if you want to engage you have to go to instagram yeah i uh, no i i fully understand that but that's just that's just culture Right. I mean, so to my point of view, like what we have to do is, is look at, look at each of those, look at what they, what they can do well, what they don't do well, and then figure out how can we use them best to get out high quality information about this topic. But what's the high quality information? If there's a narrative, we don't know. Well, the fact that there's a narrative doesn't mean that the information is not quality. It means it's it's it means it's manicured. It's manicured and skewed towards towards pushing people to believe one vision. 
John, I mean, that opens up an entire conspiracy theory that's out there. And that was that many of the UFO young guns were, I don't want to say bought or paid off, okay? But that many of the UFO young guns, not, uh, and I'm not saying like like 40 or 50, because all it takes is two to five that can do it. Yep. Okay. Were paid off by TTSA one way or another in order to create the the yep. the the content that is on there. Well, and, and this already exists in other places. Like you go to the networking world, right? And Juniper, Cisco, all those companies, they have advocates on Twitter that for the most part started out as just end users that really loved their product. Yeah. But eventually they get indoctrinated into the marketing engine and they become spokespeople to push ideas that that, that company cares about. I had, a and, con- I had a company contact me yesterday. Okay. Okay. I'm not going to say their name because I don't want to give them any advertisement. Contact me yesterday saying, we love your show. And I could tell it was just a, a, uh, a shtick kind of thing that they send mm-hmm. to everybody. We love your show. We'd love for you to rep our product. But it's going to cost you $75 in order to purchase your first product. And then your next one would be free. And by the way, anybody of your audience who who comes on in and uses a promo code with your name on it, okay, will give you 25% of the profit. Oh, you know, I, I know I know of some other YouTube channels that, that, that do this sort of thing. Yeah. That that's interesting. I so that's that where that message. comes from. I sent them a message. I said, hold on a second here. You want me to pay you to advertise your product in hope that one day I may break even with my audience to buy your ball shaver. (laughs) Oh, and they, and they basically try to lure you in by saying that you'll get a percentage of the, of the, of the, of the cut. I said, I said, if you'd like to buy some time on my, on my show, you're more than welcome. Right? You're more than welcome. Buy some oh, time. Oh, man. That's just... Right? Man, that's just... Uh... Okay, but Dave, but, but the thing is, is it is it if... Okay, so to me, you, I, I always assume that the government has a narrative, at, at least one, right? Because from their point of view, a narrative is just a strategy, right? I, I, I assume that every company is going to have a narrative that they are trying to convince the market to believe, right? Absolutely. And, and competing companies have competing narratives, right? But the- and so, so I guess my point is, is that the, the problem here isn't so much that there is a narrative at play or that one narrative is dominating other narratives. The problem is, is that the 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 media is so bloody weak that they're not able to push back against that narrative. And podcasting, to add to that, podcasting has made the narrative easier for any subject or advertising for any subject. Right. Okay. I right. have approached companies previous and said, hey, I notice you're advertising all over social media. Would you like to advertise on Spaced Out Radio? And I have been and I have been told point blank, sure, we'll send you some some supplies. Because everybody in podcasting, hang them on your wall, trying to make a name for ourselves. Everybody in podcasting or YouTube or whatever, they want to make sure. Um, they want to make sure that they can get whatever they can to build their name. And if you have a podcast with, say, 900 followers on, on YouTube and you get a sponsor that you paid seven, you prepaid for, you paid them to advertise their product. That's how backwards things are now. 
And what people don't understand is that when you do that and you're small and you grow bigger, it's very hard to go back to them and renegotiate. <laughs> you, you, you tend to get kind of locked into that relationship. That's, oh man. And so basically, oh man, like this is the whole thing. Like, like one of the things you learn when you're working with like sales folk in, in, in the tech industry is, is it, it's, it's everyone's responsibility to fight for their program, fight for their money, fight for their bonuses. Because if any one of you give in and let a company take advantage of you, it hurts everybody. Well, and it's for the same reason. If you're sitting with a million subscribers, you take Mr. Beast who is sitting with 71 million subscribers on YouTube and they're asking you to pay 75 bucks and you get 25% commission on every sale out of those 71 million subscribers, you're going to make a boatload of money, a boatload of money. Yeah, you really could. 75. Yeah, you, it's, like, yeah. it's like, you know, st stepping over a $5 bill to pick up a 20. Yeah. Okay. That's what it's like. But some, for somebody like our size, it's stepping over a $5 bill to pick up a nickel. Right. Okay. Uh, a few th things here. Hey, Iron Tusk, how are you? Big J, or good to see you. Scotty Brown, hard to get good info out when some researchers are put pushing mythology. Expand on that, buddy. Expand on that. But you know, but the you know the w one thing that I I I I don't I don't know how to mitigate, and, and I don't know what, if this is what he's getting at, but it just maybe think of it because I was going to say it earlier is that when be because the the people that that spread news on Twitter get used to a certain cadence, when 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 a vacuum gets created for whatever reason, because, you know, because Lou gets on a podcast and says, we've decided to throttle back for a little while. Right. Mm -hmm. um, that, that vacuum causes people to, um, to, to make, to make leaps. It causes people to, to inject their own opinions. It causes people to make their own predictions because they're, they're, they're frustrated by the vacuum. And so it causes more people to spread bullshit basically. Well, and it, it's, it's John, frustrating. Is, I'll read to you what I said to this company. Okay. So this is what they sent me. All right. Uh, they said, we have a few spaces left on our ambassador campaign and would love it if you were on board. If you accepted, if accepted, you would receive a free $75 grooming kit with your first purchase. Would you, we would feature you across all of our platforms to a huge amount of people so that your content grows at the same time as ours. Signing up only takes a couple of minutes and accept, if accepted, you should receive an email from the founder of this company. There are many benefits, such as being represented on our social media and, uh, uh, and website. You can create a customized discount code for you to share with your fans to give them discounts off our products while you earn commission. We pay out 25% for you to you for each purchase through that code or link. You will also get exclusive access to pre-releases and sneak peeks and they make it sound good. So I and, said, you know, and I got to say, if they can, if they can toss, if they can toss someone 25% like that, that means they're looking, they're sitting at probably like 85 points of margin. Like, yeah. I mean, they, they got Absolutely. fat profit in that product. Absolutely. So I so said, just toss 25% out. My God. So my response was, hold on a second here. Am I reading this right? Do you want me to pay for my first product and advertise your product for free on my show? And if any listeners use a promo code, I get a small percentage of that. Now, normally, have sale. Uh, now, normally with sales work, you you would give me the product for free, then <laughs> give me a promo code where any of my listeners purchase your product. I get a percentage of that. That is something I would look at on a three to six month contract basis. But if you think I am paying for your product, then hoping that my listeners purchase your product with a promo code where you're going to uh, where you're going to piss me off on a mere 25%, then that's not good business for me to take up. 
I am more than willing and open to talk about negotiating on this. If you want, I am more than willing to open up to your product and to uh, open up your product to my listeners. But can but let me ask you a question, Dave. So, w- what if what if what if someone could look into a magic ball, and that and they could show you that that if you did this, y- yes, you you would you would you might lose a little money or you might barely break even. Uh, yes, you know, yes, all the things you said might happen, but in six months, your subscriber rate would double. Would that change your opinion at all? I'm not. I'm not even saying that's possible. I'm just curious. I'm just uh, like, like, like. Are there other things still, that these things bring people that might be worth, worth the, worth the bad deal? Okay. I have already, but you see, here's the thing: we already have experience with that with my buddy's company, Mighty Moose Beard Oil. I know. I, I'm not going to say because it's, it's not my place to say. But I know how many of our client uh, of our listeners through my advertising have bought his product, and it's not as many as you think. No, but see, to me that one's that one's to me that one's very different, and 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 that to me that what, to me is the kind of advertising I want to see because you actually maybe you're faking it really well, but you actually seem to actually really like that product. Oh, I do like, like the that's cool. Like, I like that. Like, I mean, I think that's really neat. Like, if you really like something, then you know, totally. I mean, you know, do business with them. I think that's kind of awesome, right? But I don't pay for the product, right? Right, 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 right. I'm not paying an upfront fee, right? Now, l- now, let me ask you something like if, if you, if there was, um, uh, like if, if there was something like, like, uh, like, like Melinda Leslie's, um, tour thing that she does, right. Yeah. If there was something like that n- near you. Okay. Um, how would you feel about, about doing something with them? Like, w- is, would that, would that be crossing the line? No. As long as they paid for it. We're a business, right? We're an entertainment business. Hmm. But th- I mean, the thing is, Dave, is it, is it, I, I guess what I'm really curious about is it, you know, like, I mean, there's a lot of things that have gone away over the last, you know, 20 years that, that I, I'm sorry went away that, that I miss. Right. But like most of them aren't coming back. And so what I typically find is the best way to go about it is to, is realize that when there's, when there's a real need for something, like there's like a like society really has a need for something and the what's was providing it disappears it takes a little while but after a small period of time other things appear that that, that can do something similar it's it's rarely as good i will admit it's it's rarely as as good as it was but it it gets you you know 80% there sort of a thing right and so to me it 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 almost seems like the the better thing to do is is like what i said earlier which is that you know, what we should be doing is, is looking at, you know, looking at, you know, all the different platforms that exist and, and, and asking ourselves, okay, you know, I hate to use the word narrative, but you know, what, what, what kind of, what kind of, you know, message do we want to be putting out? What sort of information do we want to be putting out? What kind of data do we want to be sharing and, and what tools are going to provide us the the most, the most influence for the for the least amount of of resources. You know what I'm saying? I mean, to me, it's 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 like everyone should be saying, okay, what? How can how can Twitter help the UFO movement, and how can it not? Right? And you know, I mean, I think that um, you know, I I think that you know, a, a good example is I think that you know what you know how the how that big call home evolved, right? Yeah. And and what it did, like that was cool. Right. Like, I mean, that was, that was neat. You know, like, I think that was, I think that's good stuff. And that's something that you wouldn't have gotten from, you know, a newspaper or something like that, you know? No, but uh, you got to realize UFO Twitter, if you look at UFO Twitter is mainly filled with people who are, like I said to you earlier, who are, uh, 
who are new to the new to the subject for the most part. Yeah. Okay. Um, that UFO Twitter has been uh, pushing a single narrative since the beginning, and that's the TTSA narrative. And dude, I remember, you know, if back when I would, and I wasn't even attacking TTSA. Okay. I was just putting up honest questions and I would get lambasted by 30, 40, 50 people, some of them with multiple profiles who were who were using multiple profiles to attack because I had a question about why there was a press conference with no press. Yeah, but that's changed now. I mean, it, 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 it's, I mean, they yeah, there's still, there's, what's it again? They've, UFO Twitter has grown up a lot, but the fact is a lot of them are not asking, like the landscape in UFO, in ufology right now is changing so quickly. And if you look at it now, what was once the original UFO Twitter, now you are seeing a bunch of clicks forming. So, for instance, George Knapp, who I idolize, okay, has a click of, of people working with him. Jeremy Corbell, Danny Silva, Joe Mergia, James Iandoli. Yep. All right. That's a pretty strong click. Yep. All right. But they're all on the same page, and they're all feeding each other information. Yep. Whether you love... Whether you love them or not, yep. doesn't matter. They're doing the job. Yep, they and and that's why I consider it. I consider I consider one of my jobs to be to play so fair and play so evenly that I ha that I create the ability to bridge a relationship with each one of those clicks without having to be a card carrying member of each let me, one. Let me give you a, a good example of this, John. Do you remember on this show when I asked Lou Elizondo what he thought of being considered about like a demigod to UFO Twitter? Do you remember that? Uh, yeah, but I'm not not super clearly, but I, I do remember that happening. All right. And he said, and the reason why I asked that question is when I talked to him before the show, I asked him point blank. I said, how do you feel about in our pre-interview phone call? I said, how do you feel about being kind of a demigod to the UFO world. And he's like, I, I really am uncomfortable with it. I really a am. Anyone really should so, be. I mean, anyone that loves that. So you know, probably a few got weeks wrong. ago, a few weeks ago, I challenged somebody on that about Lou doesn't like being, uh, being treated like a demigod by UFO Twitter. Right. And I got hammered over it. <clears throat> and even when I stated <clears throat> that this was, where they're like, where, where the hell are you getting this? I'm getting it from Lou. Lou, the man himself. Okay. And this is, and this is how you are. You're, you're attacking me for saying something that you don't agree with that Lou said. Dave, I, 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 I want to posit something. Okay. I want, I want, I want to suggest sure. a possibility. So, so like the other day, it was a couple weeks ago, like, um, uh, uh, the the guy uh, I don't know what he, what he goes by now, but UFO Jesus um, uh, posted something about um, Ross or something, and 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 you uh, you responded to him, and your response was like what what you were saying was dead on, but the the way you phrased it was like I was really happy that he didn't like he didn't seem to take offense to it because. I, the way you phrase it, I think I think a fair number of people might have, and so part of me wonders if just because you're not used to interfacing with people like on that platform, if if perhaps some of what's causing you to get the backlash you get is 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 has something to do with like tone or has something to do with with phrasing because uh, no. like, like I, that was. That was a complete shot over the bow. I know the tweet you're talking about. And the way I wrote that was specific. It's called doing his job. 
Right. Yeah. But okay. Okay. But so, so why, so why did you phrase it that way? Uh, because of the way that Ryan had stated it, number right. one, and the way that people had responded to Ryan's comments. So right. it needed more of an authoritarian type of response on that. But it looked like you were trying to pick a fight. No. If if he would have responded, I would have explained. Yeah, but to say I it was a shot over the bow, right? <laughs> like, like it just it it didn't it 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 seemed confrontational. John, everything seems confrontational for you. You're from California. Yeah, and it also means that I like, on Twitter, I don't see any negativity. It wasn't, I have a really it, nice time on Twitter. It was, and, and but it wasn't. Yeah, I know. But I'm just saying, is it, is it you, you talk about having a very negative experience on Twitter? No, I never said that. I never said that. Okay. What I said was when when it was when I was questioning about Lou's uh uh demigod or before when i would put out pertinent questions on ufo twitter to make comments okay and to get into the conversation there are some zealots that will, yeah that you were attacking their demigod sent them into a frenzy okay the the tweet i i said to to ryan if you watch his video Ryan Ryan speculates a lot in his videos. He's yeah. a smart guy. He's also been read in. Okay, if you talk to people, he's been read in on what's going on. So when he when he made the comment about Coltart, you know, uh, questioning something that Coltart did, that's where I stepped up as a fellow journalist because I'm not worried about hurting Ryan's feelings. I'm more worried about uh, somebody trying to take out Coltart's knees on this when he's giving us quality journalism on it, right? It's the same reason why I defend George Knapp, okay? That's why I said, because there's a lot of people out there who don't know how the media works, who make comments about media members, true media members, not the fake journalists that are out there. And that's why I said, it's called doing his job. Right? UFO Twitter has always been like a pit bull. Where that's what I'm talking about. Like that that that's that's like that's how you see UFO Twitter as being this very Yeah, but it's not just me. Okay. I'll give an example. When I was when I was still friends with Rich Giordano, okay. Rich Rich would make a comment. This is before he kind of went off and started doing his own thing. All right. When somebody would, I watched Rich one day get attacked by somebody from, by a few people. And I was talking to somebody on that side of UFO Twitter who looked at the accounts and said, yeah, that one person owns five of those accounts. Okay. That's not friendly. That's not being disrespectful. That's being attacked by people on UFO Twitter who are nut bar over TTSA. Okay. Yep. And at that time I'm jumping in to defend my friend. Okay. Okay. Because that's what a friend does. Especially when rich at that point was right. It's the same thing with, okay. When my, when I released my article, about the 14 reasons, my 14 personal reasons as to why I never supported the TTSA, which I released in December last year, uh, right after Lou, uh, Chris Mellon, and and uh, Steve Justice quit. It was just my opinion. My opinion. You, There was a number of people on UFO Twitter who went ballistic on that. You're so full of shit and all this kind of stuff, right? You hated them from the beginning. No, I never hated them. Okay? Let's not go woke here. I never said that I hated them. 
I said I wouldn't support them because I see a lot of red flags that are popping up. And until those red flags are cleared, I wouldn't support them. I'm not. Yeah, I, I must admit, like, let me finish because like, like, oh, yeah. you hit a touchy subject here. Okay. So what happens? Melinda Leslie, who's in talks with, um, who's who talks all the time with Jim Semivan on Grant Cameron's live podcast on YouTube, makes mention says, "Oh, Dave, by the way, Jim Semivan was really impressed with your article that you wrote on on the reasons why TTSA yeah. failed, and he said you were about ninety five to ninety eight percent right." Yeah, and I had cool. never interviewed a single person from the TTSA up to that point. And I was right. Now, I'm not saying that to pop to pat my own back, but UFO Twitter, if you posed any questions that may have looked ill to the TTSA's blind faith followers, you were attacked and attacked badly. It happened to me. It happened to Giordano. That's probably why he's so angry today about everything. Well, it yeah, but I mean, he 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 was really acidic on Twitter. Like he didn't really. get a he didn't get acidic until UFO Twitter made him that way. And that's the truth. That, maybe I didn't meet him until later. Rich then I, Rich and I may not get along very well right now, but I will defend him on that. Okay. Well, I, I didn't. I didn't. I, I guess I didn't know him then, because because the whole time I the whole time I saw him on on Twitter, he was he was he would he seemed angry. Um, but but I will I will say that that one of the things I found is that um, Twitter's not a Twitter's not a, a place to to share opinions. No, because and then you would get the TTSA followers who would who would bait, try and bait you into things because they knew they had you by your emotions. So they would try and bait you into, into, into going off to try and make you look like a fool. Happened to me many times, dude. Well, yeah, but I mean, that's just, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, no, totally. Um, well, there's no defending it. It was happening. <clears throat> Excuse me. No, I mean, I, I'm not surprised, but like, but, but it's usually, it's usually pretty obvious. Right. I mean, you usually get caught 20, you know, once or twice and then, and then you figure it out and, and you don't get caught again, you know? Um, no, I mean, I guess I'm, what I'm just, what I'm just trying to figure out is it, is it just from uh, everything? Perry, you, you, what? Oh, Annie Perry says hi for, to you and I from the UK. Good morning to you. Love your blue hair. Oh yes, I want blue hair. I really should dye my hair blue before the you rest totally of it falls should. out. Oh, and um, here's, here's Hannah Mabry. Welcome, Hannah. Let me just see if there's anybody else here. We want to make sure we say hello to everybody. Oh, agreed. And just for the record, John, just so you know, okay, just so you know. I was during that time of Twitter, I was personally talking with Danny Silva and James Iandoli and, and uh, Joe Mergia about everything. That's how I know what the other side was. Okay. I'll give you another example of something even more grotesque. Okay. More grotesque. Rich Giordano made a was was being attacked by UFO Twitter people one day. Okay, and this is a true story. Everything's been deleted since then, by the way. <clears throat> and uh, one of these multiple profile people was going at it with three or four of his profiles or more. I don't know how many the man had on Rich, and Rich finally told the guy to F off or something along those lines. Um, and uh, so I'm in a I'm in a Facebook group that has a bunch of the young guns in there, 
And one particular young gun says that doesn't, doesn't know I'm in the group. Okay. And he says, point blank, I'm going to get that mf -er, no matter what the cost. Okay. That's horrible. I, I talked to Rich. Okay. <laughs> That's horrible. So Why did we talk Rich about all that? of a sudden contacts me in Facebook and he's like, dude, you're not going to believe this. He goes, somebody uh, uh, went on, on my YouTube channel and posted on my video that I'm I'm a I'm a, a wife beater and I abuse children. Okay. So guess what I did when I saw the comment? I immediately put two and two together, figured it out, and I went to someone who uh, on UFO Twitter who I was talking to at that point, and I said you better tell your 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 UFO young gun buddy to erase that comment effective immediately because Rich has family within the FBI and he's ready to call them. Within an hour, that post was removed. Good. Who behaves like that? UFO it's ridiculous. Twitter. Members of you UFO all, Twitter. A couple people. But I mean, but, but let me ask you something. Do, do, you, do you still today... Have a have a have a have because like what you're just what, like what you've been describing to me, like m like makes me think that that you have and you have good reason to feel this way. Uh, that the like you really don't like it. Like you don't you don't you like, I you don't. Now hold on a second. I I don't mind UFO Twitter, but there isn't much critical thinking because. When it was set up, hi, gorgeous Ozzy Ange and Ed Parnell, how are you? Bella Lugosi, good to see you. Um, when when I and, and I'm only going to the top of the hour because I got to be up in four hours. Oh, yeah, sorry, buddy. <laughs> sorry, I didn't have see you again. minutes left. But <laughs> you're still really awake, Dave. Like you, no. you haven't started your fade yet. You know. I know, uh, but the reality of it is this: I think there's a lot of good on UFO Twitter. Okay, Caden Wilson, uh, we're going to get rid of that comment. Do we have any wrenches in here? Because that's just an idiotic comment. Okay. You, you want to know the best way to potentially some, make a big income online? It's by making like lots of up. small incomes what online. What is playing? Hi. Oh, I'm Rachel Lachey. The me, best way to be potentially some, make... Some, there we go. That was crazy. Uh, where is that comment? Or did it already get removed? No, it's it's there. I can see it. I'm not seeing it on YouTube. Let's see. Hold on. I, oh, I can see it on my screen here unless someone got it already. I don't see it on YouTube. There's always got to be one more on. Well, especially at this time of night, everyone's come home from the bar and they're they're looking oh, to yeah. uh, they're looking to pick a fight. I think yeah. someone already got it. No, we don't. I don't think we have any wrenches in the in the in the room right now. Oh, we have Duke. Uh, maybe Duke got it. Uh, no, but it would show that the comments erased. Let's see. No, I'm not seeing it now. It's weird because I can see it. Oh, wait, now it disappeared. Where'd it go? Yeah, we're just going to block him. Yeah, I think, I think, uh, I, I think someone got it. I think someone got it. But I mean, I guess my question is, is, have, have, has, has it changed at all for you? Like, are, do you have, are you having any more of a positive experience with UFO Twitter uh, now? Did yeah, it's not bad because what I started doing was I started picking and choosing my spots, right? Yeah. <clears throat> right? I started picking and choosing my spots. That's what I did, right? Yep.
Yeah, no, I mean, and and that's the thing is that I mean, you know, like I mean, so for me, like, like I like I don't block people, like, like I mean, I've I've had a Twitter account since two thousand nine, and I I think last time I looked, I I think I have like three people blocked. That's it. Um, however, a surprisingly number of people blocked me, which I always get a huge kick out of. Um, it always blows my mind when I find someone's blocked me. I don't even remember who they are and I have no idea what I did to offend them. But, um, but the thing is, is it, is it, I still, I still talk to a lot of people who like, there's a couple people I talk to who like are like, like, like vicious, like, like haters of Elizondo and TTSA. And then I, there are other people I talk to that are, are, are complete apostles of 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 Elizondo, right? And like I and I I go out of my way. Like uh I mean it's it's easy now because I've been doing it for so long, but I go out of my way to phrase everything I write in a way that like my whole goal is is nothing I post I, I don't want to post anything that was designed to shut down a conversation. Everything that I write, I want to create an opening for that person to want to continue talking to me, mm-hmm. right? And and so by doing that, what I find is that, like, it's like I said, it's 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 pretty rare that I have any sort of negative, and it hasn't always been this way. I mean, certainly a couple of years ago, like you know, there were times where things got you know ugly and so forth, but you know. Of, over time you eventually, you know, figure out like, you know, who, you know, who, who are the good people to talk to. And essentially I think once people start realizing they can't bait you, I think, I think a lot of people just stop, stop trying. It's probably something is what goes on. But, um, but I, I guess what I'm, what I'm getting to is like, like for me, like UFO Twitter is actually a very positive. It's a very nice, it's, it's, it's relaxing. Actually. I, I find UFO Twitter very relaxing. And, um, and I guess I, I would like you to find it that way too. And so I'd like to figure out how <laughs> you can't be John Lennon in this thing. You got to realize, uh, you, you have to be able to, what we are is we are an area of opinion and where we got off on the wrong foot with UFO Twitter was the fact that we weren't praising, uh, to the UFO gods of Tom DeLong and Lou Elizondo at the time and the, t- the entire TTSA team. What I had told, what I had told our listeners at that time was let's just sit, let's just sit back and see how this plays out. Dude, there was a red flag right off the bat. When you hold a pressless press conference, okay, that's a red flag. What are you hiding? Okay. When you go on your website and you and you and you hold a press conference and you say, uh, I mean, this is all, all old hat now. But when you hold a press conference and you tell the public that you are going to be their UFO watchdog, pretty much, and hold the government accountable to that, and then you go on the website and the word UFO or UAP or extraterrestrial is not found on the website, that's a red flag. When you deny media requests, that's a red flag. Yeah, no, no, I mean, I, I agree. I just, the one thing I'm curious about is that, like, you know, you take someone, you take a channel like, um, well, I mean, I shouldn't say who it is, but there's, there's another, there's another big show, daily show. Um, and the, the guy that, the guy that runs that show, like, now, as of now, he's he's very friendly with with Elizondo, but up until about mm, I don't know, maybe a year ago, like he he was very anti Elizondo and very anti TTSA, and like matter of fact, like when when uh, when uh, John Greenwald would talk about stuff on his show he was you know, he usually play it pretty fair but when he would get on this guy's show they would get together they would get very very negative about about elizondo and ttsa and and over time what's happened is is he's separated the two and now he's like super like bff with elizondo 
And but he's still he, like he's so negative on TTSA that he tells all of his listeners that TTSA is gone. Like he he says they're gone. Like they don't like he says that they're dead. They're gone. They're dead, which is like actually completely not true. They're they're actually still a company there. We never, um, we never made it that personal. Yeah, yeah, no, but but what I'm curious about is it is it, <clears throat> uh, and there's no way for me to find out. But I'm 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 curious what it what kind of uh, what kind of backlash he, like he felt because because I agree with you like you you were being critical but you were not you were you were never being at least not what I saw you were never being rude or you were never be, taking like making personal attacks or or any of that stuff you were just you were just being critical and there were others that were being like over the you know over the top you know, aggressive. And so I would, I would have thought they would have seen a bigger backlash than you did. And so, but I mean, there's no way I can find out. It's just, I guess I was just wondering out loud. Dude, um, I, look at, I want to show you something. Hold on a second here. I can call up Lou Elizondo anytime I want. All right. And call him up anytime I want. Right? It wasn't about the people involved. It was about the narrative. It's always been about the narrative. And unfortunately, the majority of UFO Twitter early on, and there's still some of it now, all right, they came on like gangbusters trying to destroy anybody who they felt was anti-TTSA or anti-opinion, or anti-supporting. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, and, and I, I don't know if that still goes on, but, my, I, but I agree with you, it used to be really bad. My argument during that time was, I never said that I didn't like them. I said I wouldn't support them until I got some questions answered. Some logical, honest questions. For instance... I wanted to know how the To the Stars Academy was allowed to put their logo on United States Navy videos and sell those videos, may not sell them, but project those videos all around the world as To the Stars Academy videos. When they weren't property of the To the Stars Academy, they were property of the United States Navy. Yeah, I must admit, I, I totally remember talking to you about this, and and I and and I, I, I like I understand your point. I've I've never like to me to me that was never a big deal. Like because to it me, like but it, it doesn't matter, it, John. The whole point is, it doesn't matter if it was a big deal or not. The fact is, the question needed to be asked. Oh, okay, okay, I got you, I got okay. you, I got you. Explain to me. Right at that point, we didn't know that Elizondo had clicked, had che checked off the word drone and not UAP on the on the sheet to make it declassified, as he did with the three videos. Well, which, yeah, right, right. Which, according to my sources, El both Elizondo and Mellon were hauled into the Pentagon, and basically threatened to lose their. Uh, their credentials and their top secret clearances over that. Yep. Uh, after the investigation, it was discovered to be an internal um, processing error. But yeah, but but for a while they were under a lot of scrutiny. Yeah, they almost they almost lost their top secret clearances because of that. Yep. Yeah. Which those those video those three videos that Elizondo ticked off should have been ticked off as UAP and not drone. Right. Well, I, I don't. I don't know if there was actually a UAP checkbox on the form, but but calling it a drone was was deceptive. Well, same thing. Same. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 no. I mean, the whole way they did it. I mean, the way the fact that Elizondo was the one that checked them out, and then someone like literally like handed them off to Mellon like in the parking lot. I mean, it was a very, <laughs> it was a very sh shady sort of sort of. I mean, basically, what it was is you had two guys that really understood the system. Mm -hmm. And they they played every loophole they could find to get them out without directly Absolutely. breaking the law. Absolutely. It was it was actually it was very clever. But to it put was very clever. 
But here's the thing, uh, and the question I would have for the United States Navy, why did you never sue the Two of the Stars Academy for stealing your videos and putting their logo on it like it's their product? Look how much free advertisement the TTSA got from that. And it wasn't even theirs. Yeah, and I think the problem is, is that the U.S. government releases footage all the time that CNN puts their logo on, that MSNBC puts their logo on. Like every time you see it, it's ah, someone else's logo is on different. it. That's different because that broadcaster has got sole exclusivity to that product. The TTSA did not have sole exclusivity. The United States government did. Well, but no, but I'm saying like like three news broadcasters will show the same video of a missile strike in in, in Iraq, yeah. and each of them will put their own logos on it. Absolutely, because that was given to them. And the reason why they do that is when it hits when it hits places like YouTube or BitChute or any place like that. That way, their their video is getting uh, advertising credit for it. Okay, but these videos weren't like that. These videos which were run by all the major outlets had the to the stars academy logo on it which which shows ownership of the v, of the of the videos ttsa gotcha. didn't own the videos they were property of the united states navy gotcha yeah there's david i have to admit like the very often there's like these nuances to this that 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 just aren't obvious to me that uh like really help me understand like why like why you have the view you do because to like to me that's just not like to me that's not like a huge distinction and i'm sure it is in in, in that world but like just the world i come from it's just like you know it's, this was it's, just one of the small questions that needed to be asked john yeah I mean, no no agreed and and so for you for you there was no way to ask those questions no i had I had 50, I talked, when I talked to, the first time I talked to Elizondo, <clears throat> he apologized to me directly for never getting, uh, or being on the show before. And I said, you know, Lou, I said, uh, I accept your apology. I, I'm a, I'm a man like that. And I said, that means a lot. I said, you know, I put in 15 different requests for interviews with you guys and all of them were either denied or so I never got back. And one of them, I said, Lou, you know, I said to Lou point blank, I said, Lou, you know how there was the rumor going around that you guys were asking for questions freehand. I said, I kept that quiet, but that was from me because when I approached you guys, when I approached about unidentified, my email was sent to the Canadian distributor of History Channel and the History Channel PR person for you guys asked me to provide questions beforehand for you guys. And I said I would not do that. I said, so that's how that rumor got started. Because I leaked it. Well, and you couldn't have been the only one. I mean... I don't, they, I don't know. That I, they, that I don't know. I'm not speaking for anybody, but I know I was personally asked to provide sample questions of what I would be asking Lou and Chris on the air. And when I said no, I was told point blank that we're not interested in doing your show. Yeah. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, I could yeah. only, um, I could only imagine. I could, I, no, I mean, that, 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 I mean, I, I honestly, I could see someone asking for like general topics, you know, just, just so that you can prepare, I guess. But like asking for specific questions is like, yeah. it's, it's so tactless. Hey, it's perfectly all right. If they would have said to me, what do you plan on talking to them about? I was said, I, I plan on talking about the television show. Yep. I, I, I will ask them about the To The Stars Academy and the videos. I would have provided what I would plan on talking about. Not a problem. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk about. So why hide it? But if you're yep. wanting me... If you're wanting me to provide questions for you, uh-uh, uh-uh. Why do you think Stephen Greer has never appeared on this show? Right, right. Dave, I, I'm 
I'm really enjoying this, and honestly, I really. But I just want to be respectful. It's three oh four. We gotta like, get out. We just, we just, just, you know, just want to, you know, just. We gotta get, get out. up early. I appreciate so, that, John. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but I gotta, I gotta tell you, Matt. I, I, I can't tell you how much I've, I've actually been really enjoying this. It's been awesome. Yeah, like, uh, this, night, is, this has been fun. Uh, I have to be up, ladies and gentlemen. I have to be up in four hours. I'm actually gonna set my alarm right now. Because I, uh, my boy has hockey practice at 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. And, um, well, it's hockey season. And that takes precedence over absolutely everything. So my alarm is now set that I will be out of and my And which means, Dave, we're not going to be able to talk after this. So that means I get a call from you this weekend because I still want to hear about uh, about how things went with, um, with um, Geraldine. Yep. Not a problem. Not a problem. So thank you tonight to Nina, to Mennonite Abe, Spooky, Smithy, Brian, Carla, Reverend Keith, Swampy, and Nicola for the amazing Super Chats. The Super Chat is always a great way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. A big thank you to all of our brand new subscribers this week and tonight. We really do appreciate it. And if you're not a subscriber, do me a favor. Hit that subscribe button. It's over here. Well, it's actually over there by John and ring that bell. And uh, we would appreciate that. That really helps out what we do afterwards uh, and, and during the show uh, and helps us grow and build as well. Uh, tomorrow night on the show and Sunday, Lynn Wallington will be in the hot seat. Her guest this week will be Carl Johnson. He's going to be talking about uh, strange phenomena. And then on Sunday, she'll have Jer Jared Murphy, who says it's not aliens, it's not us. I will be back on Monday with Ron Felber talking about the Mojave incident, another UFO oh, yeah. topic. So that's going to be great. And we're kicking off another great week next week on the show. And if you want a little UFO controversy, wait till Friday night. Jonathan Davies, I want to know on Twitter is going to be here and that one i am not preparing for that one's just going to happen it's just gonna that's, gonna that's gonna be a good show that's gonna be a power show that i know everybody from ufo twitter to anybody who is on uh listening around uh i'm in a cup i'm in a couple of groups with john and the people who he is talking to is pretty damn incredible, including the legendary Hal Putoff. So yep, yep, yep. It, it's, oh, I'm so looking forward to that one. So yep, looking yep, yep. forward to that one. So thank you, everyone. Follow us on social media. You know where to find us. And on that note, John, I'll say uh, good night to you and good night to our audience. I'll see you on Monday. Enjoy Lynn this weekend. She's got a couple of great shows, 9 p.m. Pacific. Midnight Eastern. And next week, we're going to have another announcement for all you guys as we're expanding uh, some time of broadcasting here. Talk to you soon.